Number one of Cottage Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. Cottage Economy. Containing information relative to the brewing of beer, making of bread, keeping of cows, pigs, bees, ewes, goats, poultry, and rabbits and relative to other matters deemed useful in the conducting of the affairs of a labourer's family, to which are added instructions relative to the selecting, the cutting, and the bleaching of the plants of English grass and grain for the purpose of making hats and bonnets, and also instructions for erecting and using ice-houses after the Virginian manner. By William Cobbett. Number 1. Paragraphs 1 to 19. Introduction to the labouring classes of this kingdom. Throughout this little work I shall number the paragraphs, in order to be able at some stages of the work to refer with the more facility to parts that have gone before. The last number will contain an index, by the means of which the several matters may be turned to without loss of time, for when economy is the subject, time is a thing which ought by no means to be overlooked. The word economy, like a great many others, has in its application been very much abused. It is generally used as if it meant parsimony, stinginess, or niggardliness, and at best merely the refraining from expending money. Hence misers and close-fisted men disguise their propensity in conduct under the name of economy, whereas the most liberal disposition, a disposition precisely the contrary of that of the miser, is perfectly consistent with economy. Economy means management, and nothing more, and it is generally applied to the affairs of a house and family, which affairs are an object of the greatest importance, whether as relating to individuals or to a nation. A nation is made powerful and to be honoured in the world not so much by the number of its people as by the ability and character of that people, and the ability and character of a people depend in a great measure upon the economy of the several families which, all taken together, make up the nation. There never yet was, and never will be, a nation permanently great, consisting for the greater part of wretched and miserable families. In every view of the matter, therefore, it is desirable that the families of which a nation consists should be happily off, and as this depends in a great degree upon the management of their concerns, the present work is intended to convey to the families of the labouring classes in particular such information as I think may be useful with regard to that management. I lay it down as a maxim, that for a family to be happy they must be well supplied with food and raiment. It is a sorry effort that people make to persuade others, or to persuade themselves, that they can be happy in a state of want of the necessaries of life. The doctrines which fanaticism preaches, and which teach men to be content with poverty, have a very pernicious tendency, and are calculated to favour tyrants by giving them passive slaves. To live well, to enjoy all things that make life pleasant, is the right of every man who constantly uses his strength judiciously and lawfully. It is to blaspheme God to suppose that he created man to be miserable, to hunger, thirst, and perish with cold, in the midst of that abundance which is the fruit of their own labour. Instead, therefore, of applauding happy poverty, which applause is so much the fashion of the present day, I despise the man that is poor and contented for such content is certain proof of a base disposition, a disposition which is the enemy of all industry, all exertion, all love of independence. Let it be understood, however, that by poverty I mean real want, a real insufficiency of the food and raiment and lodging necessary to health and decency, and not that imaginary poverty of which some persons complain. The man who, by his own and his family's labour, can provide a sufficiency of food and raiment, and a comfortable dwelling-place, is not a poor man. There must be different ranks and degrees in every civil society, and indeed so it is even amongst the savage tribes. There must be different degrees of wealth, some must have more than others, and the richest must be a great deal richer than the least rich. But it is necessary to the very existence of a people that nine out of ten should live wholly by the sweat of their brow, and is it not degrading to human nature that all the nine-tenths should be called poor, and what is still worse, call themselves poor, and be contented in that degraded state? 
the laws the economy or management of a state may be such as to render it impossible for the labourer however skilful and industrious to maintain his family in health and decency and such has for many years past been the management of the affairs of this once truly great and happy land a system of paper money the effect of which was to take from the labourer the half of his earnings was what no industry and care could make head against i do not pretend that this system was adopted by design but no matter for the cause such was the effect better times however are approaching the labourer now appears likely to obtain that hire of which he is worthy and therefore this appears to me to be the time to press upon him the duty of using his best exertions for the rearing of his family in a manner that must give him the best security for happiness to himself his wife and children and to make him in all respects what his forefathers were the people of england have been famed in all ages for their good living for the abundance of their food and goodness of their attire the old sayings about english roast beef and plum pudding and about english hospitality had not their foundations in nothing and in spite of all refinements of sickly minds it is abundant living amongst the people at large which is the great test of good government and the surest basis of national greatness and security if the labourer have his fair wages if there be no false weights and measures whether of money or of goods by which he is defrauded if the laws be equal in their effect upon all men if he be called upon for no more than his due share of the expenses necessary to support the government and defend the country he has no reason to complain if the largeness of his family demand extraordinary labour and care these are due from him to it he is the cause of the existence of that family and therefore he is not except in cases of accidental calamity to throw upon others the burden of supporting it besides little children are as arrows in the hands of the giant and blessed is the man that hath his quiver full of them that is to say children if they bring their cares bring also their pleasures and solid advantages they become very soon so many assistants and props to the parents who when old age comes on are amply repaid for all the toils and all the cares that children have occasioned in their infancy to be without sure and safe friends in the world makes life not worth having and whom can we be so sure of as of our children brothers and sisters are a mutual support we see them in almost every case grow up into prosperity when they act the part that the impulses of nature prescribe when cordially united a father and sons or a family of brothers and sisters may in almost any state of life set what is called misfortune at defiance these considerations are much more than enough to sweeten the toils and cares of parents and to make them regard every additional child as an additional blessing but that children may be a blessing and not a curse care must be taken of their education this word has of late years been so perverted so corrupted so abused in its application that i am almost afraid to use it here yet i must not suffer it to be usurped by cant and tyranny i must use it but not without clearly saying what i mean education means breeding up bringing up or rearing up and nothing more this includes everything with regard to the mind as well as the body of a child but of late years it has been so used as to have no sense applied to it but that of book learning with which nine times out of ten it has nothing at all to do it is indeed proper and it is the duty of all parents to teach or cause to be taught their children as much as they can of books after and not before all the measures are safely taken for enabling them to get their living by labour or for providing them a living without labour and that too out of the means obtained and secured by the parents out of their own income the taste of the times is unhappily to give children something of book learning with a view of placing them to live in some way or other upon the labour of other people very seldom comparatively speaking has this succeeded even during the wasteful public expenditure of the last thirty years and in the times that are approaching it cannot i thank god succeed at all when the project has failed what disappointment mortification and misery to both parent and child the latter is spoiled as a labourer his book-learning has only made him conceited into some course of desperation he falls 
and the end is but too often not only wretched but ignominious understand me clearly here however for it is the duty of parents to give if they be able book learning to their children having first taken care to make them capable of earning their living by bodily labour when that object has once been secured the other may if the ability remain be attended to but i am wholly against children wasting their time in the idleness of what is called education and particularly in schools over which the parents have no control and where nothing is taught but the rudiments of civility pauperism and slavery the education that i have in view is therefore of a very different kind you should bear constantly in mind that nine-tenths of us are from the very nature and necessities of the world born to gain our livelihood by the sweat of our brow what reason have we then to presume that our children are not to do the same if they be as now and then one will be endued with extraordinary powers of mind those powers may have an opportunity of developing themselves and if they never have that opportunity the harm is not very great to us or to them nor does it hence follow that the descendants of labourers are always to be labourers the path upwards is steep and long to be sure industry care skill excellence in the present parent lay the foundation of a rise under more favourable circumstances for his children the children of these take another rise and by and by the descendants of the present labourer become gentlemen this is the natural progress it is by attempting to reach the top at a single leap that so much misery is produced in the world and the propensity to make such attempts has been cherished and encouraged by the strange projects that we have witnessed of late years for making the labourers virtuous and happy by giving them what is called education the education which i speak of consists in bringing children up to labour with steadiness with care and with skill to show them how to do as many useful things as possible to teach them to do them all in the best manner to set them an example in industry sobriety cleanliness and neatness to make all these habitual to them so that they never shall be liable to fall into the contrary to let them always see a good living proceeding from labour and thus to remove from them the temptation to get at the goods of others by violent or fraudulent means and to keep far from their minds all the inducements to hypocrisy and deceit and bear in mind that if the state of the labourer has its disadvantages when compared with other callings and conditions of life it has also its advantages it is free from the torments of ambition and from a great part of the causes of ill-health for which not all the riches in the world and all the circumstances of high rank are a compensation the able and prudent labourer is always safe at the least and that is what few men are who are lifted above him they have losses and crosses to fear the very thought of which never enters his mind if he act well his part towards himself his family and his neighbours but the basis of good to him is steady and skilful labour to assist him in the pursuit of this labour and in the turning of it to the best account are the principal objects of the present little work i propose to treat of brewing beer making bread keeping cows and pigs rearing poultry and of other matters and to show that while from a very small piece of ground a large part of the food of a considerable family may be raised the very act of raising it will be the best possible foundation of education of the children of the labourer that it will teach them a great number of useful things add greatly to their value when they go forth from their father's home make them start in life with all possible advantages and give them the best chance of leading happy lives and is it not much more rational for parents to be employed in teaching their children how to cultivate a garden to feed and rear animals to make bread beer bacon butter and cheese and to be able to do these things for themselves or for others than to leave them to prowl about the lanes and commons or to mope at the heels of some crafty sleek-headed pretended saint who while he extracts the last penny from their pockets bids them be contented with their misery and promises them in exchange for their pence everlasting glory in the world to come it is upon the hungry and the wretched that the fanatic works the dejected and forlorn are his prey as an ailing carcass engenders vermin a pauperized community engenders teachers of fanaticism 
the very foundation of whose doctrines is that we are to care nothing about this world, and that all our labours and exertions are in vain. The man who is doing well, who is in good health, who has a blooming and dutiful and cheerful and happy family about him, and who passes his day of rest amongst them, is not to be made to believe that he was born to be miserable, and that poverty, the natural and just reward of laziness, is to secure him a crown of glory. Far be it from me to recommend a disregard of even outward observances as to matters of religion, but can it be religion to believe that God hath made us to be wretched and dejected? Can it be religion to regard as marks of his grace the poverty and misery that almost invariably attend our neglect to use the means of obtaining a competence in worldly things? Can it be religion to regard as blessings those things, those very things, which God expressly numbers amongst his curses? Poverty never finds a place amongst the blessings promised by God. His blessings are of a directly opposite description flocks, herds, corn, wine and oil, a smiling land, a rejoicing people, abundance for the body and gladness of heart, these are the blessings which God promises to the industrious, the sober, the careful and the upright. Let no man then believe that to be poor and wretched is a mark of God's favour, and let no man remain in that state if he by any honest means can rescue himself from it. Poverty leads to all sorts of evil consequences. Want, horrid want, is the great parent of crime. To have a dutiful family, the father's principle of rule, must be love, not fear. His sway must be gentle, or he will have only an unwilling and short-lived obedience. But it is given to but few men to be gentle and good-humoured amidst the various torments attendant on pinching poverty. A competence is, therefore, the first thing to be thought of. It is the foundation of all good in the labourer's dwelling. Without it little but misery can be expected. Health, peace, and competence, one of the wisest of men regards as the only things needful to man. But the two former are scarcely to be had without the latter. Competence is the foundation of happiness and of exertion. Beset with wants, having a mind continually harassed with fears of starvation, who can act with energy, who can calmly think? To provide a good living, therefore, for himself and family, is the very first duty of every man. Two things, says Agger, have I asked, deny me them not before I die, remove far from me vanity and lies, give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me lest I be full and deny thee, or lest I be poor and steal. A good living, therefore, a competence, is the first thing to be desired and to be sought after, and if this little work should have the effect of aiding only a small portion of the labouring classes in securing that competence, it will afford great gratification to their friend William Cobbett. Kensington, 19th of July, 1821. Paragraphs 20 to 37. Brewing Beer. Before I proceed to give any directions about brewing, let me mention some of the inducements to do the thing. In former times, to set about to show to Englishmen that it was good for them to brew beer in their houses would have been as impertinent as gravely to insist that they ought to endeavour not to lose their breath, for in those times, only forty years ago, to have a house and not to brew was a rare thing indeed. Mr. Ellman, an old man and a large farmer in Sussex, has recently given in evidence before a committee of the House of Commons this fact, that forty years ago there was not a labourer in his parish that did not brew his own beer, and that now there is not one that does it, except by chance the malt be given him. The causes of this change have been the lowering of the wages of labour compared with the price of provisions, by the means of the paper money, the enormous tax upon the barley when made into malt, and the increased tax upon hops. These have quite changed the customs of the English people as to their drink. They still drink beer, but in general it is of the brewing of common brewers, and in public houses, of which the common brewers have become the owners, 
and have thus, by the aid of paper money, obtained a monopoly in the supplying of the great body of the people with one of those things which, to the hard-working man, is almost a necessary of life. These things will be altered. They must be altered. The nation must be sunk into nothingness, or a new system must be adopted, and the nation will not sink into nothingness. The malt now pays a tax of four shillings and sixpence a bushel, and the barley costs only three shillings. This brings the bushel of malt to eight shillings, including the maltster's charge for malting. If the tax were taken off the malt, malt would be sold at the present price of barley for about three shillings and threepence a bushel, because a bushel of barley makes more than a bushel of malt, and the tax, besides its amount, causes great expenses of various sorts to the maltster. The hops pay a tax of twopence a pound, and a bushel of malt requires in general a pound of hops. If these two taxes were taken off, therefore, the consumption of barley and of hops would be exceedingly increased, for double the present quantity would be demanded, and the land is always ready to send it forth. It appears impossible that the landlords should much longer submit to these intolerable burdens on their estates. In short, they must get off the malt tax, or lose those estates. They must do a great deal more, indeed, but that they must do at any rate. The paper money is fast losing its destructive power, and things are, with regard to the labourers, coming back to what they were forty years ago. And therefore we may prepare for the making of beer in our own houses, and take leave of the poisonous stuff served out to us by common brewers. We may begin immediately, for even at present prices home-brewed beer is the cheapest drink that a family can use, except milk, and milk can be applicable only in certain cases. The drink which has come to supply the place of beer has in general been tea. It is notorious that tea has no useful strength in it, that it contains nothing nutritious, that it, besides being good for nothing, has badness in it, because it is well known to produce want of sleep in many cases, and in all cases to shake and weaken the nerves. It is in fact a weaker kind of laudanum, which enlivens for the moment, and deadens afterwards. At any rate, it communicates no strength to the body, it does not in any degree assist in affording what labour demands. It is then of no use. And now, as to its cost, compared with that of beer, I shall make my comparison applicable to a year, or three hundred and sixty-five days. I shall suppose the tea to be only five shillings the pound, the sugar only sevenpence, the milk only twopence a quart. The prices are at the very lowest. I shall suppose a teapot to cost a shilling, six cups and saucers two shillings and sixpence, and six pewter spoons eighteenpence. How to estimate the firing I hardly know, but certainly there must be in the course of the year two hundred fires made that would not be made were it not for tea-drinking. Then comes the great article of all, the time employed in this tea-making affair. It is impossible to make a fire, boil water, make the tea, drink it, wash up the things, sweep up the fireplace and put all to rights again, in a less space of time upon an average than two hours. However, let us allow one hour, and here we have a woman occupied no less than three hundred and sixty-five hours in the year, or thirty whole days at twelve hours in the day, that is to say one month out of the twelve in the year, besides the waste of the man's time in hanging about waiting for the tea. Needs there anything more to make us cease to wonder at seeing labourers' children with dirty linen and holes in the heels of their stockings? Observe, too, that the time thus spent is, one half of it, the best time of the day. It is the top of the morning, which in every calling of life contains an hour worth two or three hours of the afternoon. By the time that the clattering tea-tackle is out of the way, the morning is spoiled, its prime is gone, and any work that is to be done afterwards lags heavily along. If the mother have to go out to work, the tea affair must all first be over. She comes into the field, in summer-time, when the sun has gone a third part of his course. She has the heat of the day to encounter, instead of having her work done, and being ready to return home at any early hour. Yet early she must go, too, for there is the fire again to be made, the clattering tea-tackle again to come forward, and even in the longest day she must have candle-light, which never ought to be seen in a cottage except in case of illness, from March to September. 
Now then, let us take the bare cost of the use of tea. I suppose a pound of tea to last twenty days, which is not nearly half an ounce every morning and evening. I allow for each mess half a pint of milk, and I allow three pounds of the red dirty sugar to each pound of tea. The account of expenditure would then stand very high, but to these must be added the amount of the tea tackle, one set of which will upon an average be demolished every year. To these outgoings must be added the cost of beer at the public house, for some the man will have, after all, and the woman too, unless they be upon the point of actual starvation. Two pots a week is as little as will serve in this way, and here is a dead loss of ninepence a week, seeing that two pots of beer full as strong and a great deal better can be brewed at home for threepence. The account of the year's tea-drinking will then stand thus. Eighteen pounds of tea, four pounds ten shillings. Fifty-four pounds of sugar, one pound eleven and six. Three hundred and sixty-five pints of milk, one pound ten. Tea-tackle, five shillings. Two hundred fires, sixteen shillings and eightpence. Thirty days' work, fifteen shillings. Loss by going to public house, one pound nineteen. Total, eleven pounds, seven shillings, and twopence. I have here estimated everything at its very lowest. The entertainment which I have here provided is as poor, as mean, as miserable as anything short of starvation can set forth, and yet the wretched thing amounts to a good third part of a good and able labourer's wages. For this money, he and his family may drink good and wholesome beer, in a short time out of the mere savings from this waste, may drink it out of silver cups and tankards. In a labourer's family wholesome beer, that has a little life in it, is all that is wanted in general. Little children that do not work should not have beer. Broth, porridge, or something in that way is the thing for them. However, I shall suppose, in order to make my comparison as little complicated as possible, that he brews nothing but beer as strong as the generality of beer to be had at the public house, and divested of the poisonous drugs which that beer but too often contains, and I shall further suppose that he uses in his family two quarts of this beer, every day from the first of October to the last day of March, inclusive, three quarts a day during the months of April and May, four quarts a day during the months of June and September, and five quarts a day during the months of July and August. And if this be not enough, it must be a family of drunkards. Here are 1,079 quarts, or 274 gallons. Now, a bushel of malt will make 18 gallons of better beer than that which is sold in the public houses, and this is precisely a gallon for the price of a quart. People should bear in mind that the beer bought at the public house is loaded with the beer tax, with the tax on the public housekeeper, in the shape of the licence, with all the taxes and expenses of the brewer, with all the taxes, rent, and other expenses of the publican, and with all the profits of both brewer and publican, so that when a man swallows a pot of beer at a public house, he has all these expenses to help to defray, besides the mere tax on the malt and on the hops. Well, then, to brew this ample supply of good beer for a labourer's family, these 274 gallons, requires 15 bushels of malt, and, for let us do the thing well, 15 pounds of hops. The malt is now 8 shillings a bushel, and very good hops may be bought for less than a shilling a pound. The grains and yeast will amply pay for the labour and fuel employed in the brewing, seeing that there will be pigs to eat the grains, and bread to be baked with the yeast. The account will then stand thus. 15 bushels of malt, 6 pounds. 15 pounds of hops, 15 shillings. Ware of utensils, ten shillings. Total, seven pounds, five shillings. Here, then, is the sum of four pounds, two shillings and tuppence saved every year. The utensils for brewing are a brass kettle, a mashing tub, coolers, for which washing tubs may serve, a half hogshead, with one end taken out, for a tun tub, about four nine-gallon casks, and a couple of eighteen-gallon casks, this is an ample supply of utensils, each of which will last with proper care a good long lifetime or two, and the whole of which, even if purchased new from the shop, 
will only exceed by a few shillings, if they exceed at all, the amount of the saving arising the very first year from quitting the troublesome and pernicious practice of drinking tea. The saving of each succeeding year would, if you chose it, purchase a silver mug to hold half a pint at least. However, the saving would naturally be applied to purposes more conducive to the well-being and happiness of a family. It is not, however, the mere saving to which I look. This is indeed a matter of great importance, whether we look at the amount itself or at the ultimate consequences of a judicious application of it, for four pounds make a great hole in a man's wages for the year, and when we consider all the advantages that would arise to a family of children from having these four pounds, now so miserably wasted, laid out upon their backs, in the shape of a decent dress, it is impossible to look at this waste without feelings of sorrow not wholly unmixed with those of a harsher description. But I look upon the thing in a still more serious light. I view the tea-drinking as a destroyer of health, an enfeebler of the frame, an engenderer of effeminacy and laziness, a debaucher of youth and a maker of misery for old age. In the fifteen bushels of malt there are five hundred and seventy pounds weight of sweet, that is to say, of nutritious matter, unmixed with anything injurious to health. In the seven hundred and thirty tea messes of the year there are fifty-four pounds of sweet in the sugar, and about thirty pounds of matter equal to sugar in the milk. Here are eighty-four pounds instead of five hundred and seventy and even the good effect of these eighty-four pounds is more than overbalanced by the corrosive, gnawing, and poisonous powers of the tea. It is impossible for any one to deny the truth of this statement. Put it to the test with a lean hog. Give him the fifteen bushels of malt, and he will repay you in ten score of bacon or thereabouts. But give him the seven hundred and thirty tea messes, or rather begin to give them to him, and give him nothing else, and he is dead with hunger and bequeaths you his skeleton at the end of about seven days. It is impossible to doubt, in such a case, that tea-drinking has done a great deal in bringing this nation into the state of misery in which it now is, and the tea-drinking which is carried on by dribs and by drabs, by pence and farthings going out at a time, this miserable practice has been gradually introduced by the growing weight of the taxes on malt and on hops, and by the everlasting penury amongst the labourers occasioned by the paper money. We see better prospects, however, and therefore let us now rouse ourselves, and shake from us the degrading curse, the effects of which have been much more extensive and infinitely more mischievous than men in general seem to imagine. It must be evident to every one that the practice of tea-drinking must render the frame feeble and unfit to encounter hard labour or severe weather, while, as I have shown, it deducts from the means of replenishing the belly and covering the back. Hence succeeds a softness, an effeminacy, a seeking for the fireside, a lurking in the bed, and in short all the characteristics of idleness, for which in this case real want of strength furnishes an apology. The tea-drinking fills the public-house, makes the frequenting of it habitual, corrupts boys as soon as they are able to move from home, and does little less for the girls, to whom the gossip of the tea-table is no bad preparatory school for the brothel. At the very least it teaches them idleness. The everlasting dawdling about with the slops of the tea-tackle gives them a relish for nothing that requires strength and activity. When they go from home they know how to do nothing that is useful to brew, to bake, to make butter, to milk, to rear poultry, to do any earthly thing of use, they are wholly unqualified. To shut poor young creatures up in manufactories is bad enough, but there at any rate they do something that is useful. Whereas the girl that has been brought up merely to boil the tea-kettle, and to assist in the gossip inseparable from the practice, is a mere consumer of food, a pest to her employer, and a curse to her husband, if any man be so unfortunate as to fix his affections upon her. But is it in the power of any man, any good labourer who has attained the age of fifty, to look back upon the last thirty years of his life without cursing the day in which tea was introduced into England? Where is there such a man who cannot trace to this cause a very considerable part of all the mortifications and sufferings of his life? 
When was he ever too late at his labour? When did he ever meet with a frown, with a turning off and pauperism on that account, without being able to trace it to the tea-kettle? When reproached with lagging in the morning, the poor wretch tells you that he will make up for it by working during his breakfast-time. I have heard this a hundred and a hundred times over. He was up time enough, but the tea-kettle kept him lolling and lounging at home, and now, instead of sitting down to a breakfast upon bread, bacon, and beer, which is to carry him on to the hour of dinner, he has to force his limbs along under the sweat of feebleness, and at dinner-time to swallow his dry bread or slake his half-feverish thirst at the pump or the brook. To the wretched tea-kettle he has to return at night, with legs hardly sufficient to maintain him, and thus he makes his miserable progress towards that death which he finds ten or fifteen years sooner than he would have found it if he had made his wife brew beer instead of making tea. If he now and then gladdens his heart with the drugs of the public-house, some quarrel, some accident, some illness is the probable consequence. To the affray abroad succeeds an affray at home, the mischievous example reaches the children, corrupts them or scatters them, and misery for life is the consequence. I should now proceed to the details of brewing, but these, though they will not occupy a large space, must be put off to the second number. The custom of brewing at home has so long ceased amongst labourers, and in many cases amongst tradesmen, that it was necessary for me fully to state my reasons for wishing to see the custom revived. I shall in my next clearly explain how the operation is performed, and it will be found to be so easy a thing that I am not without hope that many tradesmen who now spend their evenings at the public house, amidst tobacco smoke and empty noise, may be induced, by the finding of better drink at home, at a quarter part of the price, to perceive that home is by far the pleasantest place wherein to pass their hours of relaxation. My work is intended chiefly for the benefit of cottagers, who must, of course, have some land, for I purpose to show that a large part of the food of even a large family may be raised without any diminution of the labourer's earnings abroad from forty rod or a quarter of an acre of ground. But, at the same time, what I have to say will be applicable to larger establishments, in all the branches of domestic economy, and especially to that of providing a family with beer. The kind of beer for a labourer's family, that is to say, the degree of strength, must depend on circumstances, on the numerousness of the family, on the season of the year, and various other things. But, generally speaking, beer half the strength of that mentioned in paragraph 25 will be quite strong enough, for that is at least one-third stronger than the farmhouse small beer, which, however, as long experience has proved, is best suited to the purpose. A judicious labourer would probably always have some ale in his house, and have small beer for the general drink. There is no reason why he should not keep Christmas as well as the farmer, and when he is mowing, reaping, or is it any other hard work, a quart or three pints of really good fat ale a day is by no means too much. However, circumstances vary so much with different labourers, that as to the sort of beer, and the number of brewings, and the times of brewing, no general rule can be laid down. Before I proceed to explain the uses of the several brewing utensils, I must speak of the quality of the materials of which beer is made, that is to say the malt, hops, and water. Malt varies very much in quality, as indeed it must with the quality of the barley. When good, it is full of flour, and in biting a grain asunder you will find it bite easily, and see the shell thin and filled up well with flour. If it bite hard and steely, the malt is bad. There is pale malt and brown malt, but the difference in the two arises merely from the different degrees of heat employed in the drying. The main thing to attend to is this, the quantity of flour. If the barley was bad, thin or steely, whether from unripeness or blight or any other cause, it will not malt so well, that is to say, it will not send out its roots in due time, and a part of it will still be barley. Then the world is wicked enough to think, and even to say, that there are maltsters who, when they send you a bushel of malt, put a little barley amongst it, the malt being taxed and the barley not. 
let us hope that this is seldom the case yet when we do know that this terrible system of taxation induces the beer-selling gentry to supply their customers with stuff little better than poison it is not very uncharitable to suppose it possible for some monsters to yield to the temptations of the devil so far as to play the trick above mentioned to detect this trick and to discover what portion of the barley is in an unmalted state take a handful of the unground malt and put it into a bowl of cold water mix it about with the water a little that is let every grain be just wet all over and whatever part of them sink are not good if you have your malt ground there is not as i know of any means of detection therefore if your brewing be considerable in amount grind your own malt the means of doing which is very easy and neither expensive nor troublesome as will appear when i come to speak of flour if the barley be well malted there is still a variety in the quality of the malt that is to say a bushel of malt from fine plump heavy barley will be better than the same quantity from thin and light barley in this case as in the case of wheat the weight is the criterion of the quality only bear in mind that as a bushel of wheat weighing sixty two pounds is better worth six shillings than a bushel weighing fifty two is worth four shillings so a bushel of malt weighing forty five pounds is better worth nine shillings than a bushel weighing thirty five is worth six shillings in malt therefore as in everything else the word cheap is a deception unless the quality be taken into view but bear in mind that in the case of unmalted barley mixed with the malt the weight can be no rule for barley is heavier than malt end of number one Number two of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs thirty eight to seventy six. Brewing beer continued. As to using barley in the making of beer, I have given it a full and fair trial twice over, and I would recommend it to neither rich nor poor. The barley produces strength, though nothing like the malt but the beer is flat even though you use half malt and half barley and flat beer lies heavy on the stomach and of course besides the bad taste is unwholesome to pay four shillings and sixpence tax upon every bushel of our own barley turned into malt when the barley itself is not worth three shillings a bushel is a horrid thing but as long as the owners of the land shall be so dastardly as to suffer themselves to be thus deprived of the use of their estates to favour the slave-drivers and plunderers of the east and west indies we must submit to the thing incomprehensible to foreigners and even to ourselves as the submission may be with regard to hops the quality is very various at times when some sell for five shillings a pound others sell for sixpence provided the purchaser understand the article the quality is of course in proportion to the price there are two things to be considered in hops the power of preserving beer and that of giving it a pleasant flavour hops may be strong and yet not good they should be bright have no leaves or bits of branches amongst them the hop is the husk or seed pod of the hop vine as the cone is that of the fir tree and the seeds themselves are deposited like those of the fir round a little soft stalk enveloped by the several folds of this pod or cone if in the gathering leaves of the vine or bits of the branches are mixed with the hops these not only help to make up the weight but they give a bad taste to the beer and indeed if they abound much they spoil the beer great attention is therefore necessary in this respect there are two numerous sorts of hops varying in size form and quality quite as much as apples however when they are in a state to be used in brewing the marks of goodness are an absence of brown colour for that indicates perished hops a colour between green and yellow a great quantity of the yellow farina seeds not too large nor too hard a clammy feel when rubbed between the fingers and a lively pleasant smell 
as to the age of hops they retain for twenty years probably their power of preserving beer but not of giving it a pleasant flavour i have used them at ten years old and should have no fear of using them at twenty they lose none of their bitterness none of their power of preserving beer but they lose the other quality and therefore in the making of fine ale or beer new hops are to be preferred as to the quantity of hops it is clear from what has been said that that must in some degree depend upon their quality but supposing them to be good in quality a pound of hops to a bushel of malt is about the quantity a good deal however depends upon the length of time that the beer is intended to be kept and upon the season of the year in which it is brewed beer intended to be kept a long while should have the full pound also beer brewed in warmer weather though for present use half the quantity may do under an opposite state of circumstances the water should be soft by all means that of brooks or rivers is best that of a pond fed by a rivulet or spring will do very well rain water if just fallen may do but stale rain water or stagnant pond water makes the beer flat and difficult to keep and hard water from wells is very bad it does not get the sweetness out of the malt nor the bitterness out of the hops like soft water and the wort of it does not ferment well which is a certain proof of its unfitness for the purpose there are two descriptions of persons whom i am desirous to see brewing their own beer namely tradesmen and labourers and journeymen there must therefore be two distinct scales treated of in the former editions of this work i spoke of a machine for brewing and stated the advantages of using it in a family of any considerable consumption of beer but while from my desire to promote private brewing i strongly recommended the machine i stated that if any of my readers could point out any method by which we should be more likely to restore the practice of private brewing and especially to the cottage i should be greatly obliged to have them communicate it to me such communications have been made and i am very happy to be able in this new edition of my little work to avail myself of them there was in the patent machine always an objection on account of the expense for even the machine for one bushel of malt cost at the reduced price eight pounds a sum far above the reach of a cottager and even above that of a small tradesman its convenience especially in towns where room is so valuable was an object of great importance but there were disadvantages attending it which until after some experience i did not ascertain it will be remembered that the method by the brewing machine requires the malt to be put into the cold water and for the water to make the malt swim or at least to be in such proportion as to prevent the fire beneath from burning the malt we found that our beer was flat and that it did not keep and this arose i have every reason to believe from this process the malt should be put into hot water and the water at first should be but just sufficient in quantity to stir the malt in and separate it well nevertheless when it is merely to make small beer beer not wanted to keep in such cases the brewing machine may be of use and as will be seen by and by a movable boiler which has nothing to do with the patent may in many cases be of great convenience and utility the two scales of which i have spoken above are now to be spoken of and that i may explain my meaning the more clearly i shall suppose that for the tradesman's family it will be requisite to brew eighteen gallons of ale and thirty-six of small beer to fill three casks of eighteen gallons each it will be observed of course that for larger quantities larger utensils of all sorts will be wanted i take this quantity as the one to give directions on the utensils wanted here will be first a copper that will contain forty gallons at least for though there be to be but thirty-six gallons of small beer there must be space for the hops and for the liquor that goes off in steam second a mashing tub to contain sixty gallons for the malt is to be in this along with the water third an underbuck or shallow tub to go under the mash tub for the wort to run into when drawn from the grains fourth a ton tub that will contain thirty gallons to put the ale into to work the mash tub as we shall see serving as a ton tub for the small beer besides these a couple of coolers 
shallow tubs which may be the heads of wine butts or some such things about a foot deep or if you have four it may be as well in order to effect the cooling more quickly you may begin by filling the copper with water and next by making the water boil you then put into the mashing tub water sufficient to stir and separate the malt in but now let me say more particularly what this mashing tub is it is as you know to contain sixty gallons it is to be a little broader at top than at bottom and not quite so deep as it is wide across the bottom into the middle of the bottom there is a hole about two inches over to draw the wort off through in this hole goes a stick a foot or two longer than the tub is high this stick is to be about two inches through and tapered for about eight inches upwards at the end that goes into the hole which at last it fills up closely as a cork upon the hole before anything else be put into the tub you may lay a little bundle of fine birch heath or straw may do about half the bulk of a birch broom and well tied at both ends this being laid over the hole to keep back the grains as the wort goes out you put the tapered end of the stick down through into the hole and thus cork the hole up you must then have something of weight sufficient to keep the birch steady at the bottom of the tub with a hole through it to slip down the stick otherwise when the stick is raised it will be apt to raise the birch with it and when you are stirring the mash you would move it from its place the best thing for this purpose will be a leaden collar for the stick with the hole in the collar plenty large enough and it should weigh three or four pounds the thing they use in some farmhouses is the iron box of a wheel anything will do that will slide down the stick and lie with weight enough on the birch to keep it from moving now then you are ready to begin brewing i allow two bushels of malt for the brewing i have supposed you must now put into the mashing tub as much boiling water as will be sufficient to stir the malt in and separate it well but here occur some of the nicest points of all namely the degree of heat that the water is to be at before you put in the malt this heat is one hundred and seventy degrees by the thermometer if you have a thermometer this is ascertained easily but without one take this rule by which so much good beer has been made in england for hundreds of years when you can by looking down into the tub see your face clearly in the water the water is become cool enough and you must not put the malt in before now put in the malt and stir it well in the water to perform this stirring which is very necessary you have a stick somewhat bigger than a broomstick with two or three smaller sticks eight or ten inches long put through the lower end of it at about three or four inches asunder and sticking out on each side of the long stick these small cross sticks serve to search the malt and separate it well in the stirring or mashing thus then the malt is in and in this state it should continue for about a quarter of an hour in the meanwhile you will have filled up your copper and made it boil and now at the end of the quarter of an hour you put in boiling water sufficient to give you your eighteen gallons of ale but perhaps you must have thirty gallons of water in the hole for the grains will retain at least ten gallons of water and it is better to have rather too much wort than too little when your proper quantity of water is in stir the malt again well cover the mashing tub over with sacks or something that will answer the same purpose and there let the mash stand for two hours when it has stood the two hours you draw off the wort and now mind the mashing tub is placed on a couple of stools or on something that will enable you to put the under buck under it so as to receive the wort as it comes out of the hole before mentioned when you have put the underbuck in its place you let the wort out by pulling up the stick that corks the hole but observe this stick which goes six or eight inches through the hole must be raised by degrees and the wort must be let out slowly in order to keep back the sediment so that it is necessary to have something to keep the stick up at the point where you are to raise it and wish to fix it at for the time to do this the simplest cheapest and best thing in the world is a cleft stick take a rod of ash hazel birch or almost any wood let it be a foot or two longer than your mashing tub is wide over the top split it as if for making hoops 
tie it round with a string at each end, lay it across your mashing tub, pull it open in the middle, and let the upper part of the wort stick through it, and when you raise that stick, by degrees as before directed, the cleft stick will hold it up at whatever height you please. When you have drawn off the ale-wort, you proceed to put into the mashing tub water for the small beer. But I shall go on with my directions about the ale till I have got it into the cask and cellar, and shall then return to the small beer. As you draw off the ale-wort into the underbuck, you must lay it out of that into the tun-tub, for which work, as well as for various other purposes in the brewing, you must have a bowl-dish with a handle to it. The underbuck will not hold the whole of the wort. It is, as before described, a shallow tub to go under the mashing-tub to draw off the wort into. Out of this underbuck you must lade the ale-wort into the tun-tub, and there it must remain till your copper be emptied and ready to receive it. The copper being empty, you put the wort into it, and put in after the wort, or before it, a pound and a half of good hops, well rubbed and separated as you put them in. You now make the copper boil, and keep it with the lid off at a good brisk boil for a full hour, and if it be an hour and a half, it is none the worse. When the boiling is done, put out your fire, and put the liquor into the coolers. But it must be put into the coolers without the hops. Therefore, in order to get the hops out of the liquor, you must have a strainer. The best for your purpose is a small clothes basket or any other wicker basket. You set your coolers in the most convenient place. It may be indoors or out of doors as most convenient. You lay a couple of sticks across one of the coolers and put the basket upon them. Put your liquor, hops and all, into the basket, which will keep back the hops. When you have got liquor enough in one cooler, you go to another with your sticks and basket till you have got all your liquor out. If you find your liquor deeper in one cooler than the other, you can make an alteration in that respect, till you have the liquor so distributed as to cool equally fast in both or all the coolers. The next stage of the liquor is in the tun-tub, where it is set to work. Now a very great point is the degree of heat that the liquor is to be at when it is set to working. The proper heat is seventy degrees, so that a thermometer makes this matter sure. In the country they determine the degree of heat by merely putting a finger into the liquor. Seventy degrees is but just warm, a gentle lukewarmth, nothing like heat. A little experience makes perfectness in such a matter. When at the proper heat, or nearly, for the liquor will cool a little in being removed, put it into the tun-tub. And now, before I speak of the act of setting the beer to work, I must describe this tun-tub, which I first mentioned in paragraph 42. It is to hold thirty gallons, as you have seen, and nothing is better than an old cask of that size, or somewhat larger, with the head taken out or cut off. But indeed any tub of sufficient dimensions, and of about the same depth proportioned to the width as a cask or barrel has, will do for the purpose. Having put the liquor into the tun-tub, you must put in the yeast. About half a pint of good yeast is sufficient. This should first be put into a thing of some sort that will hold about a gallon of your liquor. The thing should then be nearly filled with liquor, and with a stick or spoon you should mix the yeast well with the liquor in this bowl or other thing, and stir in along with the yeast a handful of wheat or rye flour. This mixture is then to be poured out clean into the tun-tub and the whole mass of the liquor is then to be agitated well by lading up and pouring down again with your bowl-dish, till the yeast be well mixed with the liquor. Some people do the thing in another manner. They mix up the yeast and flour with some liquor, as just mentioned, taken out of the coolers, and then they set the little vessel that contains this mixture down on the bottom of the tun-tub, and leaving it there, put the liquor out of the coolers into the tun-tub being placed at the bottom, and having the liquor poured on it, the mixture is perhaps more perfectly affected in this way than in any way. The flour may not be necessary, but as the country people use it, it is doubtless of some use, for their hereditary experience has not been for nothing. When your liquor is thus properly put into the tun-tub and set a-working, 
cover over the top of the tub by laying across it a sack or two, or something that will answer the purpose. We now come to the last stage, the cask or barrel. But I must first speak of the place for the tun-tub to stand in. The place should be such as to avoid too much warmth or cold. The air should, if possible, be at about fifty-five degrees. Any cool place in summer, and any warmish place in winter. If the weather be very cold, some cloths or sacks should be put round the tun-tub while the beer is working. In about six or eight hours a frothy head will rise upon the liquor, and it will keep rising, more or less slowly, for about forty-eight hours. But the length of time required for the working depends on various circumstances, so that no precise time can be fixed. The best way is to take off the froth, which is indeed yeast, at the end of about twenty-four hours with a common skimmer, and put it into a pan or vessel of some sort. Then in twelve hours' time take it off again in the same way, and so on, till the liquor has done working, and sends up no more yeast. Then it is beer, and when it is quite cold, for ale or strong beer, put it into the cask by means of a funnel. It must be cold before you do this, or it will be what the country people call foxed, that is to say, have a rank and disagreeable taste. Now, as to the cask, it must be sound and sweet. I thought, when writing the former edition of this work, that the bell-shaped were the best casks. I am now convinced that that was an error. The bell-shaped, by contracting the width of the top of the beer as that top descends, in consequence of the draught for use, certainly prevents the head, which always gathers on beer as soon as you begin to draw it off, from breaking and mixing in amongst the beer. This is an advantage in the bell-shape. But then the bell-shape, which places the widest end of the cask uppermost, exposes the cask to the admission of external air much more than the other shape. This danger approaches from the ends of the cask, and in the bell-shape you have the broadest end wholly exposed the moment you have drawn out the first gallon of beer, which is not the case with the casks of the common shape. Directions are given, in the case of the bell-casks, to put damp sand on the top to keep out the air. But it is very difficult to make this effectual. And yet, if you do not keep out the air, your beer will be flat, and when flat it really is good for nothing but the pigs. It is very difficult to fill the bell-cask, which you will easily see if you consider its shape. It must be placed on the level with the greatest possible truth, or there will be a space left and to place it with such truth is perhaps as difficult a thing as a mason or bricklayer ever had to perform. And yet, if this be not done, there will be an empty space in the cask, though it may at the same time run over. With the common casks there are none of these difficulties. A common eye will see when it is well placed, and at any rate any little vacant space that may be left is not at an end of the cask and will, without great carelessness, be so small as to be of no consequence. We now come to the act of putting in the beer. The cask should be placed on a stand with legs about a foot long. The cask, being round, must have a little wedge or block on each side to keep it steady. Bricks do very well. Bring your beer down into the cellar in buckets, and pour it in through the funnel until the cask be full. The cask should lean a little on one side when you fill it, because the beer will work again here, and send more yeast out of the bunghole, and if the cask were not a little on one side, the yeast would flow over both sides of the cask, and would not descend in one stream into a pan put underneath to receive it. Here the bell cask is extremely inconvenient, for the yeast works up all over the head, and cannot run off, and makes a very nasty affair. This alone, to say nothing of the other disadvantages, would decide the question against the bell-casks. Something will go off in this working, which may continue for two or three days. When you put the beer in the cask, you should have a gallon or two left, to keep filling up with as the working produces emptiness. At last, when the working is completely over, write the cask, that is to say, block it up to its level. Put in a handful of fresh hops, Fill the cask quite full, put in the bung with a bit of coarse linen stuff round it, hammer it down tight, 
and, if you like, fill a coarse bag with sand, and lay it well pressed down over the bung. As to the length of time that you are to keep the beer before you begin to use it, that must in some measure depend on taste. Such beer as this ale will keep almost any length of time. As to the mode of tapping, that is as easy almost as drinking. When the cask is empty, great care must be taken to cork it tightly up so that no air gets in, for if it do the cask is moulded, and when once moulded it is spoiled for ever. It is never again fit to be used about beer. Before the cask be used again, the grounds must be poured out, and the cask cleaned by several times scalding, by putting in stones or a chain, and rolling and shaking about till it be quite clean. Here again the round casks have the decided advantage, it being almost impossible to make the bell casks thoroughly clean without taking the head out, which is both troublesome and expensive, as it cannot be well done by any one but a cooper, who is not always at hand, and who, when he is, must be paid. I have now done with the ale, and it remains for me to speak of the small beer. In paragraph 47, which now see, I left you drawing off the ale-wort, and with your copper full of boiling water. Thirty-six gallons of that boiling water are, as soon as you have got your ale-wort out, and have put down your mash-tub stick to close up the hole at the bottom, as soon as you have done this, thirty-six gallons of the boiling water are to go into the mashing-tub. The grains are to be well stirred up as before, the mashing-tub is to be covered over again, as mentioned in paragraph 43, and the mash is to stand in that state for an hour, and not two hours as for the ale-wort. When the small beer mash has stood its hour, draw it off, as in paragraph 47, and put it into the tun-tub as you did the ale-wort. By this time your copper will be empty again, by putting your ale-liquor to cool, as mentioned in paragraph 47 and you now put the small beer wort into the copper, with the hops that you used before, and with half a pound of fresh hops added to them, and this liquor you boil briskly for an hour. By this time you will have taken the grains and the sediment clean out of the mashing-tub, and taken out the bunch of birch twigs, and made all clean. Now put in the birch twigs again, and put down your stick as before. Lay your two or three sticks across the mashing-tub, put your basket on them, and take your liquor from the copper, putting the fire out first, and pour it into the mashing-tub through the basket. Take the basket away, throw the hops to the dunghill, and leave the small beer liquid to cool in the mashing-tub. Here it is to remain, to be set to working as mentioned for the ale, in paragraph 48, only in this case you will want more yeast in proportion, and should have for your thirty-six gallons of small beer three half-pints of good yeast. Proceed as to all the rest of the business, as with the ale, only in the case of the small beer it should be put into the cask not quite cold, but a little warm, or else it will not work at all in the barrel, which it ought to do. It will not work so strongly or so long as the ale, and may be put in the barrel much sooner, in general the next day after it is brewed. All the utensils should be well cleaned and put away as soon as they are done with, the little things as well as the great ones, for it is loss of time to make new ones. And now let us see the expense of these utensils. The copper, new, five pounds. The mashing-tub, new, thirty shillings. The tun-tub, not new, five shillings. The underbuck and three coolers, not new, twenty shillings. The whole cost is seven pounds ten shillings, which is ten shillings less than the one bushel machine. I am now in a farmhouse where the same set of utensils has been used for forty years, and the owner tells me that with the same use they may last for forty years longer. The machine will not, I think, last four years, if in anything like regular use. It is of sheet-iron, tinned on the inside, and this tin rusts exceedingly and is not to be kept clean without such rubbing as must soon take off the tin. The great advantage of the machine is that it can be removed. You can brew without a brew-house. You can set the boiler up against any fireplace or any window. You can brew under a cart-shed and even out of doors. But all this may be done with these utensils if your copper be movable. 
make the boiler of copper and not of sheet iron and fix it on a stand with a fireplace and stove-pipe and then you have the hole to brew out of doors as well as within doors which is a very great convenience now with regard to the other scale of brewing little need to be said because all the principles being the same the utensils only are to be proportioned to the quantity if only one sort of beer be to be brewed at a time all the difference is that in order to extract the whole of the goodness of the malt the mashing ought to be at twice the two worts are then put together and then you boil them together with the hops a correspondent at morpeth says the whole of the utensils used by him are a twenty-gallon pot a mashing tub that also answers for a tun tub and a shallow tub for a cooler and that these are plenty for a person who is anything of a contriver this is very true and these things will cost no more perhaps than forty shillings a nine-gallon cask of beer can be brewed very well with such utensils indeed it is what used to be done by almost every labouring man in the kingdom until the high price of malt and comparatively low price of wages rendered the people too poor and miserable to be able to brew at all a correspondent at bristol has obligingly sent me the model of utensils for brewing on a small scale but as they consist chiefly of brittle ware i am of the opinion that they would not so well answer the purpose indeed as to the country labourers all they want is the ability to get the malt mr ellman in his evidence before the agricultural committee said that when he began farming forty-five years ago there was not a labourer's family in the parish that did not brew their own beer and enjoy it by their own firesides and that now not one single family did it from want of ability to get the malt it is the tax that prevents their getting the malt for the barley is cheap enough the tax causes a monopoly in the hands of the maltsters who when the tax is two and sixpence make the malt cost seven and sixpence though the barley cost but two and sixpence and though the malt tax and all ought to cost him but five and sixpence if the tax were taken off this pernicious monopoly would be destroyed the reader will easily see that in proportion to the quantity wanted to be brewed must be the size of the utensils but i may observe here that the above utensils are sufficient for three or even four bushels of malt if stronger beer be wanted when it is necessary in case of falling short in the quantity wanted to fill up the ale cask some may be taken from the small beer but upon the whole brewing there ought to be no falling short because if the casks be not filled up the beer will not be good and certainly will not keep great care should be taken as to the cleansing of the casks they should be made perfectly sweet or it is impossible to have good beer the cellar for beer to keep any length of time should be cool under a hill is the best place for a cellar but at any rate a cellar of good depth and dry at certain times of the year beer that is kept long will ferment the vent pegs must in such cases be loosened a little and afterwards fastened small beer may be tapped almost directly it is a sort of joke that it should see a sunday but that it may do before it be two days old in short any beer is better than water but it should have some strength and some weeks of age at any rate i cannot conclude this essay without expressing my pleasure that a law has been recently passed to authorize the general retail of beer this really seems necessary to prevent the king's subjects from being poisoned the brewers and porter quacks have carried their tricks to such an extent that there is no safety for those who drink brewer's beer the best and most effectual thing is however for people to brew their own beer to enable them and induce them to do which i have done all that lies in my power a longer treatise on the subject would have been of no use these few plain directions will suffice for those who have a disposition to do the thing and those who have not would remain unmoved by anything that i could say there seems to be a great number of things to do in brewing but the greater part of them require only about a minute each a brewing such as i have given the detail of above may be completed in a day but by the word day i mean to include the morning beginning at four o'clock the putting of the beer into barrel is not more than an hour's work for a servant-woman or a tradesman's or a farmer's wife 
there is no heavy work no work too heavy for a woman in any part of the business otherwise i would not recommend it to be performed by the women who though so amiable in themselves are never quite so amiable as when they are useful and as to beauty though men may fall in love with girls at play there is nothing to make them stand to their love like seeing them at work in conclusion of these remarks on beer brewing i once more express my most anxious desire to see abolished for ever the accursed tax on malt which i verily believe has done more harm to the people of england than was ever done to any people by plague pestilence famine and civil war in paragraph seventy six in paragraph one hundred and eight and perhaps in another place or two of the last edition i spoke of the machine for brewing the work being stereotyped it would have been troublesome to alter those paragraphs but of course the public in reading them will bear in mind what has been now said relative to the machine the inventor of that machine deserves great praise for his efforts to promote private brewing and as i said before in certain confined situations where the beer is to be merely small beer and for immediate use and where time and room are of such importance as to make the cost of the machine comparatively of trifling consideration the machine may possibly be found to be an useful utensil having stated the inducements to the brewing of beer and given the plainest directions that i was able to give for the doing of the thing i shall next proceed to the subject of bread but this subject is too large and of too much moment to be treated with brevity and must therefore be put off till my next number i cannot in the meanwhile dismiss the subject of brewing beer without once more adverting to its many advantages as set forth in the foregoing number of this work the following instructions for the making of porter will clearly show what sort of stuff is sold at public houses in london and we may pretty fairly suppose that the public house beer in the country is not superior to it in quality a quarter of malt with these ingredients will make five barrels of good porter take one quarter of high-coloured malt eight pounds of hops nine pounds of treacle eight pounds of colour eight pounds of sliced licorice root two drams of salt of tartar two ounces of spanish licorice and half an ounce of capsicum the author says that he merely gives the ingredients as used by many persons this extract is taken from a book on brewing recently published in london what a curious composition what a mess of drugs but if the brewers openly avow this what have we to expect from the secret practices of them and the retailers of the article when we know that beer doctor and brewer's druggist are professions practised as openly as those of bugman and rat killer are we simple enough to suppose that the above named are the only drugs that people swallow in those potions which they call pots of beer indeed we know the contrary for scarcely a week passes without witnessing the detection of some greedy wretch who has used in making or in doctoring his beer drugs forbidden by the law and it is not many weeks since one of these was convicted in the court of excise for using potent and dangerous drugs by the means of which and a suitable quantity of water he made two butts of beer into three upon this occasion it appeared that no less than ninety of these worthies were in the habit of pursuing the same practice the drugs are not unpleasant to the taste they sting the palate they give a present relish they communicate a momentary exhilaration but they give no force to the body which on the contrary they enfeeble and in many instances with time destroy producing diseases from which the drinker would otherwise have been free to the end of his days but look again at the receipt for making porter here are eight bushels of malt to a hundred and eighty gallons of beer that is to say twenty-five gallons from the bushel now the malt is eight shillings a bushel and eight pounds of the very best hops will cost but a shilling a pound the malt and hops then for the one hundred and eighty gallons cost but seventy-two shillings that is to say only a little more than fourpence three farthings a gallon for stuff which is now retailed for sixteen pence a gallon if this is not an abomination i should be glad to know what is 
even if the treacle, colour, and the drugs be included, the cost is not five pence a gallon. And yet, not content with this enormous extortion, there are wretches who resort to the use of other and pernicious drugs in order to increase their gains. To provide against this dreadful evil, there is and there can be no law, for it is created by the law. The law it is that imposes the enormous tax on the malt and hops. The law it is that imposes the license tax, and places the power of granting the license at the discretion of persons appointed by the government. The law it is that checks in this way the private brewing, and that prevents free and fair competition in the selling of beer. And as long as the law does these, it will in vain endeavour to prevent the people from being destroyed by slow poison. Innumerable are the benefits that would arise from a repeal of the taxes on malt and on hops. Tippling houses might then be shut up with justice and propriety. The labourer, the artisan, the tradesman, the landlord, all would instantly feel the benefit. But the landlord more, perhaps, in this case than any other member of the community. The four or five pounds a year which the day labourer now drizzles away in tea messes, he would divide with the farmer if he had untaxed beer. His wages would fall, and fall to his advantage, too. The fall of wages would be not less than forty pounds upon a hundred acres. Thus forty pounds would go in the end, a fourth perhaps to the farmer, and three-fourths to the landlord. This is the kind of work to reduce poor rates, and to restore husbandry to prosperity undertaken this work must be and performed too but whether we shall see this until the estates have passed away from the present race of landlords is a question which must be referred to time surely we may hope that when the american farmers shall see this little essay they will begin seriously to think of leaving off the use of the liver-burning and palsy-producing spirits their climate, indeed, is something, extremely hot in one part of the year, and extremely cold in the other part of it. Nevertheless, they may have, and do have, very good beer, if they will. Negligence is the greatest impediment in their way. I like the Americans very much, and that, if there were no other, would be a reason for my not hiding their faults. End of number two Number three of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs seventy seven to one hundred. Making bread. Little time need be spent in dwelling on the necessity of this article to all families, though on account of the modern custom of using potatoes to supply the place of bread, it seems necessary to say a few words here on the subject which in another work i have so amply and i think so triumphantly discussed i am the more disposed to revive the subject for a moment in this place from having read in the evidence recently given before the agricultural committee that many labourers especially in the west of england use potatoes instead of bread to a very great extent and i find from the same evidence that it is the custom to allot to labourers a potato ground in part payment of their wages this has a tendency to bring english labourers down to the state of the irish whose mode of living as to food is but one remove from that of the pig and of the ill-fed pig too i was in reading the above-mentioned evidence glad to find that mr edward wakefield the best informed and most candid of all the witnesses gave it as his opinion that the increase which had taken place in the cultivation of potatoes was injurious to the country, an opinion which must, I think, be adopted by every one who takes the trouble to reflect a little upon the subject, for leaving out of the question the slovenly and beastly habits engendered amongst the labouring classes by constantly lifting their principal food at once out of the earth to their mouths, by eating without the necessity of any implements other than the hands and the teeth, 
and by dispensing with everything requiring skill in the preparation of the food, and requiring cleanliness in its consumption or preservation, leaving these out of the question, though they are all matters of great moment, when we consider their effects in the rearing of a family, we shall find that in mere quantity of food, that is to say of nourishment, bread is the preferable diet. An acre of land that will produce three hundred bushels of potatoes will produce thirty-two bushels of wheat. I state this as an average fact, and am not at all afraid of being contradicted by any one well acquainted with husbandry. The potatoes are supposed to be of a good sort, as it is called, and the wheat may be supposed to weigh sixty pounds a bushel. It is a fact clearly established that, after the water, the stringy substance, and the earth are taken from the potato, there remains only one-tenth of the rough, raw weight of nutritious matter, or matter which is deemed equally nutritious with bread, and as the raw potatoes weigh fifty-six pounds a bushel, the acre will yield one thousand eight hundred and thirty pounds of nutritious matter. Now mind, a bushel of wheat weighing sixty pounds will make of household bread, that is to say, taking out only the bran, sixty-five pounds. Thus the acre yields two thousand and eighty pounds of bread. As to the expenses, the seed and act of planting are about equal in the two cases. But while the potatoes must have cultivation during their growth, the wheat needs none. And while the wheat straw is worth from three to five pounds an acre, the holm of the potatoes is not worth one single truss of that straw. Then, as to the expense of gathering, housing, and keeping the potato crop, it is enormous, besides the risk of loss by frost, which may be safely taken on average at a tenth of the crop. Then comes the expense of cooking. The thirty-two bushels of wheat, supposing a bushel to be baked at a time, which would be the case in a large family, would demand thirty-two heatings of the oven. Suppose a bushel of potatoes to be cooked every day in order to supply the place of this bread, then we have nine hundred boilings of the pot, unless cold potatoes be eaten at some of the meals, and in that case the diet must be cheering indeed. Think of the labour, think of the time, think of all the peelings and scrapings and washings and messings attending these nine hundred boilings of the pot for it must be a considerable time before english people can be brought to eat potatoes in the irish style that is to say scratch them out of the earth with their paws toss them into a pot without washing and when boiled turn them out upon a dirty board and then sit round that board peel the skin and dirt from one at a time and eat the inside mr kerwin was delighted with irish hospitality because the people there received no parish relief upon which I can only say that I wish him the exclusive benefit of such hospitality. I have here spoken of a large quantity of each of the sorts of food. I will now come to a comparative view more immediately applicable to a labourer's family. When wheat is ten shillings the bushel, potatoes bought at best hand, I am speaking of the country generally, are about two shillings a bushel. Last spring the average price of wheat might be six and sixpence, and the average price of potatoes in small quantities was about eighteen pence, though by the wagon-load I saw potatoes bought at a shilling a bushel to give to sheep, then observed these were of the coarsest kind, and the farmer had to fetch them at a considerable expense. I think, therefore, that I give the advantage to the potatoes when I say that they sell, upon an average, for full a fifth part as much as the wheat sells for, per bushel, while they contain four pounds less weight than the bushel of wheat, while they yield only five pounds and a half of nutritious matter equal to bread, and while the bushel of wheat will yield sixty-five pounds of bread besides the ten pounds of bran. Hence it is clear that, instead of that saving, which is everlastingly dinned in our ears, from the use of potatoes, there is a waste of more than one half. Seeing that, when wheat is ten shillings the bushel, you can have sixty-five pounds of bread for the ten shillings, and can have out of potatoes only five pounds and a half of nutritious matter equal to bread for two shillings. 
This being the case, I trust that we shall soon hear no more of those savings which the labourer makes by the use of potatoes. I hope we shall, in the words of Dr. Drennan, leave Ireland to her lazy root, if she chooses still to adhere to it. It is the root also of slovenliness, filth, misery, and slavery. Its cultivation has increased in England with the increase of the paupers. Both, I thank God, are upon the decline. Englishmen seem to be upon the return to beer and bread, from water and potatoes, and therefore I shall now proceed to offer some observations to the cottager calculated to induce him to bake his own bread. As I have before stated, sixty pounds of wheat, that is to say, where the Winchester bushel weighs sixty pounds, will make sixty-five pounds of bread, besides the leaving of about ten pounds of bran. This is household bread, made of flour from which the bran only is taken. If you make fine flour, you take out pollard, as they call it, as well as bran, and then you have a smaller quantity of bread, and a greater quantity of offal, but even of this finer bread, bread equal in fineness to the baker's bread, you get from fifty-eight to fifty-nine pounds out of the bushel of wheat. Now let us see how many quartern loaves you get out of the bushel of wheat, supposing it to be fine flour in the first place. You get thirteen quartern loaves and a half. These cost you, at the present average price of wheat, seven and sixpence a bushel, in the first place seven shillings and sixpence, then threepence for yeast, then not more than threepence for grinding, because you have about thirteen pounds of offal, which is worth more than a halfpenny a pound, while the grinding is ninepence a bushel. Thus, then, the bushel of bread of fifty-nine pounds costs you eight shillings, and it yields you the weight of thirteen and a half quartern loaves. These quartern loaves now, December 1821, sell at Kensington at the baker's shop at one shilling halfpenny. That is to say, the thirteen quartern loaves and a half cost fourteen shillings seven and a half pence. I omitted to mention the salt, which would cost you fourpence more, so that here is six shillings three and a half pence saved upon the baking of a bushel of bread. The baker's quartern loaf is indeed cheaper in the country than at Kensington, by probably a penny in the loaf, which would still, however, leave a saving of five shillings upon the bushel of bread. But besides this, pray think a little of the materials of which the baker's loaf is comprised, the alum, the ground potatoes, and other materials, it being a notorious fact that the bakers, in London at least, have mills wherein to grind their potatoes, so large is the scale upon which they use that material. It is probable that, out of a bushel of wheat, they make between sixty and seventy pounds of bread, though they have no more flour, and of course no more nutritious matter, than you have in your fifty-nine pounds of bread. But, at the least, supposing their bread to be as good as yours in quality, you have, allowing a shilling for the heating of the oven, a clear four shillings saved upon every bushel of bread. If you consume half a bushel a week, that is to say about a quartern loaf a day, this is a saving of five pounds four shillings a year, or a full sixth part, if not a fifth part, of the earnings of a labourer in husbandry. How wasteful, then, and indeed how shameful, for a labourer's wife to go to the baker's shop! And how negligent, how criminally careless of the welfare of his family must the labourer be who permits so scandalous a use of the proceeds of his labour! But I have hitherto taken a view of the matter the least possibly advantageous to the home-baked bread. For ninety-nine times out of a hundred the fuel for heating the oven costs very little, the hedges, the copses, the woodmen of all descriptions have fuel for little or nothing. At any rate, to heat the oven cannot, upon an average, take the country through, cost the labourer more than sixpence a bushel. Then again, fine flour need not ever be used, and ought not to be used. This adds six pounds of bread to the bushel, or nearly another quartern loaf and a half, making nearly fifteen quartern loaves out of the bushel of wheat. The finest flour is by no means the most wholesome, 
and at any rate there is more nutritious matter in a pound of household bread than in a pound of baker's bread. Besides this, rye, and even barley, especially when mixed with wheat, make very good bread. Few people upon the face of the earth live better than the Long Islanders, yet nine families out of ten seldom eat wheaten bread. Rye is the flour that they principally make use of. Now, rye is seldom more than two-thirds the price of wheat, and barley is seldom more than half the price of wheat. Half rye and half wheat, taking out a little more of the offal, make very good bread. Half wheat, a quarter rye and a quarter barley, nay, one-third of each, make bread that I could be very well content to live upon all my lifetime. And even barley alone, if the barley be good, and none but the finest flour taken out of it, has in it, measure for measure, ten times the nutrition of potatoes. Indeed, the fact is well known that our forefathers used barley bread to a very great extent. Its only fault with those who dislike it is its sweetness, a fault which we certainly have not to find with the baker's loaf, which has in it little more of the sweetness of grain than is to be found in the offal which comes from the sawings of deal boards. The nutritious nature of barley is amply proved by the effect, and very rapid effect, of its meal in the fatting of hogs and of poultry of all descriptions. They will fatten quicker upon meal of barley than upon any other thing. The flesh, too, is sweeter than that proceeding from any other food, with the exception of that which proceeds from buckwheat, a grain little used in England. That proceeding from Indian corn is indeed still sweeter and finer, but this is wholly out of the question with us. I am, by and by, to speak of the cow to be kept by the labourer in husbandry. Then there will be milk to wet the bread with, an exceedingly great improvement in its taste as well as in its quality. This, of all the ways of using skim milk, is the most advantageous, and this great advantage must be wholly thrown away if the bread of the family be bought at the shop. With milk, bread with very little wheat in it may be made far better than baker's bread, and, leaving the milk out of the question, taking a third of each sort of grain, you would get bread weighing as much as fourteen quartern loaves for about five shillings and ninepence at present prices of grain that is to say you would get it for about five pence the quartern loaf all expenses included thus you have nine pounds and ten ounces of bread a day for about five shillings and ninepence a week here is enough for a very large family very few labourers' families can want so much as this, unless indeed there be several persons in it capable of earning something by their daily labour. Here is cut and come again. Here is bread always for the table, bread to carry a field, always a hunch of bread ready to put into the hand of a hungry child. We hear a great deal about children crying for bread, and objects of compassion they and their parents are, when the latter have not the means of obtaining a sufficiency of bread. But I should be glad to be informed how it is possible for a labouring man, who earns upon an average ten shillings a week, who has not more than four children, and if he have more some ought to be doing something, who has a garden of a quarter of an acre of land, for that makes part of my plan, who has a wife as industrious as she ought to be, who does not waste his earnings at the ale-house or the tea-shop, I should be glad to know how such a man, while wheat shall be at the price of about six shillings a bushel, can possibly have children crying for bread. Cry, indeed, they must, if he will persist in giving thirteen shillings for a bushel of bread, instead of five shillings and ninepence. Such a man is not to say that the bread which I have described is not good enough. It was good enough for his forefathers, who were too proud to be paupers, that is to say, abject and willing slaves. Hogs eat barley. And hogs will eat wheat, too, when they can get at it. Convicts in condemned cells eat wheaten bread, but we think it no degradation to eat wheaten bread, too. I am for depriving the labourer of none of his rights. I would have him oppressed in no manner or shape. I would have him bold and free. But to have him such, he must have bread in his house sufficient for all his family. 
and whether that bread be fine or coarse must depend upon the different circumstances which present themselves in the cases of different individuals the married man has no right to expect the same plenty of food and of raiment that the single man has the time before marriage is the time to lay by or if the party choose to indulge himself in the absence of labour to marry is a voluntary act and it is attended in the result with great pleasures and advantages if therefore the laws be fair and equal if the state of things be such that a labouring man can with the usual ability of labourers and with constant industry care and sobriety with decency of deportment towards all his neighbours cheerful obedience to his employer and a due subordination to the laws if the state of things be such that such a man's earnings be sufficient to maintain himself and family with food raiment and lodging needful for them such a man has no reason to complain and no labouring man has reason to complain if the numerousness of his family should call upon him for extraordinary exertion or for frugality uncommonly rigid the man with a large family has if it be not in a great measure his own fault a greater number of pleasures and of blessings than other men if he be wise and just as well as wise he will see that it is reasonable for him to expect less delicate fare than his neighbours who have a less number of children or no children at all he will see the justice as well as the necessity of his resorting to the use of coarser bread and thus endeavour to make up that or at least a part of that which he loses in comparison with his neighbours the quality of the bread ought in every case to be proportioned to the number of the family and the means of the head of that family here is no injury to health proposed but on the contrary the best security for its preservation without bread all is misery the scripture truly calls it the staff of life and it may be called too the pledge of peace and happiness in the labourer's dwelling as to the act of making bread it would be shocking indeed if that had to be taught by the means of books every woman high or low ought to know how to make bread if she do not she is unworthy of trust and confidence and indeed a mere burden upon the community yet it is but too true that many women even amongst those who have to get their living by their labour know nothing of the making of bread and seem to understand little more about it than the part which belongs to its consumption a frenchman a mr cousar who had been born in the west indies told me that till he came to long island he never knew how the flour came that he was surprised when he learnt that it was squeezed out of little grains that had grown at the tops of straw for that he had always an idea that it was got out of some large substances like the yams that grow in tropical climates he was a very sincere and good man and i am sure he told me truth and this may be the more readily believed when we see so many women in england who seem to know no more of the constituent parts of a loaf than they know of those of the moon servant women in abundance appear to think that loaves are made by the baker as knights are made by the king things of their pure creation a creation too in which no one else can participate now is not this an enormous evil and whence does it come servant women are the children of the labouring classes and they would all know how to make bread and know well how to make it too if they had been fed on bread of their mothers and their own making how serious a matter then is this even in this point of view a servant that cannot make bread is not entitled to the same wages as one that can if she can neither bake nor brew if she be ignorant of the nature of flour yeast malt and hops what is she good for if she understand these matters well if she be able to supply her employer with bread and with beer she is really valuable she is entitled to good wages and to consideration and respect into the bargain but if she be wholly deficient in these particulars and can merely dawdle about with a bucket and a broom she can be of very little consequence to lose her is merely to lose a consumer of food and she can expect very little indeed in the way of desire to make her life easy and pleasant 
why should any one have such desire? She is not a child of the family. She is not a relation. Any one, as well as she, can take in a loaf from the baker, or a barrel of beer from the brewer. She has nothing whereby to bind her employer to her. To sweep a room anything is capable of that has got two hands. In short, she has no useful skill, no useful ability. She is an ordinary drudge, and she is treated accordingly. But, if such be her state in the house of an employer, what is her state in the house of a husband? The lover is blind, but the husband has eyes to see with. He soon discovers that there is something wanted besides dimples and cherry cheeks, and I would have fathers seriously reflect, and to be well assured, that the way to make their daughters to be long admired, beloved, and respected by their husbands, is to make them skilful, able, and active in the most necessary concerns of a family. Eating and drinking come three times every day. The preparations for these, and all the ministry necessary to them, belong to the wife, and I hold it to be impossible that, at the end of two years, a really ignorant, sluttish wife should possess anything worthy of the name of love from her husband. This, therefore, is a matter of far greater moment to the father of a family than whether the parson of the parish or the Methodist priest be the most evangelical of the two, for it is here a question of the daughter's happiness or misery for life and I have no hesitation to say that if I were a labouring man, I should prefer teaching my daughters to bake, brew, milk, make butter and cheese, to teaching them to read the Bible till they had got every word of it by heart. And I should think, too, nay, I should know, that I was in the former case doing my duty towards God as well as towards my children. When we see a family of dirty, ragged little creatures, let us inquire into the cause and ninety-nine times out of every hundred we shall find that the parents themselves have been brought up in the same way. But a consideration which ought of itself to be sufficient is the contempt in which a husband will naturally hold a wife that is ignorant of the matters necessary to the conducting of a family. A woman who understands all the things above mentioned is really a skilful person, a person worthy of respect and that will be treated with respect, too, by all but brutish employers or brutish husbands, and such, though sometimes, are not very frequently found. Besides, if natural justice and our own interest had not the weight which they have, such valuable persons will be treated with respect. They know their own worth, and accordingly they are more careful of their character, more careful not to lessen by misconduct the value which they possess from their skill and ability. Thus, then, the interest of the labourer, his health, the health of his family, the peace and happiness of his home, the prospects of his children through life, their skill, their ability, their habits of cleanliness, and even their moral deportment, all combine to press upon him the adoption and the constant practice of this branch of domestic economy. Can she bake, is the question that I always put. If she can, she is worth a pound or two a year more. Is that nothing? Is it nothing for a labouring man to make his four or five daughters worth eight or ten pounds a year more, and that too while he is by the same means providing the more plentifully for himself and the rest of his family? The reasons on the side of the thing that I contend for are endless. But if this one motive be not sufficient, I am sure all that I have said and all that I could say must be wholly unavailing. Before, however, I dismiss this subject, let me say a word or two to those persons who do not come under the denomination of labourers. In London, or in any very large town where the space is so confined, and where the proper fuel is not handily to be come at and stored for use, to bake your own bread may be attended with too much difficulty. But in all other situations there appears to me to be hardly any excuse for not baking bread at home. If the family consist of twelve or fourteen persons, the money actually saved in this way, even at present prices, would be little short of from twenty to thirty pounds a year. At the utmost here is only the time of one woman occupied one day in the week. 
now mind here are twenty-five pounds to be employed in some way different from that of giving it to the baker if you add five of these pounds to a woman's wages is that not full as well employed as giving it in wages to the baker's men is it not better employed for you and is it not better employed for the community it is very certain that if the practice were as prevalent as i could wish there would be a large deduction from the regular baking population but would there be any harm if less alum were imported into england and if some of those youths were left at the plough who are now bound in apprenticeships to learn the art and mystery of doing that which every girl in the kingdom ought to be taught to do by her mother it ought to be a maxim with every master and every mistress never to employ another to do that which can be done as well by their own servants the more of their money that is retained in the hands of their own people the better it is for them altogether besides a man of a right mind must be pleased with the reflection that there is a great mass of skill and ability under his own roof he feels stronger and more independent on this account all pecuniary advantage out of the question it is impossible to conceive anything more contemptible than a crowd of men and women living together in a house and constantly looking out of it for people to bring them food and drink and to fetch their garments to and fro such a crowd resemble a nest of unfledged birds absolutely dependent for their very existence on the activity and success of the old ones yet on men go from year to year in this state of wretched dependence even when they have all the means of living within themselves which is certainly the happiest state of life that any one can enjoy it may be asked where is the mill to be found where is the wheat to be got the answer is where is there not a mill where is there not a market they are everywhere and the difficulty is to discover what can be the peculiar attractions contained in that long and luminous manuscript a baker's half-yearly bill with regard to the mill in speaking of families of any considerable number of persons the mill has with me been more than once a subject of observation in print i for a good while experienced the great inconvenience and expense of sending my wheat and other grain to be ground at a mill this expense in case of a considerable family living at only a mile from a mill is something but the inconveniency and uncertainty are great in my year's residence in america from paragraphs one thousand and thirty one and onwards i give an account of a horse mill which i had in my farmyard and i showed i think very clearly that corn could be ground cheaper in this way than by wind or water and that it would answer well to grind for sale in this way as well as for home use since my return to england i have seen a mill erected in consequence of what the owner had read in my book this mill belongs to a small farmer who when he cannot work on his land with his horses or in the season when he has little for them to do grinds wheat sells the flour and he takes in grists to grind as other millers do this mill goes with three small horses but what i would recommend to gentlemen with considerable families or to farmers is a mill such as i myself have at present with this mill turned by a man and a stout boy i can grind six bushels of wheat in a day and dress the flour the grinding of six bushels of wheat at ninepence a bushel comes to four and sixpence which pays the man and the boy supposing them which is not and seldom can be the case to be hired for the express purpose out of the street with the same mill you grind meal for your pigs and of this you will get eight or ten bushels ground in a day you have no trouble about sending to the mill you are sure to have your own wheat for strange as it may seem i used sometimes to find that i sent white essex wheat to the mill and that it brought me flour from very coarse red wheat there is no accounting for this except by supposing that wind and water power has something in it to change the very nature of the grain as when i came to grind by horses such as the wheat went into the hopper so the flour came out into the bin but mine now is only on the petty scale of providing for a dozen of persons and a small lot of pigs for a farmhouse or a gentleman's house in the country where there would be room to have a walk for a horse 
you might take the labour from the men clap any little horse pony or even ass to the wheel and he would grind you off eight or ten bushels of wheat in a day and both he and you would have the thanks of your men into the bargain the cost of this mill is twenty pounds the dresser is four more the horse-path and wheel might possibly be four or five more and i am very certain that to any farmer living at a mile from a mill and that is less than the average distance perhaps having twelve persons in family having forty pigs to feed and twenty hogs to fatten the savings of such a mill would pay the whole expenses of it the very first year such a farmer cannot send less than fifty times a year to the mill think of that in the first place the elements are not always propitious sometimes the water fails and sometimes the wind many a farmer's wife has been tempted to vent her spleen on both at best there must be horse and man or boy and perhaps cart to go to the mill and that too observe in all weathers and in the harvest as well as at other times of the year the case is one of imperious necessity neither floods nor droughts nor storms nor calms will allay the cravings of the kitchen nor quiet the clamorous uproar of the sty go somebody must to some place or other and back they must come with flour and with meal one summer many persons came down the country more than fifty miles to a mill that i knew in pennsylvania and i have known farmers in england carry their grists more than fifteen miles to be ground it is surprising that under these circumstances hand mills and horse mills should not long ago have become of more general use especially when one considers that the labour in this case would cost the farmer next to nothing to grind would be the work of a wet day there is no farmer who does not at least fifty days in every year exclaim when he gets up in the morning what shall i set them at to-day if he had a mill he would make them pull off their shoes sweep all out clean winnow up some corn if he had it not already done and grind and dress and have everything in order no scolding within doors about the grist no squeaking in the sty no boy sent off in the rain to the mill but there is one advantage which i have not yet mentioned and which is the greatest of all namely that you would have the power of supplying your married labourers your blacksmith's men sometimes your wheelwright's men at other times and indeed the greater part of the persons that you employed with good flour instead of their going to purchase their flour after it had passed through the hands of a corn merchant a miller a flour merchant and a huckster every one of whom does and must have a profit out of the flour arising from wheat grown upon and sent away from your very farm i used to let all my people have flour at the same price that they would otherwise have been compelled to give for worse flour every farmer will understand me when i say that he ought to pay for nothing in money which he can pay for in anything but money his maxim is to keep the money that he takes as long as he can now here is a most effectual way of putting that maxim in practice to a very great extent farmers know well that it is the saturday night which empties their pockets and here is the means of cutting off a good half of the saturday night the men have better flour for the same money and still the farmer keeps at home those profits which would go to the maintaining of the dealers in wheat and in flour the maker of my little mill is mr hill of oxford street the expense is what i have stated it to be i with my small establishment find the thing convenient and advantageous what then must it be to a gentleman in the country who has room and horses and a considerable family to provide for the dresser is so contrived as to give you at once meal of four degrees of fineness so that for certain purposes you may take the very finest and indeed you may have your flour and your bread of course of what degree of fineness you please but there is also a steel mill much less expensive requiring less labour and yet quite sufficient for a family mills of this sort very good and at a reasonable price are to be had of mr parks in fenchurch street london these are very complete things of their kind mr parks has also excellent malt mills 
In concluding this part of my treatise, I cannot help expressing my hope of being instrumental in inducing a part of the labourers, at any rate, to bake their own bread, and above all things to abandon the use of Ireland's lazy root. Nevertheless, so extensive is the erroneous opinion relative to this villainous root, that I really began to despair of checking its cultivation and use, till I saw the declaration which Mr. Wakefield had the good sense and the spirit to make before the Agricultural Committee. Be it observed, too, that Mr. Wakefield had himself made a survey of the State of Ireland. What he saw there did not encourage him, doubtless, to be an advocate for the growing of this root of wretchedness. It is an undeniable fact that, in the proportion that this root is in use as a substitute for bread, the people are wretched. The reasons for which I have explained and enforced a hundred times over. Mr. William Hanning told the committee that the labourers in his part of Somersetshire were almost wholly supplied with potatoes, breakfast and dinner, brought them in the fields, and nothing but potatoes, and that they used in better times to get a certain portion of bacon and cheese, which, on account of their poverty, they do not eat now. It is impossible that men can be contented in such a state of things. It is unjust to desire them to be contented. It is a state of misery and degradation, to which no part of any community can have any show of right to reduce another part. Men so degraded have no protection, and it is a disgrace to form part of a community to which they belong. This degradation has been occasioned by a silent change in the value of the money of the country. This has purloined the wages of the labourer. It has reduced him by degrees to house with the spider and the bat, and to feed with the pig. It has changed the habits, and in a great measure the character of the people. The sins of this system are enormous and undescribable, but, thank God, they seem to be approaching to their end. Money is resuming its value, labour is recovering its price. Let us hope that the wretched potato is disappearing, and that we shall once more see the knife in the labourer's hand, and the loaf upon his board. This was written in 1821. Now, 1823, we have had the experience of 1822, when, for the first time, the world saw a considerable part of a people plunged into all the horrors of famine, at a moment when the government of that nation declared food to be abundant. Yes, the year 1822 saw Ireland in this state, saw the people of whole parishes receiving the extreme unction preparatory to yielding up their breath for want of food, and this while large exports of meat and flour were taking place in that country. But, horrible as this was, disgraceful as it was to the name of Ireland, it was attended with this good effect, it brought out from many members of Parliament in their places, and from the public in general, the acknowledgment that the misery and degradation of the Irish were chiefly owing to the use of the potato as the almost sole food of the people. In my next number I shall treat of the keeping of cows. I have said that I will teach the cottager how to keep a cow all the year round upon the produce of a quarter of an acre, or, in other words, forty rods of land, and in my next I will make good my promise. End of number three Number four of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs 101 to 107. Making Bread Continued. In the last number, at paragraph 86, I observed that I hoped it was unnecessary for me to give any directions as to the mere act of making bread. But several correspondents inform me that, without these directions, a conviction of the utility of baking bread at home is of no use to them. Therefore I shall here give those directions, receiving my instructions here from one who, I thank God, does know how to perform this act. Suppose the quantity be a bushel of flour. Put this flour into a trough that people have for the purpose, 
or it may be in a clean smooth tub of any shape, if not too deep and if sufficiently large. Make a pretty deep hole in the middle of this heap of flour. Take, for a bushel, a pint of good fresh yeast. Mix it and stir it well up in a pint of soft water, milk warm. Pour this into the hole in the heap of flour. Then take a spoon and work it round the outside of this body of moisture, so as to bring into that body, by degrees, flour enough to make it form a thin batter, which you must stir about well for a minute or two. Then take a handful of flour and scatter it thinly over the head of this batter, so as to hide it. Then cover the whole thing over with a cloth to keep it warm, and this covering, as well as the situation of the trough, as to distance from the fire, must depend on the nature of the place and state of the weather as to heat and cold. When you perceive that the batter has risen enough to make cracks in the flour that you covered it over with, you begin to form the whole mass into dough, thus. You begin round the hole containing the batter, working the flour into the batter, and pouring in, as it is wanted to make the flour mix with the batter, soft water milk warm, or milk, as hereafter to be mentioned. Before you begin this, you scatter the salt over the heap at the rate of half a pound to a bushel of flour. When you have got the whole sufficiently moist, you knead it well. This is a grand part of the business, for unless the dough be well worked, there will be little round lumps of flour in the loaves, and besides, the original batter, which is to give fermentation to the whole, will not be duly mixed. The dough must therefore be well worked. The fists must go heartily into it. It must be rolled over, pressed out, folded up and pressed out again, until it be completely mixed, and formed into a stiff and tough dough. This is labour, mind. I've never quite liked baker's bread, since I saw a great heavy fellow in a bakehouse in France, kneading bread with his naked feet. His feet looked very white, to be sure. Whether they were of that colour before he got into the trough, I could not tell. God forbid that I should suspect that this is ever done in England. It is labour. But what is exercise other than labour? Let a young woman bake a bushel once a week, and she will do very well without files and gallipots. Thus, then, the dough is made, and when made, it is to be formed into a lump in the middle of the trough, and with a little dry flour thinly scattered over it, covered over again, to be kept warm and to ferment. And in this state, if all be done rightly, it will not have to remain more than about fifteen or twenty minutes. In the meanwhile, the oven is to be heated, and this is much more than half the art of the operation. When an oven is properly heated, can be known only by actual observation. Women who understand the matter know when the heat is right the moment they put their faces within a yard of the oven mouth, and once or twice observing is enough for any person of common capacity. But this much may be said in the way of rule, that the fuel, I am supposing a brick oven, should be dry, not rotten, wood, and not mere brushwood, but rather faggot sticks. If larger wood, it ought to be split up into sticks not more than two or two and a half inches through. Bush wood that is strong, not green and not too old, if it be hard in its nature and has some sticks in it, may do. The woody parts of furze or ling will heat an oven very well. But the thing is to have a lively and yet somewhat strong fire, so that the oven may be heated in about fifteen minutes and retain its heat sufficiently long. The oven should be hot by the time that the dough, as mentioned in paragraph 103, has remained in the lump about twenty minutes. When both are ready, take out the fire and wipe the oven out clean, and at nearly about the same moment take the dough out upon the lid of the baking trough, or some proper place, cut it up into pieces, and make it up into loaves, kneading it again into these separate parcels, and, as you go on, shaking a little flour over your board to prevent the dough from adhering to it. The loaves should be put into the oven as quickly as possible after they are formed. When in, the oven lid or door should be fastened up very closely, and if all be properly managed, loaves of about the size of quartern loaves will be sufficiently baked in about two hours. But they usually take down the lid and look at the bread in order to see how it is going on. And what is there worthy of the name of plague or trouble in all this? Here is no dirt, no filth 
no rubbish, no litter, no slop. And pray what can be pleasanter to behold? Talk, indeed, of your pantomimes and gaudy shows, your processions and installations and coronations. Give me, for a beautiful sight, a neat and smart woman, heating her oven and setting in her bread. And if the bustle does make the sign of labour glisten on her brow, where is the man that would not kiss that off rather than lick the plaster from the cheek of a duchess? And what is the result? Why, good, wholesome food, sufficient for a considerable family for a week, prepared in three or four hours. To get this quantity of food fit to be eaten, in the shape of potatoes, how many fires! What a washing, what a boiling, what a peeling, what a slopping, and what a messing! The cottage everlastingly in a litter, the woman's hands everlastingly wet and dirty, the children grimed up to the eyes with dust fixed on by potato starch, and ragged as colts, the poor mother's time, all being devoted to the everlasting boilings of the pot. Can any man who knows anything of the labourer's life deny this? And will, then, anybody except the old shuffle-breeches band of the Quarterly Review, who have all their lives been moving from garret to garret, who have seldom seen the sun, and never the dew, except in print, will anybody except these men say that the people ought to be taught to use potatoes as a substitute for bread? Paragraphs 108 to 110. Brewing Beer this matter has been fully treated of in the two last numbers, but several correspondents wishing to fall upon some means of rendering the practice beneficial to those who are unable to purchase brewing utensils have recommended the lending of them or letting out round a neighbourhood. Another correspondent has therefore pointed out to me an Act of Parliament which touches upon this subject, and indeed what of excise laws and custom laws and combination laws and libel laws a human being in this country scarcely knows what he dares do or what he dares say. What father, for instance, would have imagined that, having brewing utensils, which two men carry from house to house as easily as they can a basket, he dared not lend them to his son living in the next street, or at the next door? Yet such really is the law, for, according to the Act Fifth of the 22nd and 23rd of that honest and sincere gentleman Charles the Second, there is a penalty of fifty pounds for lending or letting brewing utensils. However, it has this limit, that the penalty is confined to cities, corporate towns, and market towns where there is a public brew-house. So that, in the first place, you may let or lend in any place where there is no public brew-house, and in all towns not corporate or market, and in all villages, hamlets, and scattered places. Another thing is, can a man who has brewed beer at his own house in the country bring that beer into town to his own house, and for the use of his family there? This has been asked of me. I cannot give a positive answer without reading about seven large volumes in quarto of taxing laws. The best way would be to try it, and if any penalty, pay it by subscription, if that would not come under the law of conspiracy. However, I think there can be no danger here. So monstrous a thing as this can surely not exist. If there be such a law, it is daily violated, for nothing is more common than for country gentlemen, who have a dislike to die by poison, bringing their home-brewed beer to London. Another correspondent recommends parishes to make their own malt. But surely the landlords mean to get rid of the malt and salt tax, Many dairies, I dare say, pay fifty pounds a year each in salt tax. How, then, are they to contend against Irish butter and Dutch butter and cheese? And as to the malt tax, it is a dreadful drain from the land. I have heard of labourers living in unkent places, making their own malt even now. Nothing is so easy as to make your own malt, if you are permitted. You soak the barley about three days, according to the state of the weather, and then you put it on stones or bricks and keep it turned till the root shoots out, and then to know when to stop and to put it to dry, take up a corn, which you will find nearly transparent, and look through the skin of it. 
you will see the spear, that is to say the shoot that would come out of the ground, pushing on towards the point of the barleycorn. It starts from the bottom where the root comes out, and it goes on towards the other end, and would, if kept moist, come out at that other end when the root was about an inch long. So that when you have got the root to start, by soaking and turning in heap, the spear is on its way. If you look in through the skin you will see it, and now observe, when the point of the spear has got along as far as the middle of the barleycorn, you should take your barley and dry it. How easy would every family, and especially every farmer, do this, if it were not for the punishment attached to it? The persons in the unkent places before mentioned dry the malt in their oven. But let us hope that the labourer will soon be able to get malt without exposing himself to punishment as a violator of the law. Paragraphs 111 to 128 keeping cows as to the use of milk and of that which proceeds from milk in a family very little need be said at a certain age bread and milk are all that a child wants as a later age they furnish one meal a day for children milk is at all seasons good to drink in the making of puddings and in the making of bread too how useful is it let any one who has eaten none but baker's bread for a good while taste bread home-baked, mixed with milk instead of with water, and he will find what the difference is. There is this only to be observed, that in hot weather bread mixed with milk will not keep so long as that mixed with water. It will of course turn sour sooner. Whether the milk of a cow be to be consumed by a cottage family in the shape of milk, or whether it be to be made to yield butter, skim milk, and buttermilk, must depend on circumstances. A woman that has no child, or only one, would perhaps find it best to make some butter at any rate. Besides, skim milk and bread, the milk being boiled, is quite strong food enough for any children's breakfast, even when they begin to go to work, a fact which I state upon the most ample and satisfactory experience very seldom having ever had any other sort of breakfast myself, till I was more than ten years old, and I was in the fields at work full four years before that. I will here mention that it gave me singular pleasure to see a boy, just turned of six, helping his father to reap in Sussex this last summer. He did little, to be sure, but it was something. His father sent him into the ridge at a great distance before him, and when he came up to the place he found a sheaf cut and those who know what it is to reap know how pleasant it is to find now and then a sheaf cut ready to their hand. It was no small thing to see a boy fit to be trusted with so dangerous a thing as a reap-hook in his hands, at an age when young masters have nursery-maids to cut their victuals for them, and to see that they do not fall out of the window, tumble downstairs, or run under carriage-wheels or horses' bellies. Was not this father discharging his duty by this boy much better than he would have been by sending him to a place called a school? The boy is in a school here, and an excellent school too, the school of useful labour. I must hear a great deal more than I ever have heard to convince me that teaching children to read tends so much to their happiness, their independence of spirit, their manliness of character, as teaching them to reap. The creature that is in want must be a slave, and to be habituated to labour cheerfully is the only means of preventing nineteen-twentieths of mankind from being in want. I have digressed here, but observations of this sort can, in my opinion, never be too often repeated, especially at a time when all sorts of mad projects are on foot for what is falsely called educating the people and when some would do this by a tax that would compel the single man to give part of his earnings to teach the married man's children to read and write. Before I quit the uses to which milk may be put, let me mention that, as mere drink, it is, unless perhaps in case of heavy labour, better, in my opinion, than any beer, however good. I have drank little else for the last five years at any time of the day. Skim milk, I mean. If you have not milk enough to wet up your bread with, for a bushel of flour requires about sixteen to eighteen pints, you make up the quantity with water, of course, 
or, which is a very good way, with water that has been put boiling hot upon bran, and then drained off. This takes the goodness out of the bran, to be sure, but really good bread is a thing of so much importance that it always ought to be the very first object in domestic economy. The cases vary so much that it is impossible to lay down rules for the application of the produce of a cow, which rules shall fit all cases. I content myself, therefore, with what has already been said on the subject, and shall only make an observation on the act of milking, before I come to the chief matter, namely, the getting of the food for the cow. A cow should be milked clean. Not a drop, if it can be avoided, should be left in the udder. It has been proved that the half-pint that comes out last has twelve times, I think it is, as much butter in it as the half-pint that comes out first. I tried the milk of ten Alderney cows, and, as nearly as I, without being very nice about the matter, could ascertain, I found the difference to be about what I have stated. The udder would seem to be a sort of milk-pan, in which the cream is uppermost, and, of course, comes out last, seeing that the outlet is at the bottom. But, besides this, if you do not milk clean, the cow will give less and less milk, and will become dry much sooner than she ought. The cause of this I do not know, but experience has long established the fact. In providing food for a cow, we must look first at the sort of cow seeing that a cow of one sort will certainly require more than twice as much food as a cow of another sort. For a cottage, a cow of the smallest sort common in England is on every account the best, and such a cow will not require above seventy or eighty pounds of good moist food in the twenty-four hours. Now, how to raise this food on forty rods of ground is what we want to know. It frequently happens that a labourer has more than forty rods of ground, it more frequently happens that he has some common, some lane, some little outlet or other for a part of the year at least. In such cases he may make a different disposition of his ground, or may do with less than the forty rods. I am here, for simplicity's sake, to suppose that he have forty rods of clear, unshaded land, besides what his house and sheds stand upon, and that he have nothing further in the way of means to keep his cow. I suppose the forty rods to be clean and unshaded, for I am to suppose that when a man thinks of five quarts of milk a day, on an average, all the year round, he will not suffer his ground to be encumbered by apple-trees that give him only the means of treating his children to fits of the belly-ache, or with currants and gooseberry-bushes, which, though their fruit do very well to amuse, really give nothing worthy of the name of food, except to the blackbirds and thrushes. The ground is to be clear of trees, and in the spring we will suppose it to be clean. Then dig it up deeply, or, which is better, trench it, keeping, however, the top spit of soil at the top. Lay it in ridges in April or May, about two feet apart, and made high and sharp. When the weeds appear about three inches high, turn the ridges into the furrows, never moving the ground but in dry weather and bury all the weeds. Do this as often as the weeds get three inches high, and by the fall you will have really clean ground and not poor ground. There is the ground then ready. About the 26th of August, but not earlier, prepare a rod of your ground, and put some manure in it, for some you must have, and sow one half of it with early York cabbage seed, and the other half with sugar loaf cabbage seed both of the true sort, in little drills at eight inches apart, and the seeds thin in the drill. If the plants come up at two inches apart, and they should be thinned if thicker, you will have a plenty. As soon as fairly out of the ground, hoe the ground nicely, and pretty deeply, and again in a few days. When the plants have six leaves, which will be very soon, dig up, make fine, and manure another rod or two, and prick out the plants, four thousand of each, in rows at eight inches apart, and three inches in the row. Hoe the ground between them often, and they will grow fast, and be straight and strong. I suppose that these beds for plants take four rods of your ground. 
early in November, or, as the weather may serve, a little earlier or later, lay some manure, of which I shall say more hereafter, between the ridges in the other thirty-six rods, and turn the ridges over on this manure, and then transplant your plants on the ridges, at fifteen inches apart. Here they will stand the winter, and you must see that slugs do not eat them. If any plants fail, you have plenty in the bed where you prick them out, for your thirty-six rods will not require more than four thousand plants. If the winter be very hard, and badly for plants, you cannot cover thirty-six rods, but you may the bed where the rest of your plants are. A little litter, or straw, or dead grass, or fern, laid along between the rows and the plants, not to cover the leaves, will preserve them completely. When people complain of all their plants being cut off, they have in fact nothing to complain of but their own extreme carelessness. If I had a gardener, who complained of all his plants being cut off, I should cut him off pretty quickly. If those in the thirty-six rods fail, or fail in part, fill up their places later in the winter by plants from the bed. If you find the ground dry at the top during the winter, hoe it, and particularly near the plants, and rout out all slugs and insects. And when March comes and the ground is dry, hoe deep and well, and earth the plants up close to the lower leaves. As soon as the plants begin to grow, dig the ground with a spade, clean and well, and let the spade go as near to the plants as you can, without actually displacing the plants. Give them another digging in a month, and if weeds come in the meanwhile, hoe, and let not one live a week. Oh, what a deal of work! Well, but it is for yourself, and besides it is not all to be done in a day, and we shall by and by see what it is altogether. By the first of June, I speak of the south of England, and there is also some difference in seasons and soils, but, generally speaking, by the first of June you will have turned-in cabbages, and soon you will have the early yorks solid. And by the first of June you may get your cow, one that is about to calve, or that has just calved, and at this time such a cow as you will want will not, thank God, cost above five pounds. I shall speak of the place to keep her in, and of the manure and litter, by and by. At present I confine myself to her mere food. The thirty-six rods, if the cabbages all stood till they got solid, would give her food for two hundred days, at eighty pounds weight per day, which is more than she would eat. But you must use some at first that are not solid, and then some of them will have split before you can use them but you will have pigs to help off with them, and to gnaw the heads of the stumps. Some of the sugar-loaves may have been planted out in the spring, and thus these thirty-six rods will get you along to some time in September. Now mind, in March, and again in April, sow more early yorks, and get them to be fine stout plants as you did those in the fall. Dig up the ground and manure it, and as fast as you cut cabbages, plant cabbages and in the same manner and with the same cultivation as before. Your last planting will be about the middle of August, with stout plants, and these will serve you into the month of November. Now we have to provide from December to May inclusive, and that too out of this same piece of ground. In November there must be, arrived at perfection, three thousand turnip plants. These, without the greens, must weigh, on an average, five pounds, and this, at eighty pounds a day, will keep the cow one hundred and eighty-seven days, and there are but one hundred and eighty-two days in these six months. The greens will have helped out the latest cabbages to carry you through November, and perhaps into December. But for these six months you must depend on nothing but the Swedish turnips. And now, how are these to be had upon the same ground that bears the cabbages? That we are now going to see. When you plant out your cabbages at the outset, put first a row of early yorks, then a row of sugar loaves, and so on throughout the piece. Of course, as you are to use the early yorks first, you will cut every other row, and the early yorks that you are to plant in summer will go into the intervals. 
by and by the sugar loaves are cut away and in their place will come swedish turnips you digging and manuring the ground as in the case of the cabbages and at last you will find about sixteen rods where you will have found it too late and unnecessary besides to plant any second crop of cabbages here the swedish turnips will stand in rows at two feet apart and always a foot apart in the row and thus you will have three thousand turnips and if these do not weigh five pounds each on an average the fault must be in the seed or in the management the swedish turnips are raised in this manner you will bear in mind the four rods of ground in which you have sowed and pricked out your cabbage plants the plants that will be left there will in april serve you for greens if you ever eat any though bread and bacon are very good without greens and rather better than with at any rate the pig which has strong powers of digestion will consume this herbage in a part of these four rods you will in march and april as before directed have sown and raised your early yorks for the summer planting now in the last week of may prepare a quarter of a rod of this ground and sow it precisely as directed for the cabbage seed with swedish turnip seed and sow a quarter of a rod every three days till you have sowed two rods if the fly appear cover the rods over in the daytime with cabbage leaves and take the leaves off at night hoe well between the plants and when they are safe from the fly thin them to four inches apart in the row the two rods will give you nearly five thousand plants which is two thousand more than you will want from this bed you draw your plants to transplant in the ground where the cabbages have stood as before directed you should transplant none much before the middle of july and not much later than the middle of august in the two rods whence you take your turnip plants you may leave plants to come to perfection at two feet distance each way and this will give you over and above eight hundred and forty pounds weight of turnips for the other two rods will be ground enough for you to sow your cabbage plants in at the end of august as directed for last year i should now proceed to speak of the manner of harvesting preserving and using the crops of the manner of feeding the cow of the shed for her of the managing of the manure and several other less important things but these for want of room here must be reserved for the beginning of my next number after therefore observing that the turnip plants must be transplanted in the same way that cabbage plants are and that both ought to be transplanted in dry weather and in ground just fresh digged i shall close this number with the notice of two points which i am most anxious to impress upon the mind of every reader the first is whether these crops give an ill taste to milk and butter it is very certain that the taste and smell of certain sorts of cattle food will do this for in some parts of america where the wild garlic of which the cows are very fond and which like other bulbous rooted plants springs before the grass not only the milk and butter have a strong taste of garlic but even the veal when the calves suck milk from such sources none can be more common expressions than in philadelphia market are those of garlicky butter and garlicky veal i have distinctly tasted the whisky in milk of cows fed upon distiller's wash it is also certain that if the cow eat putrid leaves of cabbages and turnips the butter will be offensive and the white turnip which is at best but a poor thing and often half putrid makes miserable butter the large cattle cabbage which when loaved hard has a strong and even an offensive smell will give a bad taste and smell to milk and butter whether they be putrid leaves or not if you boil one of these rank cabbages the water is extremely offensive to the smell but i state upon positive and recent experience that early york and sugar-loaf cabbages will yield as sweet milk and butter as any food that can be given to a cow during this last summer i have with the exception about to be noticed kept from the first of may to the twenty second of october five cows upon the grass of two acres and a quarter of ground the grass being generally cut up for them and given to them in the stall 
I had in the spring five thousand cabbage plants, intended for my pigs, eleven in number. But the pigs could not eat half their allowance, though they were not very small when they began upon it. We were compelled to resort to the aid of the cows, and in order to see the effect on the milk and butter we did not mix the food, but gave the cows two distinct spells at the cabbages, each spell about ten days in duration. The cabbages were cut off the stump, with little or no care about dead leaves, and sweeter, finer butter, butter of a finer colour than these cabbages made, never was made in this world. I never had better from cows feeding in the sweetest pasture. Now, as to Swedish turnips, they do give a little taste, especially if boiling of the milk-pans be neglected, and if the greatest care be not taken about all the dairy tackle. Yet we have for months together had the butter so fine from Swedish turnips that nobody could well distinguish it from grass-butter. But to secure this there must be no sluttishness. Churn, pans, pail, shelves, wall, floor, and all about the dairy must be clean, and above all things the pans must be boiled. However, after all, it is not here a case of delicacy of smell so refined as to faint at anything that meets it except the stink of perfumes. If the butter do taste a little of the Swedish turnip, it will do very well where there is plenty of that sweet sauce which early rising and bodily labour are ever sure to bring. The other point, about which I am still more anxious, is the seed. For if the seed be not sound, and especially if it be not true to its kind, all your labour is in vain. It is best, if you can do it, to get your seed from some friend, or some one that you know and can trust. If you save seed, observe all the precautions mentioned in my book on gardening. This very year I have some Swedish turnips, so called, about seven thousand in number, and should, if my seed had been true, have had about twenty tons weight, instead of which I have about three. Indeed, they are not Swedish turnips, but a sort of mixture between that plant and rape. I am sure the seedsman did not wilfully deceive me. He was deceived himself. The truth is that seedsmen are compelled to buy their seeds of this plant. Farmers save it, and they do but too often pay very little attention to the manner of doing it. The best way is to get a dozen of fine turnip plants, perfect in all respects, and plant them in a situation where the smell of the blossoms of nothing of the cabbage or rape or turnip or even charlock kind can reach them. The seed will keep perfectly good for four years. End of number four. Number five of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs one hundred and twenty nine to one hundred and thirty eight. Keeping Cows. Continued. I have now, in the conclusion of this article, to speak of the manner of harvesting and preserving the Swedes, of the place to keep the cow in, of the manure for the land, and of the quantity of labour that the cultivation of the land and the harvesting of the crop will require. Harvesting and preserving the Swedes. When they are ready to take up, the tops must be cut off, if not cut off before, and also the roots. But neither tops nor roots should be cut off very close. You will have room for ten bushels of the bulbs in the house or shed. Put the rest into ten bushel heaps. Make the heap upon the ground in a round form, and let it rise up to a point. Lay over it a little litter, straw, or dead grass, about three inches thick, and then earth upon that, about six inches thick. Then cut a thin round green turf, about eighteen inches over, and put it upon the crown of the heap, to prevent the earth from being washed off. Thus these heaps will remain till wanted for use. When given to the cow, it will be best to wash the swedes, and cut each into two or three pieces with a spade or some other tool. You can take in ten bushels at a time. 
if you find them sprouting in the spring open the remaining heaps and expose them to the sun and wind and cover them again slightly with straw or litter of some sort footnote be sure now before you go any further to go to the end of the book and there read about mangle wurzel be sure to do this and there read also about cobbett's corn be sure to do this before you go any further end of footnote as to the place to keep the cow in much will depend upon situation and circumstances i am always supposing that the cottage is a real cottage and not a house in a town or village street though wherever there is the quarter of an acre of ground the cow may be kept let me however suppose that which will generally happen namely that the cottage stands by the side of a road or lane and amongst fields and woods if not on the side of a common to pretend to tell a country labourer how to build a shed for a cow how to stick it up against the end of his house or to make it an independent erection or to dwell on the materials where poles rods wattles rushes firs heath and cooper chips are all to be gotten by him for nothing or next to nothing would be useless because a man who thus situated can be at any loss for a shed for his cow is not only unfit to keep a cow but unfit to keep a cat the warmer the shed the better it is the floor should slope but not too much there are stones of some sort or other everywhere and about six wheelbarrowfuls will pave the shed a thing to be by no means neglected a broad trough or box fixed up at the head of the cow is the thing to give her food in and she should be fed three times a day at least always at daylight and at sunset it is not absolutely necessary that a cow ever quit her shed except just at calving time or when taken to the bull in the former case the time is nine times out of ten known to within forty-eight hours any enclosed field or place will do for her during a day or two and for such purpose if there be not room at home no man will refuse place for her in a fallow field it will however be good where there is no common to turn her out upon to have her led by a string two or three times a week which may be done by a child only five years old to graze or pick along the sides of roads and lanes where there is a common she will of course be turned out in the daytime except in very wet or severe weather and in a case like this a smaller quantity of ground will suffice for the keeping of her according to the present practice a miserable tallet of bad hay is in such cases the winter provision for the cow it can scarcely be called food and the consequence is the cow is both dry and lousy nearly half the year instead of being dry only about fifteen days before calving and being sleek and lusty at the end of the winter to which a warm lodging greatly contributes for observe if you keep a cow any time between september and june out in a field or yard to endure the chances of the weather she will not though she have food precisely the same in quantity and quality yield above two-thirds as much as if she were lodged in house and in wet weather she will not yield half so much it is not so much the cold as the wet that is injurious to all our stock in england the manure at the beginning this must be provided by collections made on the road by the results of the residence in a cottage let any man clean out every place about his dwelling rake and scrape and sweep all into a heap and he will find that he has a great deal earth of almost any sort that has long lain on the surface and has been trodden on is a species of manure every act that tends to neatness round a dwelling tends to the creating of a mass of manure and i have very seldom seen a cottage with a plat of ground of a quarter of an acre belonging to it round about which i could not have collected a very large heap of manure everything of animal or vegetable substance that comes into a house must go out of it again in one shape or another the very emptying of vessels of various kinds on a heap of common earth makes it a heap of the best of manure thus goes on the work of reproduction and thus is verified the words of the scripture flesh is grass and there is nothing new under the sun thus far as to the outset 
when you have got the cow there is no more care about manure for and especially if you have a pig also you must have enough annually for an acre of ground and let it be observed that after a time it will be unnecessary and would be injurious to manure for every crop for that would produce more stalk and green than substantial part as it is well known that wheat plants standing in ground too full of manure will yield very thick and long straws but grains of little or no substance you ought to depend more on the spade and the hoe than on the dung-heap nevertheless the greatest care should be taken to preserve the manure because you will want straw unless you be by the side of a common which gives you rushes grassy firs or fern and to get straw you must give a part of your dung from the cow-stall and pigsty the best way to preserve manure is to have a pit of sufficient dimensions close behind the cowshed and pigsty for the run from these to go into and from which all runs of rain-water should be kept into this pit would go the emptying of the shed and of the sty and the produce of all sweepings and cleanings round the house and thus a large mass of manure would soon grow together much too large a quantity for a quarter of an acre of ground one good load of wheat or rice straw is all that you would want for the winter and half of one for the summer and you would have more than enough dung to exchange against this straw now as to the quantity of labour that the cultivation of the land will demand in a year we will suppose the whole to have five complete diggings and say nothing about the little matters of sowing and planting and hoeing and harvesting all of which are a mere trifle we are supposing the owner to be an able labouring man and such a man will dig twelve rods of ground in a day here are two hundred rods to be digged and here are little less than seventeen days of work at twelve hours in the day or two hundred hours work to be done in the course of the long days of spring and summer when it is light long before six in the morning and long after six at night what is it then is it not better than time spent in the alehouse or in creeping about after a miserable hare frequently and most frequently there will be a boy if not two big enough to help and i only give this as a hint i saw on the seventh of november last eighteen eighty two a very pretty woman in the village of hannington in wiltshire digging a piece of ground and planting it with early cabbages which she did as handily and as neatly as any gardener that ever i saw the ground was wet and therefore to avoid treading the digged ground in that state she had a line extended and put in the rows as she advanced in her digging standing in the trench while she performed the act of planting which she did with great nimbleness and precision nothing could be more skilfully or beautifully done her clothes were neat clean and tight about her she had turned her handkerchief down from her neck which with the glow that the work had brought into her cheeks formed an object which i do not say would have made me actually stop my chaise had it not been for the occupation in which she was engaged but all taken together the temptation was too strong to be resisted but there is the sunday and i know of no law human or divine that forbids a labouring man to dig or plant his garden on sunday if the good of his family demand it and if he cannot without injury to that family find another time to do it in shepherds carters pig-feeders drovers coachmen cooks footmen printers and numerous others work on the sundays theirs are deemed by the law works of necessity harvesting and haymaking are allowed to be carried on on the sunday in certain cases when they are always carried on by provident farmers and i should be glad to know the case which is more a case of necessity than that now under our view in fact the labouring people do work on the sunday morning in particular all over the country at something or other or they are engaged in pursuits a good deal less religious than that of digging and planting so that as to the two hundred hours they are easily found without the loss of any of the time required for constant daily labour and what a produce is that of a cow i suppose only an average of five quarts of milk a day 
If made into butter, it will be equal every week to two days of the man's wages, besides the value of the skim milk, and this can hardly be of less value than another day's wages. What a thing, then, is this cow if she earn half as much as the man? I am greatly underrating her produce, but I wish to put all the advantages at the lowest. To be sure there is work for the wife or daughter to milk and make butter but the former is done at the two ends of the day, and the latter only about once in the week. And whatever these may subtract from the labours of the field, which all country women ought to be engaged in whenever they conveniently can, whatever the cares created by the cow may subtract from these, is amply compensated for by the education that these cares will give to the children. They will all learn to milk, and the girls to make butter. Footnote to me the following has happened within the last year a young man in the country had agreed to be my servant but it was found that he could not milk and the bargain was set aside about a month afterwards a young man who said he was a farmer's son and who came from herefordshire offered himself to me at kensington can you milk he could not but would learn ay but in the learning he might dry up my cows what a shame to the parents of these young men! Both of them were in want of employment. The latter had come more than a hundred miles in search of work, and here he was left to hunger still and to be exposed to all sorts of ills, because he could not milk. End of footnote. And, which is a thing of the very first importance, they will all learn from their infancy to set a just value upon dumb animals and will grow up in the habit of treating them with gentleness, and feeding them with care. To those who have not been brought up in the midst of rural affairs, it is hardly possible to give an adequate idea of the importance of this part of education. I should be very loath to entrust the care of my horses, cattle, sheep, or pigs to any one whose father never had a cow or pig of his own. It is a general complaint that servants, and especially farm servants, are not so good as they used to be. How should they? They were formerly the sons and daughters of small farmers. They are now the progeny of miserable, propertyless labourers. They have never seen an animal in which they had any interest. They are careless by habit. This monstrous evil has arisen from causes which I have a thousand times described, and which causes must now be speedily removed, or they will produce a dissolution of society, and give us a beginning afresh. The circumstances vary so much that it is impossible to lay down precise rules suited to all cases. The cottage may be on the side of a forest or common, it may be on the side of a lane or of a great road, distant from town or village, it may be on the skirts of one of these latter, and then again the family may be few or great in number, the children small or big, according to all which circumstances the extent and application of the cow food, and also the application of the produce, will naturally be regulated. Under some circumstances half the above crop may be enough, especially where good commons are at hand. Sometimes it may be the best way to sell the calf as soon as calved, at others to fat it, and at others, if you cannot sell it, which sometimes happens, to knock it on the head as soon as calved. For where there is a family of small children, the price of a calf of two months old cannot be equal to the half of the value of the two months' milk. It is pure weakness to call it a pity. It is a much greater pity to see hungry children crying for the milk that a calf is sucking to no useful purpose. And as to the cow and the calf, the one must lose her young, and the other its life, after all, and the respite only makes an addition to the sufferings of both. As to the pretended unwholesomeness of milk in certain cases, as to its not being adapted to some constitutions, I do not believe one word of the matter. When we talk of the fruits, indeed, which were formerly the chief food of a great part of mankind, we should recollect that those fruits grew in countries that had a sun to ripen the fruits, 
and to put nutritious matter into them. But as to milk, England yields to no country upon the face of the earth. Neat cattle will touch nothing that is not wholesome in its nature, nothing that is not wholly innoxious. Out of a pail that has ever had grease in it they will not drink a drop, though they be raging with thirst. Their very breath is fragrance. And how then is it possible that unwholesomeness should distil from the udder of a cow? The milk varies indeed in its quality and taste according to the variations in the nature of the food, but no food will a cow touch that is any way hostile to health. Feed young puppies upon milk from the cow, and they will never die with that ravaging disease called the distemper. In short, to suppose that milk contains anything essentially unwholesome is monstrous. When, indeed, the appetite becomes vitiated, when the organs have been long accustomed to food of a more stimulating nature, when it has been resolved to eat ragouts at dinner, and drink wine, and swallow a devil, and a glass of strong grog at night, then milk for breakfast may be heavy and disgusting, and the feeder may stand in need of tea or laudanum, which differ only as to degrees of strength. But, and I speak from the most ample experience, milk is not heavy, and much less is it unwholesome, when he who uses it rises early, never swallows strong drink, and never stuffs himself with flesh of any kind. Many and many a day I scarcely taste of meat, and then chiefly at breakfast, and that too at an early hour. Milk is the natural food of young people. If it be too rich, skim it again and again till it be not too rich. This is an evil easily cured. If you have now to begin with a family of children, they may not like it at first, but persevere, and the parent who does not do this, having the means in his hands, shamefully neglects his duty. A son who prefers a devil and a glass of grog to a hunch of bread and a bowl of cold milk I regard as a pest, and for this pest the father has to thank himself. Before I dismiss this article, let me offer an observation or two to those persons who live in the vicinity of towns, or in towns, and who, though they have large gardens, have no land to keep a cow, a circumstance which they exceedingly regret. I have, I dare say, witnessed this case at least a thousand times. Now how much garden ground does it require to supply even a large family with garden vegetables? The market gardeners round the metropolis of this wen-headed country, round this wen of all wens, editor's footnote, London, round this prodigious and monstrous collection of human beings, these market gardeners have about three hundred thousand families to supply with vegetables, and these they supply well, too, and with summer fruits into the bargain. Now, if it demanded ten rods to a family, the whole would demand, all but a fraction, nineteen thousand acres of garden ground. We have only to cast our eyes over what there is to know that there is not a fourth of that quantity. A square mile contains, leaving out parts of a hundred, seven hundred acres of land, and nineteen thousand acres occupy more than twenty-two square miles. Are there twenty-two square miles covered with the Wen's market gardens? The very question is absurd. The whole of the market gardens from Brompton to Hammersmith, extending to Battersea Rise on the one side and to the Bayswater Road on the other side, and leaving out roads, lanes, nurseries, pastures, cornfields, and pleasure grounds, do not, in my opinion, cover one square mile. To the north and south of the Wen, there is very little in the way of market garden, and if on both sides of the Thames, to the eastward of the Wen, there be three square miles actually covered with market gardens, that is the full extent. How, then, could the Wen be supplied, if it required ten rods to each family? To be sure, potatoes, carrots, and turnips, and especially the first of these, are brought for the use of the Wen from a great distance in many cases but so they are for the use of the persons I am speaking of, 
for a gentleman thinks no more of raising a large quantity of these things in his garden than he thinks of raising wheat there. How is it, then, that it requires half an acre or eighty rods in a private garden to supply a family, while these market gardeners supply all these families, and so amply too, from ten or more likely five rods of ground to a family? I have shown in the last number that nearly fifteen tons of vegetables can be raised in a year upon forty rods of ground, that is to say ten loads for a wagon and four good horses. And is not a fourth or even an eighth part of this weight sufficient to go down the throats of a family in a year? Nay, allow that only a ton goes to a family in a year. It is more than six pound weight a day. And what sort of a family must that be that really swallows six pounds weight a day? And this a market gardener will raise for them upon less than three rods of ground, for he will raise in the course of the year even more than fifteen tons upon forty rods of ground. What is it then that they do with the eighty rods of ground in a private garden? Why, in the first place they have one crop where they ought to have three. Then they do not half till the ground. Then they grow things that are not wanted, plant cabbages and other things, let them stand till they be good for nothing, and then wheel them to the rubbish-heap, raise as many radishes, lettuces, and as much endive, and as many kidney-beans, as would serve for ten families, and finally throw nine-tenths of them away. I once saw not less than three rods of ground in a garden of this sort, with lettuces all bearing seed seed enough for half a county. They cut a cabbage here and a cabbage there, and so let the whole of the piece of ground remain undug till the last cabbage be cut. But, after all, the produce even in this way is so great that it could never be gotten rid of if the main part were not thrown away. The rubbish-heap always receives four-fifths even of the eatable part of the produce. It is not thus that the market-gardeners proceed. Their rubbish-heap consists of little besides mere cabbage-stumps. No sooner is one crop on the ground than they settle in their minds what is to follow it. They clear as they go in taking off a crop, and as they clear they dig and plant. The ground is never without seed in it or plants on it, and thus in the course of the year they raise a prodigious bulk of vegetables from eighty rods of ground. Such vigilance and industry are not to be expected in a servant for it is foolish to expect that a man will exert himself for another as much as he will for himself. But if I was situated as one of the persons is that I have spoken of in paragraph 137, that is to say, if I had a garden of eighty rods, or even of sixty rods of ground, I would out of that garden draw a sufficiency of vegetables for my family, and would make it yield enough for a cow besides. I should go a short way to work with my gardener, I should put cottage economy into his hands, and tell him that if he could furnish me with vegetables and my cow with food, he was my man, and that if he could not, I must get one that could and would. I am not for making a man toil like a slave, but what would become of the world if a well-fed, healthy man could exhaust himself in tilling and cropping and clearing half an acre of ground? I have known many men dig thirty rods of garden ground in a day, I have, before I was fourteen, digged twenty rods in a day, for more than ten days successively. And I have heard, and believe the fact, of a man at Portsea who digged forty rods in one single day between daylight and dark, so that it is no slavish toil that I am here recommending. Paragraphs 139 to 142 Keeping Pigs Next after the cow comes the pig, and in many cases where a cow cannot be kept, a pig or pigs may be kept. But these are animals not to be ventured on without due consideration as to the means of feeding them, for a starved pig is a great deal worse than none at all. You cannot make bacon as you can milk merely out of the garden. There must be something more. A couple of flitches of bacon are worth fifty thousand Methodist sermons and religious tracts. The sight of them upon the rack tends more to keep a man from poaching and stealing than whole volumes of penal statutes, though assisted by the terrors of the hulks and the gibbet. They are great softeners of the temper and promoters of domestic harmony, 
they are a great blessing but they are not to be had from herbage or roots of any kind and therefore before a pig be attempted the means ought to be considered breeding sows are great favourites with cottagers in general but i have seldom known them to answer their purpose where there is an outlet the sow will indeed keep herself by grazing in summer with a little wash to help her out and when her pigs come they are many in number but they are a heavy expense the sow must live as well as a fatting hog or the pigs will be good for little it is a great mistake too to suppose that the condition of the sow previous to pigging is of no consequence and indeed some suppose that she ought to be rather bare of flesh at the pigging time never was a greater mistake for if she be in this state she presently becomes a mere rack of bones and then do what you will the pigs will be poor things however fat she may be before she farrow the pigs will make her lean in a week all her fat goes away in her milk and unless the pigs have a store to draw upon they pull her down directly and by the time they are three weeks old they are starving for want and then they never come to good now a cottager's sow cannot without great expense be kept in a way to enable her to meet the demands of her farrow she may look pretty well but the flesh she has upon her is not of the same nature as that which the farmyard sow carries about her it is the result of grass and of poor grass too or other weak food and not made partly out of corn and whey and strong wash as in the case of the farmer's sow no food short of that of a fatting hog will enable her to keep her pigs alive and this she must have for ten weeks and that at a great expense then comes the operation upon the principle of parson malthus in order to check population and there is some risk here though not very great but there is the weaning and who that knows anything about the matter will think lightly of the weaning of a farrow of pigs by having nice food given them they seem for a few days not to miss their mother but their appearance soon shows the want of her nothing but the very best food and that given in the most judicious manner will keep them up to anything like good condition and indeed there is nothing short of milk that will effect the thing well how should it be otherwise the very richest cow's milk is poor compared with that of the sow and to be taken from this and put upon food one ingredient of which is water is quite sufficient to reduce the poor little things to bare bones and staring hair a state to which cottagers pigs very soon come in general and at last he frequently drives them to market and sells them for less than the cost of the food which they and the sow have devoured since they were farrowed it was doubtless pigs of this description that were sold the other day at newbury market for fifteen pence apiece and which were i dare say dear even as a gift to get such a pig to begin to grow will require three months and with good feeding too in winter time to be sure it does come to be a hog at last but do what you can it is a dear hog the cottager then can hold no competition with the farmer in the breeding of pigs to do which with advantage there must be milk and milk too that can be advantageously applied to no other use the cottager's pig must be bought ready weaned to his hand and indeed at four months old at which age if he be in good condition he will eat anything that an old hog will eat he will graze eat cabbage leaves and almost the stumps swedish turnip tops or roots and such things with a little wash will keep him along in very good growing order i have now to speak of the time of purchasing the manner of keeping of fatting killing and curing but these i must reserve till my next number end of number five Number six of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs 143 to 156. Keeping Pigs Continued. 
as in the case of cows, so in that of pigs, much must depend upon the situation of the cottage, because all pigs will graze, and therefore on the skirts of forests or commons a couple or three pigs may be kept if the family be considerable, and especially if the cottager brew his own beer which will give him grains to assist the wash. Even in lanes or on the sides of great roads a pig will find a good part of his food from May to November, and if he be yoked the occupiers of the neighbourhood must be churlish and brutish indeed if they give the owner any annoyance. Let me break off here for a moment to point out to my readers the truly excellent conduct of Lord Winchelsea and Lord Stanhope, who, as I read, have taken great pains to make the labourers on their estates comfortable by allotting to each a piece of ground sufficient for the keeping of a cow. I once, when I lived at Botley, proposed to the copyholders and other farmers in my neighbourhood that we should petition the Bishop of Winchester, who was lord of the manors thereabouts, to grant titles to all the numerous persons called trespassers on the wastes, and also to give titles to others of the poor parishioners who were willing to make, on the skirts of the wastes, enclosures not exceeding an acre each. This, I am convinced, would have done a great deal towards relieving the parishes, then greatly burdened by men out of work. This would have been better than digging holes one day to fill them up the next. Not a single man would agree to my proposal. One, a bullfrog farmer, now I hear pretty well sweated down, said it would only make them saucy. And one, a true disciple of Malthus, said that to facilitate their rearing of children was a harm. This man had at the time in his own occupation land that had formerly been six farms, and he had two, ten, or a dozen children. I will not mention names, but this farmer will now perhaps have occasion to call to mind what I told him on that day, when his opposition, and particularly the ground of it, gave me the more pain as he was a very industrious, civil, and honest man. Never was there a greater mistake than to suppose that men are made saucy and idle by just and kind treatment. Slaves are always lazy and saucy, nothing but the lash will extort from them either labour or respectful deportment. I never met with a saucy Yankee, New Englander, in my life. Never servile, always civil. This must necessarily be the character of free men living in a state of competence. They have nobody to envy, nobody to complain of. They are in good humour with mankind. It must, however, be confessed that very little, comparatively speaking, is to be accomplished by the individual efforts even of benevolent men like the two noblemen before mentioned. They have a strife to maintain against the general tendency of the national state of things. It is by general and indirect means, and not by partial and direct and positive regulations, that so great a good as that which they generously aim at can be accomplished. When we are to see such means adopted, God only knows. But if much longer delayed, I am of opinion that they will come too late to prevent something very much resembling a dissolution of society. The cottager's pig should be bought in the spring, or late in winter, and being then four months old he will be a year old before killing time, for it should always be borne in mind that this age is required in order to ensure the greatest quantity of meat from a given quantity of food. If a hog be more than a year old, he is the better for it. The flesh is more solid and more nutritious than that of a young hog, much in the same degree that the mutton of a full-mouthed weather is better than that of a younger weather. The pork or bacon of young hogs, even if fatted on corn, is very apt to boil out, as they call it, that is to say, come out of the pot smaller in bulk than it goes in. When you begin to fat, do it by degrees especially in the case of hogs under a year old. If you feed high all at once, the hog is apt to surfeit, and then a great loss of food takes place. Peas or barley meal is the food, the latter rather the best, and does the work quicker. Make him quite fat by all means. The last bushel, even if he sit as he eat, 
is the most profitable. If he can walk two hundred yards at a time, he is not well fatted. Lean bacon is the most wasteful thing that any family can use. In short, it is uneatable, except by drunkards who want something to stimulate their sickly appetite. The man who cannot live on solid, fat bacon, well-fed and well-cured, wants the sweet sauce of labour, or is fit for the hospital. But then it must be bacon, the effect of barley or peas, not beans, and not of whey, potatoes, or messes of any kind. It is frequently said, and I know that even farmers say it, that bacon made from corn costs more than it is worth. Why do they take care to have it, then? They know better. They know well that it is the very cheapest they can have, and they who look at both ends and both sides of every cost would as soon think of shooting their hogs as of fatting them on messes, that is to say, for their own use, however willing they might now and then be to regale the Londoners with a bit of potato-pork. About Christmas, if the weather be coldish, is a good time to kill. If the weather be very mild, you may wait a little longer, for the hog cannot be too fat. The day before killing he should have no food. To kill a hog nicely is so much of a profession that it is better to pay a shilling for having it done than to stab and hack and tear the carcass about. I shall not speak of pork, for I would by no means recommend it. There are two ways of going to work to make bacon. In the one you take off the hair by scalding. This is the practice in most parts of England and all over America, but the Hampshire way and the best way is to burn the hair off. There is a great deal of difference in the consequences. The first method slackens the skin, opens all the pores of it, makes it loose and flabby by drawing out the roots of the hair. The second tightens the skin in every part, contracts all the sinews and veins in the skin, makes the flitch a solider thing, and the skin a better protection to the meat. The taste of the meat is very different from that of a scalded hog, and to this chiefly it was that Hampshire bacon owed its reputation for excellence. As the hair is to be burnt off it must be dry, and care must be taken that the hog be kept on dry litter of some sort the day previous to killing. When killed he is laid upon a narrow bed of straw, not wider than his carcass, and only two or three inches thick. He is then covered all over thinly with straw, to which, according as the wind may be, the fire is put at one end. As the straw burns, it burns the hair. It requires two or three coverings and burnings, and care is taken that the skin be not in any part burnt or parched. When the hair is all burnt off close, the hog is scraped clean, but never touched with water. The upper side being finished, the hog is turned over, and the other side is treated in like manner. This work should always be done before daylight, for in the daylight you cannot so nicely discover whether the hair be sufficiently burnt off. The light of the fire is weakened by that of the day. Besides, it makes the boys get up very early for once, at any rate, and that is something, for boys always like a bonfire. The innards are next taken out and if the wife be not a slattern, here in the mere offal, in the mere garbage, there is food, and delicate food too, for a large family for a week, and hogs' puddings for the children, and some for neighbours' children who come to play with them. For these things are by no means to be overlooked, seeing that they tend to the keeping alive of that affection in children for their parents, which later in life will be found absolutely necessary to give effect to wholesome precept, especially when opposed to the boisterous passions of youth. The butcher the next day cuts the hog up, and then the house is filled with meat. Souse, griskins, blade-bones, thigh-bones, spare-ribs, chines, belly-pieces, cheeks, all coming into use, one after the other, and the last of the latter not before the end of about four or five weeks. But about this time it is more than possible that the Methodist parson will pay you a visit. 
it is remarked in america that these gentry are attracted by the squeaking of the pigs as the fox is by the cackling of the hen this may be called slander but i will tell you what i did know to happen a good honest careful fellow had a spare rib on which he intended to sup with his family after a long and hard day's work at coppice cutting home he came at dark with his two little boys each with a niche of wood that they had carried four miles cheered with the thought of the repast that awaited them in he went found his wife the methodist parson and a whole troop of the sisterhood engaged in prayer and on the table lay scattered the clean polished bones of the spare rib can any reasonable creature believe that to save the soul god requires us to give up the food necessary to sustain the body did st paul preach this he who while he spread the gospel abroad worked himself in order to have it to give to those who were unable to work upon what then do these modern saints these evangelical gentlemen found their claim to live on the labour of others all the other parts taken away the two sides that remain and that are called flitches are to be cured for bacon they are first rubbed with salt on their insides or flesh sides then placed one on the other the flesh sides uppermost in a salting trough which has a gutter round its edges to drain away the brine for to have sweet and fine bacon the flitches must not lie sopping in brine which gives it that sort of taste which barrel pork and sea jonk have and than which nothing is more villainous every one knows how different is the taste of fresh dry salt from that of salt in a dissolved state the one is savoury the other nauseous therefore change the salt often once in four or five days let it melt and sink in but let it not lie too long change the flitches put that at the bottom which was first put on the top do this a couple of times this mode will cost you a great deal more in salt or rather in taxes than the sopping mode but without it your bacon will not be sweet and fine and will not keep so well as to the time required for making the flitches sufficiently salt it depends on circumstances the thickness of the flitch the state of the weather the place wherein the salting is going on it takes a longer time for a thick than a thin flitch it takes longer in dry than in damp weather it takes longer in a dry than in a damp place but for the flitches of a hog of twelve score in weather not very dry or very damp about six weeks may do and as yours is to be fat which receives little injury from over salting give time enough for you are to have bacon till christmas comes again the place for salting should like a dairy always be cool but always admit of a free circulation of air confined air though cool will taint meat sooner than the midday sun accompanied with a breeze ice will not melt in the hottest sun so soon as in a close and damp cellar put a lump of ice in cold water and one of the same size before a hot fire and the former will dissolve in half the time that the latter will let me take this occasion of observing that an ice-house should never be underground or under the shade of trees that the bed of it ought to be three feet above the level of the ground that this bed ought to consist of something that will admit the drippings to go instantly off and that the house should stand in a place open to the sun and air this is the way they have the ice-houses under the burning sun of virginia and here they keep their fish and meat as fresh and sweet as in winter when at the same time neither will keep for twelve hours though let down to the depth of a hundred feet in a well a virginian with some poles and straw will stick up an ice-house for ten dollars worth a dozen of those ice-houses each of which costs our men of taste as many scores of pounds it is very hard to imagine indeed what any one should want ice for in a country like this except for clodpole boys to slide upon and to drown cockneys in skating time but if people must have ice in summer they may as well go a right way as a wrong way to get it 
However, the patient that I have at this time under my hands wants nothing to cool his blood, but something to warm it, and therefore I will get back to the flitches of bacon, which are now to be smoked, for smoking is a great deal better than merely drying, as is the fashion in the dairy countries in the west of England. When there were plenty of farmhouses, there were plenty of places to smoke bacon in. Since farmers have lived in gentlemen's houses, and the main part of the farmhouses have been knocked down, these places are not so plenty. However, there is scarcely any neighbourhood without a chimney left to hang bacon up in. Two precautions are necessary. First, to hang the flitches when no rain comes down upon them. Second, not to let them be so near the fire as to melt. These precautions taken, the next is that the smoke must proceed from wood, not turf, peat, or coal. Stubble or litter might do, but the trouble would be great. Fur or deal smoke is not fit for the purpose. I take it that the absence of wood as fuel in the dairy counties and in the north has led to the making of pork and dried bacon. As to the time that it requires to smoke a flitch, it must depend a good deal upon whether there be a constant fire beneath, and whether the fire be large or small. A month may do if the fire be pretty constant, and such as a farmhouse fire usually is. But over-smoking, or rather too long hanging in the air, makes the bacon rust. Great attention should therefore be paid to this matter. The flitch ought not to be dried up to the hardness of a board, and yet it ought to be perfectly dry. Before you hang it up, lay it on the floor, scatter the flesh side pretty thickly over with bran, or with some fine sawdust other than that of deal or fur. Rub it on the flesh, or pat it well down upon it. This keeps the smoke from getting into the little openings, and makes a sort of crust to be dried on, and, in short, keeps the flesh cleaner than it would otherwise be. To keep the bacon sweet and good, and free from nasty things that they call hoppers, that is to say a sort of skipping maggots, engendered by a fly which has a great relish for bacon, to provide against this mischief, and also to keep the bacon from becoming rusty, the Americans, whose country is so hot in summer, have two methods. They smoke no part of the hog except the hams or gammons. They cover these with coarse linen cloth, such as the finest hop bags are made of, which they sew neatly on. They then whitewash the cloth all over with lime whitewash, such as we put on walls, their lime being excellent stone lime. They give the ham four or five washings, the one succeeding as the former gets dry, and in the sun all these washings are put on in a few hours. The flies cannot get through this, and thus the meat is preserved from them. The other mode, and that is the mode for you, is to sift fine some clean and dry wood ashes. Put some at the bottom of a box or chest which is long enough to hold a flitch of bacon. Lay in one flitch, then put in more ashes, then the other flitch, and then cover this with six or eight inches of the ashes. This will effectually keep away all the flies, and will keep the bacon as fresh and good as when it came out of the chimney, which it will not be for any great length of time if put out on a rack, or kept hung up in the open air. Dust, or even sand very dry, would perhaps do as well. The object is not only to keep out the flies, but the air. The place where the chest or box is kept ought to be dry, and if the ashes should get damp, as they are apt to do from the salts they contain, they should be put in the fireplace to dry, and then be put back again. Peat ashes or turf ashes might do very well for this purpose. With these precautions the bacon will be as good at the end of the year as on the first day, and it will keep two and even three years perfectly good, for which, however, there can be no necessity. Now then, this hog is altogether a capital thing. The other parts will be meat for about four or five weeks. The lard, nicely put down, will last a long while for all the purposes for which it is wanted. To make it keep well, there should be some salt put into it. 
country children are badly brought up if they do not like sweet lard spread upon bread as we spread butter many a score hunches of this sort have i eaten and i never knew what poverty was i have eaten it for luncheon at the houses of good substantial farmers in france and flanders i am not now frequently so hungry as i ought to be but i should think it no hardship to eat sweet lard instead of butter but nowadays the labourers and especially the female part of them have fallen into the taste of niceness in food and finery in dress a quarter of a bellyful and rags are the consequence the food of their choice is high priced so that for the greater part of their time they are half starved the dress of their choice is showy and flimsy so that to-day they are ladies and to-morrow ragged as sheep with the scab but has not nature made the country girls as pretty as ladies oh yes bless their rosy cheeks and white teeth and a great deal prettier too but are they less pretty when their dress is plain and substantial and when the natural presumption is that they have smocks as well as gowns than they are when drawn off in the frail fabric of sir robert peel where tawdry colours strive with dirty white exciting violent suspicions that all is not as it ought to be nearer the skin and calling up a train of ideas extremely hostile to that sort of feeling which every lass innocently and commendably wishes to awaken in her male beholders are they prettiest when they come through the wet and dirt safe and neat or when their draggled dress is plastered to their backs by a shower of rain however the fault has not been theirs nor that of their parents it is the system of managing all the affairs of the nation this system has made all flashy and false and has put all things out of their place pomposity bombast hyperbole redundancy and obscurity both in speaking and in writing mock delicacy in manners mock liberality mock humanity and mock religion pitt's false money peel's flimsy dresses wilberforce's potato diet castlereagh's and mackintosh's oratory walter scott's poems walter's and stoddart's paragraphs editor's footnote editors of the london times with all the bad taste and baseness and hypocrisy which they spread over this country all have arisen grown branched out bloomed and borne together and we are now beginning to taste of their fruit but as the fat of the adder is as it is said the antidote to its sting so in the son of the great worker of spinning jennies we have thanks to the proctors and doctors of oxford the author of that bill before which this false this flashy this flimsy this rotten system will dissolve as one of his father's pasted calicoes does at the sight of the washing-tub what says the cottager has all this to do with hogs and bacon not directly to do with hogs and bacon indeed but it has a great deal to do my good fellow with your affairs as i shall probably hereafter more fully show though i shall now leave you to the enjoyment of your flitches of bacon which as i before observed will do ten thousand times more than any methodist parson or any other parson except of course those of our church to make you happy not only in this world but in the world to come meat in the house is a great source of harmony a great preventer of the temptation to commit those things which from small beginnings lead finally to the most fatal and atrocious results and i hold that doctrine to be truly damnable which teaches that god has made any selection any condition relative to belief which is to save from punishment those who violate the principles of natural justice some other meat you may have but bacon is the great thing it is always ready as good cold as hot goes to the field or the coppice conveniently in harvest and other busy times demands the pot to be boiled only on a sunday has twice as much strength in it as any other thing of the same weight and in short has in it every quality that tends to make a labourer's family able to work and well off 
one pound of bacon such as that which i have described is in a labourer's family worth four or five of ordinary mutton or beef which are a great part bone and which in short are gone in a moment but always observe it is fat bacon that i am talking about there will in spite of all that can be done be some lean in the gammons though comparatively very little and therefore you ought to begin at that end of the flitches for old lean bacon is not good now as to the cost a pig a spade sow is best bought in march four months old can be had now for fifteen shillings the cost till fatting time is next to nothing to a cottager and then the cost at the present price of corn would for a hog of twelve score not exceed three pounds in the whole four pounds five a pot of poison a week bought at the public house comes to twenty-six shillings of the money and more than three times the remainder is generally flung away upon the miserable tea as i have clearly shown in the first number at paragraph twenty four i have indeed there shown that if the tea were laid aside the labourer might supply his family well with beer all the year round and have a fat hog of even fifteen score for the cost of the tea which does him and can do him no good at all the feet the cheeks and other bone being considered the bacon and the lard taken together would not exceed sixpence a pound irish bacon is cheaper yes lower priced but i will engage that a pound of mine when it comes out of the pot to say nothing of the taste shall weigh as much as a pound and a half of irish or any dairy or slop-fed bacon when that comes out of the pot no no the farmers joke when they say that their bacon costs them more than they could buy bacon for they know well what it is they are doing and besides they always forget or rather remember not to say that the fatting of a large hog yields them three or four load of dung really worth more than ten or fifteen of common yard dung in short without hogs farming could not go on and it never has gone on in any country in the world the hogs are the great stay of the whole concern they are much in small space they make no show as flocks and herds do but without them the cultivation of the land would be a poor a miserably barren concern paragraphs one hundred and fifty seven to one hundred and fifty eight salting mutton and beef very fat mutton may be salted to great advantage and also smoked and may be kept thus a long while not the shoulders and legs but the back of the sheep i have never made any flitch of sheep bacon but i will for there is nothing like having a store of meat in a house the running to the butchers daily is a ridiculous thing the very idea of being fed of a family being fed by daily supplies has something in it perfectly tormenting one half of the time of a mistress of a house the affairs of which are carried on in this way is taken up in talking about what is to be got for dinner and in negotiations with the butcher one single moment spent at table beyond what is absolutely necessary is a moment very shamefully spent but to suffer a system of domestic economy which unnecessarily wastes daily an hour or two of the mistress's time in hunting for the provision for the repast is a shame indeed and when we consider how much time is generally spent in this and in equally absurd ways it is no wonder that we see so little performed by numerous individuals as they do perform during the course of their lives very fat parts of beef may be salted and smoked in a like manner not the lean for that is a great waste and is in short good for nothing poor fellows on board of ships are compelled to eat it but it is a very bad thing end of number six number seven part one of cottage economy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by philippa bees fowls etc etc paragraph one hundred and fifty nine 
I now proceed to treat of objects of less importance than the foregoing, but still such as may be worthy of great attention. If all of them cannot be expected to come within the scope of a labourer's family, some of them must, and others may, and it is always of great consequence that children be brought up to set a just value upon all useful things, and especially upon all living things, to know the utility of them, for without this they never, when grown up, are worthy of being entrusted with the care of them. One of the greatest, and perhaps the very commonest, fault of servants is their inadequate care of animals committed to their charge. It is a well-known saying that the master's eye makes the horse fat, and the remissness to which this alludes is generally owing to the servant not having been brought up to feel an interest in the well-being of animals. Paragraphs 160 to 166. Bees. It is not my intention to enter into a history of this insect about which so much has been written, especially by the French naturalists. It is the useful that I shall treat of, and that is done in not many words. The best hives are those made of clean, unblighted rye straw. Boards are too cold in England. A swarm should always be put into a new hive, and the sticks should be new that are put into the hive for the bees to work on, for if the hive be old it is not so wholesome, and a thousand to one but it contain the embryos of moths and other insects injurious to bees. Over the hive itself there should be a cap of thatch, made also of clean rye straw, and it should not only be new when first put on to the hive, but a new one should be made to supply the place of the former one every three or four months, for when the straw begins to get rotten, as it soon does, insects breed in it, its smell is bad, and its effect on the bees is dangerous. The hive should be placed on a bench, the legs of which mice and rats cannot creep up. Tin round the legs is best, but even this will not keep down ants, which are mortal enemies of bees. To keep these away, if you find them infest the hive, take a green stick, and twist it round in the shape of a ring, to lay on the ground round the leg of the bench, and at a few inches from it, and cover this stick with tar. This will keep away the ants. If the ants come from one home, you may easily trace them to it, and when you have found it, pour boiling water on it in the night, when all the family are at home. This is the only effectual way of destroying ants which are frequently so troublesome. It would be cruel to cause this destruction, if it were not necessary to do it, in order to preserve the honey, and indeed the bees too. Besides the hive and its cap, there should be a sort of shed with top, back, and ends to give additional protection in winter, though in summer hives may be kept too hot, and in that case the bees become sickly, and the produce becomes light. The situation of the hive is to face the south-east, or at any rate to be sheltered from the north and the west, from the north always, and from the west in winter. If it be a very dry season in summer, it contributes greatly to the success of the bees to place clear water near their home, in a thing that they can conveniently drink out of, for if they have to go a great way for drink, they have not much time for work. It is supposed that bees live only a year, at any rate it is best never to keep the same stall or family over two years, except you want to increase your number of hives. The swarm of this summer should always be taken in the autumn of next year. It is whimsical to save the bees when you take the honey. You must feed them, and if saved they will die of old age before the next fall, and though young ones will supply the place of the dead, this is nothing like a good swarm put up during the summer. As to the things that bees make their collections from, we do not perhaps know a thousandth part of them, but of all the blossoms that they seek eagerly, that of the buckwheat stands foremost. Go round a piece of this grain just towards sunset, when the buckwheat is in bloom, and you will see the air filled with bees going home from it in all directions. The buckwheat, too, continues in bloom a long while, for the grain is dead ripe on one part of the plant, while there are fresh blossoms coming out on the other part. A good stall of bees, that is to say the produce of one, is always worth about two bushels of good wheat. The cost is nothing to the labourer. He must be a stupid countryman indeed who cannot make a beehive, 
and a lazy one indeed if he will not if he can in short there is nothing but care demanded and there are very few situations in the country especially in the south of england where a labouring man may not have half a dozen stalls of bees to take every year the main things are to keep away insects mice and birds and especially a little bird called the bee bird and to keep all clean and fresh as to the hives and coverings never put a swarm into an old hive if wasps or hornets annoy you watch them home in the daytime and in the night kill them by fire or by boiling water fowls should not go where bees are for they eat them suppose a man get three stalls of bees in a year six bushels of wheat give him bread for an eighth part of the year scarcely anything is a greater misfortune than shiftlessness it is an evil little short of the loss of eyes or of limbs paragraphs 167 to 168 geese they can be kept to advantage only where there are green commons and there they are easily kept live to a very great age and are amongst the hardiest animals in the world if well kept a goose will lay a hundred eggs in a year the french put their eggs under large hens of common fowls to each of which they give four or five eggs or under turkeys to which they give nine or ten goose eggs if the goose herself sit she must be well and regularly fed at or near to her nest when the young ones are hatched they should be kept in a warm place for about four days and fed on barley meal mixed if possible with milk and then they will begin to graze water for them or for the old ones to swim in is by no means necessary nor perhaps ever even useful or how is it that you see such fine flocks of geese all over long island in america where there is scarcely such a thing as a pond or a run of water geese are raised by grazing but to fat them something more is required corn of some sort or boiled swedish turnips some corn and some raw swedish turnips or carrots or white cabbages or lettuces make the best fatting the modes that are resorted to by the french for fatting geese nailing them down by their webs and other acts of cruelty are i hope such as englishmen will never think of they will get fat enough without the use of any of these unfeeling means being employed he who can deliberately inflict torture upon an animal in order to heighten the pleasure his palate is to receive in eating it is an abuser of the authority which god has given him and is indeed a tyrant in his heart who would think himself safe if at the mercy of such a man since the first edition of this work was published i have had a good deal of experience with regard to geese it is a very great error to suppose that what is called a michaelmas goose is the thing geese are in general eaten at the age when they are called green geese or after they have got their full and entire growth which is not until the latter part of october green geese are tasteless squabs loose flabby things no rich taste in them and in short a very indifferent sort of dish the full-grown goose has solidity in it but it is hard as well as solid and in place of being rich it is strong now there is a middle course to take and if you take this course you produce the finest birds of which we can know anything in england for three years including the present year i have had the finest geese that i ever saw or ever heard of i have bought from twenty to thirty every one of these years I buy them off the common late in June or very early in July. They have cost me from two shillings to three shillings each first purchase. I bring the flock home and put them in a pen about twenty feet square, where I keep them well littered with straw, so as for them not to get filthy. They have one trough in which I give them dry oats, and they have another trough where they have constantly plenty of clean water besides these we give them two or three times a day a parcel of lettuces out of the garden we give them such as are going to seed generally but the better the lettuces are the better the geese if we have no lettuces to spare we give them cabbages either loaved or not loaved though observe the white cabbage as well as the white lettuce that is to say the loaved cabbage and lettuce are a great deal better than those that are not loaved 
This is the food of my geese. They thrive exceedingly upon this food. After we have had the flock about ten days, we begin to kill, and we proceed once or twice a week until about the middle of October, sometimes later. A great number of persons who have eaten of these geese have all declared that they did not imagine that a goose could be brought to be so good a bird. These geese are altogether different from the hard, strong things that come out of the stubble fields, and equally different from the flabby things called a green goose. I should think that the cabbages or lettuces perform half the work of keeping and fatting my geese, and these are things that really cost nothing. I should think that the geese upon an average do not consume more than a shilling's worth of oats each, so that we have these beautiful geese for about four shillings each. No money will buy me such a goose in London, but the thing I can get nearest to it will cost me seven shillings. Every gentleman has a garden. That garden has in the month of July a wagon-load at least of lettuces and cabbages to throw away. Nothing is attended with so little trouble as these geese. There is hardly anybody near London that has not room for the purposes here mentioned. The reader will be apt to exclaim, as my friends very often do, Cobbett's geese are all swans. Well, better that way than not to be pleased with what one has. However, let gentlemen try this method of fatting geese. It saves money, mind, at the same time. Let them try it, and if any one who shall try it shall find the effect not to be that which I say it is, let him reproach me publicly with being a deceiver. The thing is no invention of mine. While I could buy a goose of the common for half a crown, I did not like to give seven shillings for one in London, and yet I wished that geese should not be excluded from my house. Therefore I bought a flock of geese, and brought them home to Kensington. They could not be eaten all at once. It was necessary, therefore, to fix upon a mode of feeding them. The above mode was adopted by my servant, as far as I know, without any knowledge of mine, but the very agreeable result made me look into the matter, and my opinion that the information will be useful to many persons at any rate is sufficient to induce me to communicate it to my readers. Paragraphs 169 to 170. Ducks. No water to swim in is necessary to the old, and it is injurious to the very young. They never should be suffered to swim, if water be near, till more than a month old. The old duck will lay in the year, if well kept, ten dozen of eggs, and that is her best employment, for common hens are the best mothers. It is not good to let young ducks out in the morning to eat slugs and worms, for though they like them, these things kill them if they eat a great quantity. Grass, corn, white cabbages and lettuces, and especially buckwheat, cut when half ripe and flung down in the holm. This makes fine ducks. Ducks will feed on garbage and all sorts of filthy things, but their flesh is strong and bad in proportion. They are in Long Island fatted upon a coarse sort of crab called a horsefoot fish, prodigious quantities of which are cast on the shores. The young ducks grow very fast upon this, and very fat, but woe unto him that has to smell them when they come from the spit, and as for eating them, a man must have a stomach indeed to do that. When young they should be fed upon barley meal or curds and kept in a warm place in the night-time, and not let out early in the morning. They should, if possible, be kept from water to swim in. It always does them harm, and if intended to be sold, to be killed young, they should never go near ponds, ditches, or streams. When you come to fat ducks, you must take care that they get at no filth whatever. They will eat garbage of all sorts, they will suck down the most nauseous particles of all those substances which go for manure. A dead rat, three parts rotten, is a feast to them. For these reasons I should never eat any ducks, unless there were some mode of keeping them from this horrible food. I treat them precisely as I do my geese. I buy a troop when they are young, and put them in a pen, and feed them upon oats, cabbages, lettuces, and water, and have the place kept very clean. My ducks are, in consequence of this, a great deal more fine and delicate than any others that I know anything of. Paragraphs 171 to 175. 
turkeys. These are flying things, and so are common fowls, but it may happen that a few hints respecting them may be of use. To raise turkeys in this chilly climate is a matter of much greater difficulty than in the climates that give great warmth. But the great enemy to young turkeys, for old ones are hardy enough, is the wet. This they will endure in no climate, and so true is this that in America, where there is always a wet spell in April, the farmers' wives take care never to have a brood come out until that spell is past. In England, where the wet spells come at haphazard, the first thing is to take care that young turkeys never go out on any account except in dry weather till the dew be quite off the ground, and this should be adhered to till they get to the size of an old partridge and have their backs well covered with feathers. And in wet weather they should be kept under cover all day long. As to the feeding of them, when young various nice things are recommended, hard eggs chopped fine with crumbs of bread, and a great many other things. But that which I have seen used, and always with success, and for all sorts of young poultry, is milk turned into curds. This is the food for young poultry of all sorts. Some should be made fresh every day, and if this be done, and the young turkeys kept warm, and especially from wet, not one out of a score will die. When they get to be strong they may have meal and grain, but still they always love the curds. When they get their head feathers they are hardy enough, and what they then want is room to prowl about. It is best to breed them under a common hen, because she does not ramble like a hen turkey, and it is a very curious thing that the turkeys bred up by a hen of the common fowl do not themselves ramble much when they get old, and for this reason when they buy turkeys for stock in America, where there are such large woods, and where the distant rambling of turkeys is inconvenient, they always buy such as have been bred under the hens of the common fowl, than which a more complete proof of the great powers of habit is perhaps not to be found. And ought not this to be a lesson to fathers and mothers of families? Ought not they to consider that the habits which they give their children are to stick by those children during their whole lives? The hen should be fed exceedingly well, too, while she is sitting and after she is hatched, for though she does not give milk, she gives heat. And let it be observed that as no man ever yet saw healthy pigs with a poor sow, so no man ever saw healthy chickens with a poor hen. This is a matter much too little thought of in the rearing of poultry, but it is a matter of the greatest consequence. Never let a poor hen sit feed the hen well while she is sitting, and feed her most abundantly when she has young ones, for then her labour is very great. She is making exertions of some sort or other during the whole twenty-four hours. She has no rest, is constantly doing something or other to provide food or safety for her young ones. As to fatting turkeys, the best way is never to let them be poor. Cramming is a nasty thing and quite unnecessary, Barley meal mixed with skim milk given to them fresh and fresh will make them fat in a short time, either in a coop, in a house, or running about. Boiled carrots and Swedish turnips will help, and it is a change of sweet food. In France they sometimes pick turkeys alive to make them tender, of which I shall only say that the man that can do this, or order it to be done, ought to be skinned alive himself. Paragraphs 176 to 180. Fowls. These are kept for two objects, their flesh and their eggs. As to rearing them, everything said about rearing turkeys is applicable here. They are best fatted, too, in the same manner. But as to laying hens, there are some means to be used to secure the use of them in winter. They ought not to be old hens. Pullets, that is, birds hatched in the foregoing spring, are perhaps the best. At any rate, let them not be more than two years old. They should be kept in a warm place, and not let out even in the daytime in wet weather, for one good sound wetting will keep them back for a fortnight. 
the dry cold even in the severest cold if dry is less injurious than even a little wet in winter time if the feathers get wet in our climate in winter or in short days they do not get dry for a long time and it is this that spoils and kills many of our fowls the french who are great egg-eaters take singular pains as to the food of laying hens in winter they let them out very little even in their fine climate and give them very stimulating food barley boiled and given them warm curds buckwheat which i believe is the best thing of all except curds parsley and other herbs chopped fine leeks chopped in the same way also apples and pears chopped very fine oats and wheat cribbled and sometimes they give them hemp seed and the seed of nettles or dried nettles harvested in summer and boiled in the winter some give them ordinary food and once a day toasted bread sopped in wine white cabbages chopped up are very good in winter for all sorts of poultry this is taking a great deal of pains but the produce is also great and very valuable in winter for as to preserved eggs they are things to run from and not after all this supposes however a proper hen-house about which we in england take very little pains the vermin that is to say the lice that poultry breed are the greatest annoyance and as our wet climate furnishes them for a great part of the year with no dust by which to get rid of these vermin we should be very careful about cleanliness in the hen-houses many a hen when sitting is compelled to quit her nest to get rid of the lice they torment the young chickens and in short are a great injury the fowl-house should therefore be very often cleaned out and sand or fresh earth should be thrown on the floor the nest should not be on shelves or on anything fixed but little flat baskets something like those that the gardeners have in the markets in london and which they call sieves should be placed against the sides of the house upon pieces of wood nailed up for the purpose by this means the nests are kept perfectly clean because the baskets are when necessary taken down the hay thrown out and the baskets washed which cannot be done if the nest be made in anything forming a part of the building besides this the roosts ought to be cleaned every week and the hay changed in the nests of laying hens it is good to fumigate the house frequently by burning dry herbs juniper wood cedar wood or with brimstone for nothing stands so much in need of cleanliness as a fowl house in order to have fine fowls and plenty of eggs the ailments of fowls are numerous but they would seldom be seen if the proper care were taken it is useless to talk of remedies in a case where you have complete power to prevent the evil if well fed and kept perfectly clean fowls will seldom be sick and as to old age they never ought to be kept more than a couple or three years for they get to be good for little as layers and no teeth can face them as food it is perhaps seldom that fowls can be kept conveniently about a cottage but when they can three four or half a dozen hens to lay in winter when the wife is at home the greater part of the time are worth attention they would require but little room might be bought in november and sold in april and six of them with proper care might be made to clear every week the price of a gallon of flour if the labour were great i should not think of it but it is none and i am for neglecting nothing in the way of pains in order to ensure a hot dinner every day in winter when the man comes home from work as to the fatting of fowls information can be of no use to those who live in a cottage all their lives but it may be of some use to those who are born in cottages and go to have the care of poultry at richer persons houses fowls should be put to fat about a fortnight before they are wanted to be killed the best food is barley meal wetted with milk but not wetted too much they should have clear water to drink and it should be frequently changed crammed fowls are very nasty things but barn-door fowls, as they are called, are sometimes a great deal more nasty. Barn-door would indeed do exceedingly well, but it unfortunately happens that the stable is generally pretty near to the barn. 
and now let any gentleman who talks about sweet barn-door fowls have one caught in the yard where the stable is also let him have it brought in killed and the craw taken out and cut open then let him take a ball of horse dung from the stable door and let his nose tell him how very small is the difference between the smell of the horse dung and the smell of the craw of his fowl in short roast the fowl and then pull aside the skin at the neck put your nose to the place and you will almost think that you are at the stable door hence the necessity of taking them away from the barn door a fortnight at least before they are killed we know very well that ducks that have been fed upon fish either wild ducks or tame ducks will scent a whole room and drive out of it all those who have not pretty good constitutions it must be so solomon says that all flesh is as grass and those who know anything about beef know the difference between the effect of the grass in herefordshire and lincolnshire and the effect of turnips and oil cake in america they always take the fowls from the farmyard and shut them up a fortnight or three weeks before they be killed one thing however about fowls ought always to be borne in mind they are never good for anything when they have attained their full growth unless they be capons or poulards if the poulets be old enough to have little eggs in them they are not worth one farthing and as to the cocks of the same age they are fit for nothing but to make soup for soldiers on their march and they ought to be taken for that purpose paragraphs one hundred and eighty one to one hundred and eighty three pigeons a few of these may be kept about any cottage for they are kept even in towns by labourers and artisans they cause but little trouble they take care of their own young ones and they do not scratch or do any other mischief in gardens they want feeding with tares peas or small beans and buckwheat is very good for them to begin keeping them they must not have flown at large before you get them you must keep them for two or three days shut into the place which is to be their home and then they may be let out and will never leave you as long as they can get proper food and are undisturbed by vermin or unannoyed exceedingly by lice the common dove-house pigeons are the best to keep they breed oftenest and feed their young ones best they begin to breed at about nine months old and if well kept they will give you eight or nine pair in the year any little place a shelf in the cowshed a board or two under the eaves of the house or in short any place under cover even on the ground floor they will sit and hatch and breed up their young ones in it is not supposed that there could be much profit attached to them but they are of this use they are very pretty creatures very interesting in their manners and they are an object to delight children and to give them the early habit of fondness for animals and of setting a value on them which as i have often had to observe before is a very great thing a considerable part of all the property of a nation consists of animals of course a proportionate part of the cares and labours of a people appertain to the breeding and bringing to perfection those animals and if you consult your experience you will find that a labourer is generally speaking of value in proportion as he is worthy of being entrusted with the care of animals the most careless fellow cannot hurt a hedge or ditch but to trust him with the team or the flock is another matter and mind for the man to be trustworthy in this respect the boy must have been in the habit of being kind and considerate towards animals and nothing is so likely to give him that excellent habit as his seeing from his very birth animals taken great care of and treated with great kindness by his parents and now and then having a little thing to call his own end of number 7 part 1《Number Seven, Part Two of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs one hundred and eighty four to one hundred and eighty eight. Rabbits. In this case, too, the chief use, perhaps, is to give children those habits of which I have just been speaking. Nevertheless, rabbits are really profitable. Three does and a buck will give you a rabbit to eat for every three days in the year which is a much larger quantity of food than any man will get by spending half his time in the pursuit of wild animals to say nothing of the toil the tearing of clothes and the danger of pursuing the latter 
everybody knows how to knock up a rabbit hutch. The does should not be allowed to have more than seven litters in a year. Six young ones to a doe is all that ought to be kept, and then they will be fine. Abundant food is the main thing, and what is there that a rabbit will not eat? I know of nothing green that they will not eat, and if hard pushed they will eat bark and even wood. The best thing to feed the young ones on when taken from the mother is the carrot, wild or garden, parsnips, Swedish turnips, roots of dandelion, for too much green or watery stuff is not good for weaning rabbits. They should remain as long as possible with the mother. They should have oats once a day, and after a time they may eat anything with safety. But if you give them too much green at first when they are weaned, they rot as sheep do. A variety of food is a great thing, and surely the fields and gardens and hedges furnish this variety. All sorts of grasses, strawberry leaves, ivy, dandelions, the hogweed or wild parsnip in root, stem and leaves. I have fed working horses six or eight in number upon this plant for weeks together. It is a tall, bold plant that grows in prodigious quantities in the hedges and coppices in some parts of England. It is the perennial parsnip. It has flower and seed precisely like those of the parsnip, and hogs, cows and horses are equally fond of it. Many a half-starved pig have I seen within a few yards of cartloads of this pig-meat. This arises from want of the early habit of attention to such matters. I, who used to get hogweed for pigs and for rabbits when a little chap, have never forgotten that the wild parsnip is good food for pigs and rabbits. When the doe has young ones, feed her most abundantly with all sorts of greens and herbage, and with carrots and the other things mentioned before, besides giving her a few oats once a day. That is the way to have fine, healthy young ones, which, if they come from the mother in good case, will very seldom die. But do not think that because she is a small animal, a little feeding is sufficient. Rabbits eat a great deal more than cows or sheep in proportion to their bulk. Of all animals, rabbits are those that boys are most fond of. They are extremely pretty, nimble in their movements, engaging in their attitudes, and always completely under immediate control. The produce has not long to be waited for. In short, they keep an interest constantly alive in a little chap's mind, and they really cost nothing, for as to the oats, where is the boy that cannot in harvest time pick up enough along the lanes to serve his rabbits for a year? The care is all and the habit of taking care of things is of itself a most valuable possession. To those gentlemen who keep rabbits for the use of their family, and a very useful and convenient article they are, I would observe that when they find their rabbits die, they may depend on it that ninety-nine times out of the hundred starvation is the malady, and particularly short feeding of the doe while and before she has young ones, that is to say short feeding of her at all times, for if she be poor, the young ones will be good for nothing. She will live being poor, but she will not, and cannot, breed up fine young ones. Paragraphs 189 to 192. Goats and ewes. In some places where a cow cannot be kept, a goat may. A correspondent points out to me that a dorset ewe or two might be kept on a common near a cottage to give milk, and certainly this might be done very well, but I should prefer a goat, which is hardier and much more domestic. When I was in the army in New Brunswick, where, be it observed, the snow lies on the ground seven months in the year, there were many goats that belonged to the regiment, and that went about with it on shipboard and everywhere else. Some of them had gone through nearly the whole of the American war, we never fed them. In summer they picked about wherever they could find grass, and in winter they lived on cabbage leaves, turnip peelings, potato peelings, and other things flung out of the soldiers' rooms and huts. One of these goats belonged to me, and on average throughout the year she gave me more than three half-pints of milk a day. I used to have the kid killed when a few days old, and for some time the goat would give nearly or quite two quarts of milk a day. She was seldom dry more than three weeks in the year. There is one great inconvenience belonging to goats, 
that is they bark all young trees that they come near so that if they get into a garden they destroy everything but there are seldom trees on commons except such as are too large to be injured by goats and i can see no reason against keeping a goat where a cow cannot be kept nothing is so hardy nothing is so little nice as to its food goats will pick peelings out of the kennel and eat them they will eat mouldy bread or biscuit fusty hay and almost rotten straw furze bushes heath thistles and indeed what will they not eat when they will make a hearty meal on paper brown or white printed on or not printed on and give milk all the while they will lie in any dog hole they do very well clogged or stumped out and then they are very healthy things into the bargain however closely they may be confined when sea voyages are so stormy as to kill geese ducks fowls and almost pigs the goats are well and lively and when a dog of no kind can keep the deck for a minute a goat will skip about upon it as bold as brass goats do not ramble from home they come in regularly in the evening and if called they come like dogs now though ewes when taken great care of will be very gentle and though their milk may be rather more delicate than that of the goat the ewes must be fed with nice and clean food and they will not do much in the milk giving way upon a common and as to feeding them provision must be made pretty nearly as for a cow they will not endure confinement like goats and they are subject to numerous ailments that goats know nothing of then the ewes are done by the time they are about six years old for then they lose their teeth whereas a goat will continue to breed and to give milk in abundance for a great many years the sheep is frightened at everything and especially at the least sound of a dog a goat on the contrary will face a dog and if he be not a big and courageous one beat him off i have often wondered how it happened that none of our labourers kept goats and i really should be glad to see the thing tried they are pretty creatures domestic as a dog will stand and watch as a dog does for a crumb of bread as you are eating give you no trouble in the milking and i cannot help being of opinion that it might be of great use to introduce them amongst our labourers paragraphs one hundred ninety three to one hundred ninety seven candles and rushes we are not permitted to make candles ourselves and if we were they ought seldom to be used in a labourer's family i was bred and brought up mostly by rushlight and i do not find that i see less clearly than other people candles certainly were not much used in english labourers dwellings in the days when they had meat dinners and sunday coats potatoes and taxed candles seem to have grown into fashion together and perhaps for this reason that when the pot ceased to afford grease for the rushes the potato gorger was compelled to go to the chandler's shop for light to swallow the potatoes by else he might have devoured peeling and all my grandmother who lived to be pretty nearly ninety never i believe burnt a candle in her house in her life i know that i never saw one there and she in a great measure brought me up she used to get the meadow rushes such as they tie the hop shoots to the poles with she cut them when they had attained their full substance but were still green the rush at this age consists of a body of pith with a green skin on it you cut off both ends of the rush and leave the prime part which on an average may be about a foot and a half long then you take off all the green skin except for about a fifth part of the way round the pith thus it is but a piece of pith all but a little strip of skin in one part all the way up which observe is necessary to hold the pith together all the way along the rushes being thus prepared the grease is melted and put in a melted state into something that is as long as the rushes are the rushes are put into the grease soaked in it sufficiently then taken out and laid in a bit of bark taken from a young tree so as not to be too large this bark is fixed up against the wall by a couple of straps put round it, and there it hangs for the purpose of holding the rushes. The rushes are carried about in the hand, but to sit by, to work by, or to go to bed by, they are fixed in stands made for the purpose, 
some of which are high to stand on the ground, and some low to stand on a table. These stands have an iron port, something like a pair of pliers to hold the rush in, and the rush is shifted forward from time to time as it burns down to the thing that holds it. Now these rushes give a better light than a common small dip candle, and they cost next to nothing, though the labourer may with them have as much light as he pleases, and though without them he must sit the far greater part of the winter evenings in the dark, even if he spend fifteen shillings a year in candles. You may do any sort of work by this light, and if reading be your taste, you may read the foul libels, the lies and abuse which are circulated gratis about me by the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, as well by rush light as you can by the light of taxed candles, and at any rate you would have one evil less, for to be deceived and to pay a tax for the deception are a little too much for even modern loyalty openly to demand. Paragraph 198. Mustard. Why buy this when you can grow it in your garden? The stuff you buy is half drugs and is injurious to health. A yard square of ground sown with common mustard, the crop of which you would grind for use in a little mustard mill, as you wanted it, would save you some money, and probably save your life. Your mustard would look brown instead of yellow, but the former colour is as good as the latter, and as to the taste, the real mustard has certainly a much better than that of the drugs and flour which go under the name of mustard. Let any one try it, and I am sure he will never use the drugs again. The drugs, if you take them freely, leave a burning at the pit of your stomach, which the real mustard does not. Paragraphs 199 to 201. Dress, Household Goods, and Fuel. In paragraph 152 I said, I think, enough to caution you, the English labourer, against the taste now too prevalent for fine and flimsy dress. It was for hundreds of years amongst the characteristics of the English people that their taste was in all matters for things solid, sound and good, for the useful and decent, the cleanly in dress, and not for the showy. Let us hope that this may be the taste again and let us, my friends, fear no troubles, no perils, that may be necessary to produce a return of that taste, accompanied with full bellies and warm backs to the labouring classes. In household goods, the warm, the strong, the durable ought always to be kept in view. Oak tables, bedsteads and stools, chairs of oak or of yew-tree, and never a bit of miserable deal board. Things of this sort ought to last several lifetimes. A labourer ought to inherit from his great-grandfather something besides his toil. As to bedding and other things of that sort, all ought to be good in their nature, of a durable quality and plain in their colour and form. The plates, dishes, mugs, and things of that kind should be of pewter, or even of wood. Anything is better than crockery-ware. Bottles to carry a field should be of wood. Formerly nobody but the gypsies and mumpers that went a hop-picking in the season carried glass or earthen bottles. As to glass of any sort, I do not know what business it has in any man's house unless he be rich enough to live on his means. It pays a tax, in many cases, to the amount of two-thirds of its cost. In short, when a house is once furnished with sufficient goods, there ought to be no renewal of hardly any part of them wanted for half an age except in case of destruction by fire. Good management in this way leaves the man's wages to provide an abundance of good food and good raiment. And these are the things that make happy families. These are the things that make a good, kind, sincere and brave people, not little pamphlets about loyalty and content. A good man will be contented fast enough if he be fed and clad sufficiently. But if a man be not well fed and clad, he is a base wretch to be contented. Fuel should be, if possible, provided in summer, or at least some of it. Turf and peat must be got in summer, and some wood may. In the woodland countries the next winter ought to be thought of in June, 
when people hardly know what to do with the fuel wood, and something should, if possible, be saved in the bark harvest to get a part of the fuel for the next winter. Fire is a capital article. To have no fire, or a bad fire, to sit by, is a most dismal thing. In such a state, man and wife must be something out of the common way to be in good humour with each other, to say nothing of colds and other ailments which are the natural consequence of such misery. If we suppose the great Creator to condescend to survey his works in detail, what object can be so pleasing to him as that of the labourer, after his return from the toils of a cold winter day, sitting with his wife and children round a cheerful fire, while the wind whistles in the chimney and the rain pelts the roof? But of all God's creation, what is so miserable to behold or to think of, as a wretched, half-starved family, creeping to their nest of flocks or straw, there to lie shivering, till sent forth by the fear of absolutely expiring from want. Paragraph 202. Hops. I treated of them before, but before I conclude this little work it is necessary to speak of them again. I made a mistake as to the tax on the hops. The positive tax is twopence a pound, and I, in former editions, stated it at fourpence. However, in all such cases there falls upon the consumer the expenses attending the paying of the tax, that is to say, the cost of interest of capital in the grower who pays the tax, and who must pay for it whether his hops be cheap or dear. Then the trouble it gives him, and the rules he is compelled to obey in the drying and bagging, and which calls him great expense. So that the tax on hops of our own English growth may now be reckoned to cost the consumer about threepence farthing a pound. Paragraphs 203 to 206. Yeast. Yeast is a great thing in domestic management. I have once before published a receipt for making yeast cakes. I will do it again here. In Long Island they make yeast cakes. A parcel of these cakes is made once a year. That is often enough. And when you bake, you take one of these cakes, or more according to the bulk of the batch, and with them raise your bread. The very best bread I ever ate in my life was lightened with these cakes. The materials for a good batch of cakes are as follows. Three ounces of good fresh hops, three and a half pounds of rye flour, seven pounds of Indian cornmeal, and one gallon of water. Rub the hops so as to separate them. Put them into the water which is to be boiling at the time. Let them boil half an hour. Then strain the liquor through a fine sieve into an earthen vessel. While the liquor is hot, put in the rye flour, stirring the liquor well and quickly as the rye flour goes into it. The day after, when it is working, put in the Indian meal, stirring it well as it goes in. Before the Indian meal be all in, the mess will be very stiff, and it will in fact be dough, very much of the consistence of the dough that bread is made of. Take this dough, knead it well as you would for pie crust. Roll it out with a rolling pin, as you roll out pie crust, to the thickness of about a third of an inch. When you have it, or a part of it at a time, rolled out, cut it up into cakes with a tumbler glass turned upside down, or with something else that will answer the same purpose. Take a clean board, a tin may be better, and put the cakes to dry in the sun. Turn them every day, let them receive no wet and they will become as hard as ship biscuit. Put them into a bag or box, and keep them in a place perfectly free from damp. When you bake, take two cakes of the thickness above mentioned and about three inches in diameter, put them into hot water overnight, having cracked them first. Let the vessel containing them stand near the fireplace all night. They will dissolve by the morning, and then you use them in setting your sponge, as it is called, precisely as you would use the yeast of beer. There are two things which may be considered by the reader as obstacles. First, where are we to get the Indian meal? Indian meal is used merely because it is of a less adhesive nature than that of wheat. White pea meal, or even barley meal, would do just as well. But second, to dry the cakes, 
to make them, and quickly too, mind, as hard as ship biscuit, which is much harder than the timber of Scotch firs or Canada firs, and to do this in the sun, for it must not be fire, where are we in this climate to get the sun? In 1816 we could not, for that year melons rotted in the glazed frames and never ripened. But in every nine summers out of ten we have in June, in July, or in August a fortnight of hot sun, and that is enough. Nature has not given us a peach climate, but we get peaches. The cakes, when put in the sun, may have a glass sash or a handlight put over them. This would make their birth hotter than that of the hottest open-air situation in America. In short, to a farmer's wife, or any good housewife, all the little difficulties in the attainment of such an object would appear as nothing. The will only is required, and if there be not that, it is useless to think of the attempt. Paragraph 207. Sowing Swedish Turnip Seed It is necessary to be a little more full than I have been before as to the manner of sowing this seed, and I shall make my directions such as to be applied on a small or a large scale. Those that want to transplant on a large scale will, of course, as to the other parts of the business, refer to my larger work. It is to get plants for transplanting that I mean to sow the Swedish turnip seed. The time for sowing must depend a little upon the nature of the situation and soil. In the north of England, perhaps, early in April may be the best, but in any of these southern counties, any time after the middle of April and before the 10th of May is quite early enough. The ground which is to receive the seed should be made very fine, and manured with wood ashes or with good compost, well mixed with the earth. Dung is not so good, for it breeds the fly more, or at least I think so. The seed should be sown in drills an inch deep, made as pointed out under the head of sowing in my book on gardening. When deposited in the drills evenly but not thickly, the ground should be raked across the drills so as to fill them up, and then the whole of the ground should be trodden hard with shoes not nailed and not very thick in the sole. The ground should be laid out in four feet beds, for the reasons mentioned in The Gardener. When the seeds come up, thin the plants to two inches apart as soon as you think them clear from the fly, for if left thicker they injure each other even in this infant state. Hoe frequently between the rows, even before thinning the plants, and when they are thinned, hoe well and frequently between them, for this has a tendency to make them strong, and the hoeing before thinning helps to keep off the fly. A rod of ground, the rows being eight inches apart and plants two inches apart in the row, will contain about 2,200 plants. An acre, in rows four feet apart and the plants a foot apart in the row, will take about 10,460 plants, so that to transplant an acre you must sow about five rods of ground. The plants should be kept very clean, and by the last week in June or first in July you put them out. I have put them out in England at all times between the 7th of June and the middle of August. The first is certainly earlier than I like, and the very finest I ever grew in England, and the finest I ever saw for a large piece, were transplanted on the 14th of July. But one year with another, the last week in June is the best time. For size of plants, manner of transplanting, intercultivation, preparing the land and the rest, see Years' Residence in America. End of number seven. Number eight, part one of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs two hundred and eight to two hundred and thirty four on the converting of English grass and grain plants cut green into straw for the purpose of making plat for hats and bonnets. Kensington, May the thirtieth, eighteen twenty three. The foregoing numbers have treated chiefly of the management of the affairs of a labourer's family, and more particularly of the mode of disposing of the money earned by the labour of the family. The present number will point out what I hope may become an advantageous kind of labour. 
all along I have proceeded upon the supposition that the wife and children of the labourer be as constantly as possible employed in work of some sort or other. The cutting, the bleaching, the sorting and the plaiting of straw seem to be of all employments the best suited to the wives and children of country labourers, and the discovery which I have made as to the means of obtaining the necessary materials will enable them to enter at once upon that employment. Before I proceed to give my directions relative to the performance of this sort of labour, I shall give a sort of history of the discovery to which I have just alluded. The practice of making hats, bonnets, and other things of straw is perhaps of very ancient date, but not to waste time in fruitless inquiries, it is very well known that for many years past straw coverings for the head have been greatly in use in England, in America, and indeed in almost all the countries that we know much of. In this country the manufacture was, only a few years ago, very flourishing, but it has now greatly declined, and has left in poverty and misery those whom it once well fed and clothed. The cause of this change has been the importation of the straw hats and bonnets from Italy, greatly superior in durability and beauty to those made in England. The plat made in England was made of the straw of ripened grain. It was in general split, but the main circumstance was that it was made of the straw of ripened grain, while the Italian plat was made of the straw of grain or grass cut green. Now, the straw of ripened grain or grass is brittle, or rather rotten. It dies while standing, and in point of toughness the difference between it and straw from plants cut green is much about the same as the difference between a stick that has died on the tree and one that has been cut from the tree. But besides the difference in point of toughness, strength and durability, there was the difference in beauty. The colour of the Italian plat was better, the plat was brighter, and the Italian straws being small whole straws instead of small straws made by the splitting of large ones, there was a roundness in them that gave light and shade to the plat, which could not be given by our flat bits of straw. It seems odd that nobody should have set to work to find out how the Italians came by this fine straw. The importation of these Italian articles was chiefly from the port of Leghorn, and therefore the bonnets imported were called Leghorn bonnets. The straw manufacturers in this country seem to have made no effort to resist this invasion from Leghorn, and, which is very curious, the Leghorn straw has now began to be imported and to be plaited in this country, so that we had hands to plait as well as the Italians. All that we wanted was the same kind of straw that the Italians had, and it is truly wonderful that these importations from Leghorn should have gone on increasing year after year, and our domestic manufacture dwindling away at a like pace, without there having been any inquiry relative to the way in which the Italians got their straw. Strange that we should have imported even straw from Italy, without inquiring whether similar straw could not be got in England. There really seems to have been an opinion that England could no more produce this straw than it could produce the sugar-cane. Things were in this state when, in 1821, a Miss Woodhouse, a farmer's daughter in Connecticut, sent a straw bonnet of her own making to the Society of Arts in London. This bonnet, superior in fineness and beauty to anything of the kind that had come from Leghorn, the maker stated to consist of a sort of grass of which she sent, along with the bonnet, some of the seeds. The question was, then, would these precious seeds grow and produce plants in perfection in England? A large quantity of the seed had not been sent, and it was therefore, by a member of the society, thought desirable to get, with as little delay as possible, a considerable quantity of the seed. It was at this stage of the affair that my attention was called to it, the member just alluded to applied to me to get the seed from America. I was of opinion that there could be no sort of grass in Connecticut that would not and that did not grow and flourish in England. My son James, who was then at New York, had instructions from me in June 1821 to go to Miss Woodhouse and to send me home an account of the matter. In September the same year I heard from him, who sent me an account of the cutting and bleaching, and also a specimen of the plat and grass of Connecticut. Miss Woodhouse had told the Society of Arts that the grass used was the Poa Pratensis. 
this is the smooth-stalked meadow-grass so that it was quite useless to send for seed it was clear that we had grass enough in england if we could but make it into straw as handsome as that of italy upon my publishing an account of what had taken place with regard to the american bonnet an importer of italian straw applied to me to know whether i would undertake to import american straw he was in the habit of importing italian straw and of having it platted in this country but having seen the bonnet of miss woodhouse he was anxious to get the american straw this gentleman showed me some italian straw which he had imported and as the seed heads were not on he could not see what plant it was the gentleman who showed the straw to me told me and doubtless he believed that the plant was one that would not grow in england i however who looked at the straw with the eyes of a farmer perceived that it consisted of dry oat wheat and rye plants and of bennet and other common grass plants this quite settled the point of growth in england it was now certain that we had the plants in abundance and the only question that remained to be determined was had we sun to give to those plants the beautiful colour which the american and italian straw had if that colour were to be obtained by art or by any chemical applications we could obtain it as easily as the americans or the italians but if it were the gift of the sun solely here might be a difficulty impossible for us to overcome my experiments have proved that the fear of such difficulty was wholly groundless it was late in september eighteen twenty one that i obtained this knowledge as to the kind of plants that produced the foreign straw i could at that time of the year do nothing in the way of removing my doubts as to the powers of our sun in the bleaching of grass but i resolved to do this when the proper season for bleaching should return accordingly when the next month of june came i went into the country for the purpose i made my experiments and in short i proved to demonstration that we had not only the plants but the sun also necessary for the making of straw yielding in no respect to that of america or of italy i think that upon the whole we have greatly the advantage of those countries for grass is more abundant in this country than in any other it flourishes here more than in any other country it is here in a greater variety of all sorts and for fineness in point of size there is no part of the world which can equal what might be obtained from some of our downs merely by keeping the land ungrazed till the month of july when i had obtained the straw i got some of it made into plat one piece of this plat was equal in point of colour and superior in point of fineness even to the plat of the bonnet of miss woodhouse it seemed therefore now to be necessary to do nothing more than to make all this well known to the country as the society of arts had interested itself in the matter and as i heard that through its laudable zeal several sowings of the foreign grass seed had been made in england i communicated an account of my experiments to that society the first communication was made by me on the nineteenth of february last when i sent to the society specimens of my straw and also of the plat some time after this i attended a committee of the society on the subject and gave them a verbal account of the way in which i had gone to work the committee had before this given some of my straw to certain manufacturers of plat in order to see what it would produce these manufacturers with the exception of one brought such specimens of plat as to induce at first sight any one to believe that it was nonsense to think of bringing the thing to any degree of perfection but was it possible to believe this was it possible to believe that it could answer to import straw from italy to pay a twenty per cent duty on that straw and to have it platted here and that it would not answer to turn into plat straw of just the same sort grown in england it was impossible to believe this but possible enough to believe that persons now making profit by italian straw or plat or bonnets would rather that english straw should not come to shut out the italian and to put an end to the leghorn trade in order to show the character of the reports of those manufacturers i sent some parcels of straw into hertfordshire and got back in the course of five days fifteen specimens of plat these i sent to the society of arts on the third of april and i here insert a copy of the letter which accompanied them to the secretary of the society of arts kensington april the third eighteen twenty three 
sir with this letter i send you sixteen specimens of plat and also eight parcels of straw in order to show the sorts that the plat is made out of the numbers of the plat correspond with those of the straw but each parcel of straw has two numbers attached to it except in the case of the first number which is the wheat straw of each kind of straw a parcel of the stoutest and a parcel of the smallest were sent to be platted so that each parcel of the straw now sent except that of the wheat refers to two of the pieces of plat for instance two and three of the plat is of the sort of straw marked two and three four and twelve of the plat is of the sort of straw marked four and twelve and so on these parcels of straw are sent in order that you may know the kind of straw or rather of grass from which the several pieces of plat have been made this is very material because it is by those parcels of straw that the kinds of grass are to be known the piece of plat number sixteen is american all the rest are from my straw you will see that fifteen is the finest plat of all number seven is from the stout straws of the same kind as number fifteen by looking at the parcel of straw numbers seven and fifteen you will see what sort of grass this is the next in point of beauty and fineness combined are the pieces numbers thirteen and eight and by looking at the parcel of straw numbers thirteen and eight you will see what sort of grass that is next comes ten and five which are very beautiful too and the sort of grass you will see is the common bennet the wheat you see is too coarse and the rest of the sorts are either too hard or too brittle i beg you to look at numbers ten and five those appear to me to be the thing to supplant the leghorn the colour is good the straws work well they afford a great variety of sizes and they come from the common bennet grass which grows all over the kingdom which is cultivated in all our fields which is in bloom in the fair month of june which may be grown as fine or as coarse as we please and ten acres of which would i dare say make ten thousand bonnets however seven and fifteen and eight and thirteen are very good and they are to be got in every part of the kingdom as to platters it is to be too childish to believe that they are not to be got when i could send off these straws and get back the plat in the course of five days far better work than this would have been obtained if i could have gone on the errand myself what then will people not do who regularly undertake the business for their livelihood i will as soon as possible send you an account of the manner in which i went to work with the grass the card of plat which i sent to you some time ago you will be so good as to give me back again some time because i have now not a bit of the american plat left i am sir your most humble and most obedient servant william cobbett i should observe that these written communications of mine to the society belong in fact to it and will be published in its proceedings a volume of which comes out every year but in this case there would have been a year lost to those who may act in consequence of these communications being made public the grass is to be got in great quantities and of the best sorts only in june and july and the society's volume does not come out till december the society has therefore given its consent to the making of the communications public through the means of this little work of mine having shown what sort of plat could be produced from english grass straw i next communicated to the society an account of the method which i pursued in the cutting and bleaching of the grass the letter in which i did this i shall here insert a copy of before i proceed further in the original the paragraphs were numbered from one to seventeen they are here marked by letters in order to avoid confusion the paragraphs of the work itself being marked by numbers to the secretary of the society of arts kensington april the fourteenth eighteen twenty three a sir agreeably to your request i now communicate to you a statement of those particulars which you wish to possess relative to the specimens of straw and of plat which i have at different times sent to you for the inspection of the society b that my statement may not come too abruptly upon those members of the society who have not had an opportunity of witnessing the progress of this interesting inquiry i will take a short review of the circumstances which led to the making of my experiments c in the month of june eighteen twenty one 
a gentleman, a member of the society, informed me by letter that a Miss Woodhouse, a farmer's daughter of Wethersfield in Connecticut, had transmitted to the society a straw bonnet of very fine materials and manufacture, that this bonnet, according to her account, was made from the straw of a sort of grass called poa pratensis, that it seemed to be unknown whether the same grass would grow in England, that it was desirable to ascertain whether this grass would grow in England, that at all events it was desirable to get from America some of the seed of this grass, and that, for this purpose, my informant, knowing that I had a son in America, addressed himself to me, it being his opinion that, if materials similar to those used by Miss Woodhouse could by any means be grown in England, the benefit to the nation must be considerable. D. In consequence of this application, I wrote to my son James, then at New York, directing him to do what he was able in order to cause success to the undertaking. On the receipt of my letter in July he went from New York to Wethersfield, about a hundred and twenty miles, saw Miss Woodhouse, made the necessary inquiries, obtained a specimen of the grass, and also of the plat, which other persons at Wethersfield as well as Miss Woodhouse were in the habit of making, and having acquired the necessary information as to cutting the grass and bleaching the straw, he transmitted to me an account of the matter, which account, together with his specimens of grass and plat, I received in the month of September. E. I was now, when I came to see the specimen of grass, convinced that Miss Woodhouse's materials could be grown in England, a conviction which, if it had not been complete at once, would have been made complete immediately afterwards by the sight of a bunch of bonnet straw imported from Leghorn, which straw was shown to me by the importer, and which I found to be that of two or three sorts of our common grass, and of oats, wheat, and dry. F. That the grass or plants could be grown in England was therefore now certain, and indeed that they were, in point of commonness, next to the earth itself but before the grass could with propriety be called materials for bonnet-making, there was the bleaching to be performed, and it was by no means certain that this could be accomplished by means of an English sun, the difference between which and that of Italy or Connecticut was well known to be very great. G. My experiments have, I presume, completely removed this doubt. I think that the straw produced by me to the society and also some of the pieces of plat, are of a colour which no straw or plat can surpass. All that remains, therefore, is for me to give an account of the manner in which I cut and bleached the grass, which I have submitted to the society in the state of straw. H. First, as to the season of the year, all the straw, except that of one sort of couch grass and the long coppice grass, which too were got in Sussex, were got from grass cut in Hertfordshire on the 21st of June. A grass headland in a wheat field had been mowed during the fore part of the day, and in the afternoon I went and took a handful here and a handful there out of the swathes. When I had collected as much as I could well carry, I took it to my friend's house and proceeded to prepare it for bleaching, according to the information sent me from America by my son. That is to say, I put my grass into a shallow tub, put boiling water upon it until it was covered by the water, let it remain in that state for ten minutes then took it out, and laid it very thinly on a closely mowed lawn in a garden. But I should observe that before I put the grass into the tub, I tied it up in small bundles or sheaves, each bundle being about six inches through the butt-end. This was necessary in order to be able to take the grass, at the end of ten minutes, out of the water, without throwing it into a confused mixture as to tops and tails. Being tied up in little bundles, I could easily, with a prong, take it out of the hot water. The bundles were put into a large wicker basket, carried to the lawn in the garden, and there taken out, one by one, and laid in swathes, as before mentioned. I. It was laid very thinly. Almost might I say that no stalk of grass covered another. The swathes were turned once a day. The bleaching was completed at the end of seven days from time of scalding and laying out. June is a fine month. The grass was, as it happened, cut on the longest day in the year, and the weather was remarkably fine and clear. But the grass which I afterwards cut in Sussex was cut in the first week in August, and as to the weather my journal speaks thus. August 1822 Second, thunder and rain, began cutting grass. Third, beautiful day. 
Fourth, fine day. Fifth, cloudy day. Began scalding grass and laying it out. Sixth, cloudy greater part of the day. Seventh, same weather. Eighth, cloudy and rather misty. Finished cutting grass. Ninth, dry but cloudy. Tenth, very close and hot. Packed up part of the grass. Eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth and fourteenth, same weather. Fifteenth, hot and clear. Finished packing the grass. K. The grass cut in Sussex was as well bleached as that cut in Hertfordshire, so that it is evident that we never can have a summer that will not afford sun sufficient for this business. L. The part of the straw used for plaiting is that part of the stalk which is above the upper joint, that part which is between the upper joint and the seed branches. This part is taken out and the rest of the straw thrown away, but the whole plant must be cut and bleached, because if you were to take off when green the part above described, that part would wither up next to nothing. This part must die in company with the whole plants, and be separated from the other parts after the bleaching has been performed. M. The time of cutting must vary with the seasons, the situation, and the sort of grass. The grass which I got in Hertfordshire, than which nothing can, I think, be more beautiful, was, when cut, generally in bloom, just in bloom. The wheat was in full bloom, so that a good time for getting grass may be considered to be that when the wheat is in bloom. When I cut the grass in Sussex, the wheat was ripe, for reaping had begun. But that grass is of a very backward sort, and besides grew in the shade amongst coppice wood and under trees which stood pretty thick. N. As to the sorts of grass, I have to observe generally that, in proportion as the colour of the grass is deep, that is to say, getting further from the yellow and nearer to the blue, it is of a deep and dead yellow when it becomes straw. Those kinds of grass are best which are, in point of colour, nearest to that of wheat, which is a fresh, pale green. Another thing is the quality of the straw as to pliancy and toughness. Experience must be our guide here. I had not time to make a large collection of sorts, but those which I have sent to you contain three sorts which are proved to be good. In my letter of the third instant I sent you sixteen pieces of plat and eight bunches of straw, having the seed-heads on, in order to show the sorts of grass. The sixteenth piece of plat was American. The first piece was from wheat, cut and bleached by me, the rest from grass, cut and bleached by me. I will here, for fear of mistake, give a list of the names of the several sorts of grass, the straw of which was sent with my letter of the third instant, referring to the numbers as placed on the plat and on the bunches of straw. Reader's note. There follows a table. The first column headed pieces of plat. The second column headed bunches of straw. And the third headed sorts of grass. Plat number one. Straw number one. Grass wheat plat number two plat number three straw two and three grass melica carulea or purple melica grass plat number four plat number twelve straw four and twelve grass agrostis stolonifera or fiorin grass that is to say one sort of couch grass plat five plat ten straw five and ten Grass lolium perenne, or ray grass. Plat six, plat eleven, straw six and eleven. Grass avena flavescens, or yellow oat grass. Plat seven, plat fifteen, straw seven and fifteen. Grass sinusurus cristatus, or crested dog's tail grass. Plat eight, plat thirteen straw eight and thirteen grass anthoxanthum odoratum or sweet scented vernal grass plat nine plat fourteen straw nine and fourteen grass agrostis canina or brown bent grass o oh, these names are those given at the botanical garden at kew but the same english names are not in the country given to these sorts of grass the fiorin grass, the yellow oat grass, and the brown bent are all called couch grass, 
except that the latter is in Sussex called Red Robin. It is the native grass of the plains of Long Island, and they call it Red Top. The ray grass is the common field grass, which is, all over the kingdom, sown with clover. The farmers in a great part of the kingdom call it bent or bennet grass, and sometimes it is called darnel grass. The crested dog's tail goes in Sussex by the name of hendon bent, for what reason I know not. The sweet-scented vernal grass I have never amongst the farmers heard any name for. Miss Woodhouse's grass appears, from the plants that I saw in the Adelphi, to be one of the sorts of couch-grass. Indeed, I am sure that it is a couch-grass, if the plants I saw there come from her seed. My son, who went into Connecticut, who saw the grass growing, and who sent me home a specimen of it, is now in England, and he was with me when I cut the grass in Sussex, and he says that Miss Woodhouse's was a couch-grass. However, it is impossible to look at the specimens of straw and of plat which I have sent you, without being convinced that there is no want of the raw material in England. I was, after my first hearing of the subject, very soon convinced that the grass grew in England, but I had great doubts as to the capacity of our sun. Those doubts my own experiments have completely removed, but then I was not aware of the great effect of the scalding, of which, by the way, Miss Woodhouse had said nothing, and the knowledge of which we owe entirely to my son James's journey into Connecticut. P. Having thus given you an account of the time and manner of cutting the grass, of the mode of cutting and bleaching, having given you the best account I am able as to the sorts of grass to be employed in this business, and having in my former communications given you specimens of the plat wrought from the several sorts of straw, I might here close my letter, but as it may be useful to speak of the expense of cutting and bleaching it, I shall trouble you with a few words relating to it. If there were a field of ray-grass, or of crested dog's tail, or any other good sort, and nothing else growing with it, the expense of cutting would be very little indeed, seeing that the scythe or reap-hook would do the business at a great rate. Doubtless there will be such fields, but even if the grass have to be cut by the handful, my opinion is that the expense of cutting and bleaching would not exceed fourpence for straw enough to make a large bonnet. I should be willing to contract to supply straw at this rate for half a million of bonnets. The scalding must constitute a considerable part of the expense, because there must be fresh water for every parcel of grass that you put in the tub. When water has scalded one parcel of cold grass, it will not scald another parcel. Besides, the scalding draws out the sweet matter of the grass, and makes the water the colour of that horrible stuff called London porter. It would be very good, by the by, to give to pigs. Many people give hay tea to pigs and calves, and this is grass tea. To scald a large quantity, therefore, would require means not usually at hand, and the scalding is an essential part of the business. Perhaps, in a large and convenient farmhouse, with a good brewing copper, good fuel and water handy, four or five women might scald a wagon-load in a day, and a wagon would, I think, carry straw enough in the rough to furnish the means of making a thousand bonnets. However, the scalding might take place in the field itself, by means of a portable boiler, especially if water were at hand, and perhaps it would be better to carry the water to the field than to carry the grass to the farmhouse for there must be ground to lay it out upon the moment it has been scalded, and no ground can be so proper as the newly mowed ground where the grass has stood. The space, too, must be large for any considerable quantity of grass. As to all these things, however, the best and cheapest methods will soon be discovered when people set about the work with a view to profit. Q. The Society will want nothing from me nor from anybody else to convince it of the importance of this matter, but I cannot, in concluding these communications to you, sir, refrain from making an observation or two on the consequences likely to arise out of these inquiries. The manufacture is alone of considerable magnitude. Not less than about five millions of persons in this kingdom have a dress which consists partly of manufactured straw, and a large part, and all the most expensive part, of the articles thus used now come from abroad. In cases where you can get from abroad any article at less expense than you can get it at home, the wisdom of fabricating that article at home may be doubted. But in this case you get the raw material by labour performed at home, 
and the cost of that labour is not nearly so great as would be the cost of the mere carriage of the straw from a foreign country to this. If our own people had all plenty of employment, and that too more profitable to them and to the country than the turning of a part of our own grass into articles of dress, then it would be advisable still to import leghorn bonnets. But the facts being the reverse, it is clear that whatever money, or money's worth things, be sent out of the country, in exchange for leghorn bonnets, is, while we have the raw material here for next to nothing, just so much thrown away. The Italians, it may be said, take some of our manufactures in exchange, and let us suppose, for the purpose of illustration, that they take cloth from Yorkshire. Stop the exchange between Leghorn and Yorkshire, and does Yorkshire lose part of its custom? No, for though those who make the bonnets out of English grass prevent the Leghorners from buying Yorkshire cloth, they, with the money which they now get instead of its being got by the Leghorners, buy the Yorkshire cloth themselves, and they wear this cloth too, instead of its being worn by the people of Italy. I, sir, and many, now in rags, will be well clad if the laudable object of the society be effected. Besides this, however, why should we not export the articles of this manufacture? To America we certainly should, and I should not be at all surprised if we were to export them to Leghorn itself. Ah! Notwithstanding all this, however, if the manufacture were of a description to require, in order to give it success, the collecting of the manufacturers together in great numbers, I should, however great the wealth that it might promise, never have done anything to promote its establishment. The contrary is happily the case. Here all is not only performed by hand, but by hand singly, without any combination of hands. Here there is no power of machinery or of chemistry wanted. All is performed out in the open fields or sitting in the cottage. There wants no coal-mines and no rivers to assist, no water-powers nor powers of fire. No part of the kingdom is unfit for the business. Everywhere there are grass, water, sun, and women and children's fingers, and these are all that are wanted. But the great thing of all is this, that to obtain the materials for the making of this article of dress, at once so gay, so useful, and in some cases so expensive, there requires not a penny of capital. Many of the labourers now make their own straw hats to wear in summer, poor rotten things made out of straw of ripened grain. With what satisfaction will they learn that straw twenty times as durable, to say nothing of the beauty, is to be got from every hedge? In short, when the people are well and clearly informed of the facts, which I have through you, sir, had the honour to lay before the society, it is next to impossible that the manufacture should not become general throughout the country. In every labourer's house a pot of water can be boiled. What labourer's wife cannot, in the summer months, find time to cut and bleach grass enough to give her and her children work for a part of the winter? There is no necessity for all to be platters. Some may cut and bleach only. Others may prepare the straw, as mentioned in paragraph L of this letter. And doubtless, as the farmers in Hertfordshire now sell their straw to the platters, grass collectors and bleachers and preparers would do the same so that there is scarcely any country labourer's family that might not derive some advantage from this discovery, and while I am convinced that this consideration has been by no means overlooked by the society, it has been, I assure you, the great consideration of all, with, sir, your most obedient and most humble servant, William Cobbett. In the last edition, this closing part of the work, relative to the straw plat, was not presented to the public as a thing which admitted of no alteration, but on the contrary it was presented to the public with the following concluding remark. In conclusion, I have to observe that I by no means send forth this essay as containing opinions and instructions that are to undergo no alteration. I am indeed endeavouring to teach others, but I am myself only a learner. Experience will doubtless make me much more perfect in a knowledge of the several parts of the subject, and the fruit of this experience I shall be careful to communicate to the public. I now proceed to make good this promise. Experience has proved that very beautiful and very fine plat can be made with the straw of diverse kinds of grass, but the most ample experience has also proved to us that it is to the straw of wheat that we are to look for a manufacture to supplant the leghorn. 
This was mentioned as a strong suspicion in my former edition of this work, and I urged my readers to sow wheat for the purpose. The fact is now proved beyond all contradiction, that the straw of wheat or rye, but particularly of wheat, is the straw for this purpose. Finer plat may be made from the straw of grass than can possibly be made from the straw of wheat or rye, but the grass plat is, all of it, more or less brittle, and none of it has the beautiful and uniform colour of the straw of wheat. Since the last edition of this work I have received packets of the straw from Tuscany, all of wheat, and indeed I am convinced that no other straw is anything like so well calculated for the purpose. Wheat straw bleaches better than any other. It has that fine, pale, golden colour which no other straw has. It is much more simple, more pliant than any other straw, and, in short, this is the material. I did not urge in vain. A good quantity of wheat was sowed for this purpose. A great deal of it has been well harvested, and I have the pleasure to know that several hundreds of persons are now employed in the plaiting of straw. One more year, one more crop of wheat, and another leghorn bonnet will never be imported in England. Some great errors have been committed in the sowing of the wheat, and in the cutting of it. I shall now, therefore, availing myself of the experience which I have gained, offer to the public some observations on the sort of wheat to be sowed for this purpose, on the season for sowing, on the land to be used for the purpose, on the quantity of seed, and the manner of cutting, bleaching, and housing, on the plaiting, on the knitting, and on the pressing. THE SORT OF WHEAT The leghorn plat is all made of the straw of the spring wheat. This spring wheat is so called by us because it is sowed in the spring, at the same time that barley is sowed. The botanical name of it is Triticum aestivum. It is a small-grained bearded wheat. It has very fine straw, but experience has convinced me that the little brown-grained winter wheat is just as good for the purpose. In short, any wheat will do. I have now in my possession specimens of plat made of both winter and spring wheat, and I see no difference at all. I am decidedly of the opinion that the winter wheat is as good as the spring wheat for the purpose. I have plat and I have straw both now before me, and the above is the result of my experience. THE LAND PROPER FOR THE GROWING OF WHEAT The object is to have the straw as small as we can get it. The land must not therefore be too rich, yet it ought not to be very poor. If it be, you get the straw of no length. I saw an acre this year, as beautiful as possible, sowed upon a light loam, which bore last year a fine crop of potatoes. The land ought to be perfectly clean at any rate, so that when the crop is taken off, the wheat straw may not be mixed with weeds and grass. SEASON FOR SOWING this will be more conveniently stated in paragraph 228. Quantity of seed and manner of sowing. When first this subject was started in 1821, I said in the register that I would engage to grow as fine straw in England as the Italians could grow. I recommended then, as a first guess, fifteen bushels of wheat to the acre. Since that, reflection told me that that was not quite enough. I therefore recommend twenty bushels to the acre. Upon the beautiful acre which I have mentioned above, eighteen bushels, I am told, were sowed. Fine and beautiful as it was, I think it would have been better if it had had twenty bushels. Twenty bushels, therefore, is what I recommend. You must sow broadcast, of course, and you must take great pains to cover the seed well. It must be a good even-handed seedsman, and there must be very nice covering. SEASON FOR CUTTING Now, mind, it is fit to cut in just about one week after the bloom has dropped. If you examine the ear at that time, you will find the grain just beginning to be formed, and that is precisely the time to cut the wheat. The straw has then got its full substance in it. But I must now point out a very material thing. It is by no means desirable to have all your wheat fit to cut at the same time. It is a great misfortune, indeed, so to have it. If fit to cut altogether, it ought to be cut all at the same time, for supposing you to have an acre, it will require a fortnight or three weeks to cut it and bleach it, unless you have a very great number of hands, and very great vessels to prepare water in. 
Therefore, if I were to have an acre of wheat for this purpose, and were to grow all spring wheat, I would sow a twelfth part of the acre every week from the first week in March to the last week in May. If I relied partly upon winter wheat, I would sow some every month from the latter end of September to March. If I employed the two sorts of wheat, or, indeed, if I employed only the spring wheat, the triticum istivum, I should have some wheat fit to cut in June, and some not fit to cut till September. I should be sure to have a fair chance as to the weather. And, in short, it would be next to impossible for me to fail of securing a considerable part of my crop. I beg the reader's particular attention to the contents of this paragraph. Manner of cutting the wheat it is cut by a little reap-hook, close to the ground as possible. It is then tied in little sheaves with two pieces of string, one near the butt and the other about half-way up. This little bundle or sheaf ought to be six inches through at the butt, and no more. It ought not to be tied too tightly, lest the scalding should not be perfect. Manner of Bleaching the little sheaves mentioned in the last paragraph are carried to a brewing mash, vat, or other tub. You must not put them into the tub in too large a quantity, lest the water get chilled before it get to the bottom. Pour on scalding water till you cover the whole of the little sheaves, and let the water be a foot above the top sheaves. When the sheaves have remained thus a full quarter of an hour, take them out with a prong, lay them in a clothes-basket, or upon a hurdle, and carry them to the ground where the bleaching is to be finished. This should be, if possible, a piece of grassland where the grass is very short. Take the sheaves, and lay some of them along in a row. Untie them, and lay the straw along in that row as thin as it can possibly be laid. If it were possible, no one straw ought to have another lying upon it or across it. If the sun be clear, it will require to lie twenty-four hours thus, then to be turned, and lie twenty-four hours on the other side. If the sun be not very clear, it must lie longer. But the numerous sowings which I have mentioned will afford you so many chances, so many opportunities of having fine weather, that the risk about weather would necessarily be very small. If wet weather should come, and if your straw remain out in it any length of time, it will be spoiled. But, according to the mode of sowing above pointed out, you really could stand very little chance of losing straw by bad weather. If you had some straw out bleaching, and the weather were to appear suddenly to be about to change, the quantity that you would have out would not be large enough to prevent you from putting it under cover, and keeping it there till the weather changed. Housing the straw When your straw is nicely bleached, gather it up, and with the same string that you used to tie it when green, tie it up again into little sheaves. Put it by in some room where there is no damp, and where mice and rats are not suffered to inhabit. Here it is always ready for use, and it will keep, I dare say, four or five years very well. THE PLATTING This is now so well understood that nothing need be said about the manner of doing the work, but much might be said about the measures to be pursued by landowners, by parish officers, by farmers, and more especially by gentlemen and ladies of sense, public spirit, and benevolence of disposition. The thing will be done, the manufacture will spread itself over all this kingdom, but the exertions of those whom I have here pointed out might hasten the period of its being brought to perfection. And I beg such gentlemen and ladies to reflect on the vast importance of such manufacture, which it is impossible to cause to produce anything but good. One of the great misfortunes of England at this day is that the land has had taken away from it those employments for its women and children, which were so necessary to the well-being of the agricultural labourer. The spinning, the carding, the reeling, the knitting, these have been all taken away from the land, and given to the lords of the loom, the haughty lords of bands of abject slaves. But let the landholder mark how the change has operated to produce his ruin. He must have the labouring man and the labouring boy— but alas, he cannot have these without having the man's wife, and the boy's mother, and little sisters and brothers. Even nature herself says that he shall have the wife and little children, or that he shall not have the man and the boy. But the lords of the loom, the crabbed voice, hard-favoured, hard-hearted, puffed-up, insolent, savage, and bloody wretches of the north, have, 
assisted by a blind and greedy government, taken all the employment away from the agricultural women and children. This manufacture of straw will form one little article of employment for these persons. It sets at defiance all the hatching and scheming of all the tyrannical wretches who cause the poor little creatures to die in their factories, heated to eighty-four degrees. They will need no inventions of what, none of your horse-powers nor water-powers, no murdering of one set of wretches in the coal-mines to bring up the means of murdering another set of wretches in the factories by the heat produced from those coals none of these are wanted to carry on this manufactory it wants no combination laws none of the inventions of the hard-hearted wretches of the north the knitting upon this subject i have only to congratulate my readers that there are great numbers of english women who can now knit plat together better than those famous jewesses of whom we were told the pressing bonnets and hats are pressed after they are made. I am told that a proper press costs pretty nearly a hundred pounds, but then that it will do a prodigious deal of business. I would recommend to our friends in the country to teach as many children as they can to make the plat. The plat will be knitted in London and in other considerable towns by persons to whom it will be sold. It appears to me, at least, that this will be the course that the thing will take." However, we must leave this to time, and here I conclude my observations upon a subject which is deeply interesting to myself, and which the public in general deem to be of great importance. Paragraph 235. Postscript on Brewing. I think it right to say here that, ever since I published the instructions for brewing by copper and by wooden utensils, the beer at my own house has always been brewed precisely agreeable to the instructions contained in this book, and I have to add that I never have had such good beer in my house in all my lifetime as since I have followed that mode of brewing. My table beer, as well as my ale, is always as clear as wine. I have had hundreds and hundreds of quarters of malt brewed into beer in my house. My people could always make it strong enough and sweet enough but never except by accident could they make it clear. Now I never have any that is not clear, and yet my utensils are all very small, and my brewers are sometimes one labouring man and sometimes another. A man wants showing how to brew the first time. I should suppose that we use in my house about seven hundred gallons of beer every year, taking both sorts together, and I can positively assert that there has not been one drop of bad beer and indeed none which has not been most excellent, in my house during the last two years, I think it is, since I began using the utensils, and in the manner named, in this book. End of number eight, part one. Number eight, part two of Cottage Economy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philippa. Paragraphs 236 to 253. Ice Houses. First begging the reader to read again paragraph 149, I proceed here, in compliance with numerous requests to that effect, to describe, as clearly as I can, the manner of constructing the sort of ice houses therein mentioned. In England these receptacles of frozen water are generally underground, and always, if possible, under the shade of trees, the opinion being that the main thing, if not the only thing, is to keep away the heat. The heat is to be kept away, certainly, but moisture is the great enemy of ice. And how is this to be kept away, either underground or under the shade of trees? Abundant experience has proved that no thickness of wall, that no cement of any kind, will effectually resist moisture. Drops will at all times be seen hanging on the underside of an arch of any thickness, and made from any materials, if it have earth over it, and even when it has the floor of a house over it, and wherever the moisture enters, the ice will quickly melt. Ice houses should therefore be, in all their parts, as dry as possible and they should be so constructed, and the ice so deposited in them, 
as to ensure the running away of the meltings as quickly as possible, whenever such meltings come. Anything in the way of drains or gutters is too slow in its effect, and therefore there must be something that will not suffer the water proceeding from any melting to remain an instant. In the first place, then, the ice-house should stand in a place quite open to the sun and air, for whoever has travelled even but a few miles, having eyes in his head, need not be told how long that part of a road from which the sun and wind are excluded by trees or hedges or by anything else will remain wet, or at least damp, after the rest of the road is even in a state to send up dust. The next thing is to protect the ice against wet or damp from beneath. It should therefore stand on some spot from which water would run in every direction, and if the natural ground present no such spot, it is no very great job to make it. Then come the materials of which the house is to consist. These, for the reasons before mentioned, must not be bricks, stones, mortar, or earth, for these are all affected by the atmosphere. They will become damp at certain times, and dampness is the great destroyer of ice. The materials left are wood and straw. Wood will not do, for though not liable to become damp, it imbibes heat fast enough, and besides, it cannot be so put together as to shut out air sufficiently. Straw is wholly free from the quality of becoming damp, except from water actually put upon it, and it can at the same time be placed on a roof and on sides, to such a degree of thickness as to exclude the air in a manner the most perfect. The ice-house ought, therefore, to be made of posts, plates, rafters, laths, and straw. The best form is the circular, and the house when made appears as I have endeavoured to describe it in figure 3 of the plate. Figure 1, A, is the centre of a circle, the diameter of which is 10 feet, and at this centre you put up a post to stand 15 feet above the level of the ground, which post ought to be about 9 inches through the bottom, and not a great deal smaller at the top. Great care must be taken that this post be perfectly perpendicular, for, if it be not, the whole building will be awry. BBB are fifteen posts, nine feet high, and six inches through at the bottom, without much tapering towards the top. These posts stand about two feet apart, reckoning from centre of post to centre of post, which leaves between each two a space of eighteen inches. CCCC are fifty-four posts five feet high, and five inches through at the bottom, without much tapering towards the top. These posts stand about two feet apart, from centre of post to centre of post, which leaves between each two a space of nineteen inches. The space between these two rows of posts is four feet in width, and, as will be presently seen, is to contain a wall of straw. E is a passage through this wall. D is the outside door of the passage, F is the inside door, and the inner circle, of which A is the centre, is the place in which the ice is to be deposited. Well then, we have now got the posts up, and before we talk of the roof of the house, or of the bed for the ice, it will be best to speak about the making of the wall. It is to be made of straw, wheat straw, or rye straw, with no rubbish in it, and made very smooth by the hand as it is put in. You lay it in very closely and very smoothly, so that if the wall were cut across, as at GG in figure 2, which figure 2 represents the whole building cut down through the middle, omitting the centre post, the ends of the straw would present a compact face, as they do after the cut of a chaff cutter. But there requires something to keep the straw from bulging out between the posts, Little stakes as big as your wrist will answer this purpose. Drive them into the ground, and fasten at top to the plates of which I am now to speak. The plates are pieces of wood which go all round both the circles, and are nailed on upon the tops of the posts. Their main business is to receive and sustain the lower ends of the rafters, as at MM and NN in figure 2, but to the plates also the stakes just mentioned must be fastened at the top. Thus, then, there will be this space of four feet wide, 
having on each side of it a row of posts and stakes, not more than about six inches from each other, to hold up, and to keep in its place, this wall of straw. Next come the rafters, as from S to N, figure 2. Carpenters best know what is the number and what the size of the rafters, but from S to M there need be only about half as many as from M to N. However, carpenters know all about this. It is their everyday work. The roof is forty-five degrees pitch, as the carpenters call it. If it were even sharper, it would be none the worse. There will be about thirty ends of rafters to lodge on the plate, as at M, and these cannot all be fastened to the top of the centre post rising up from A, but carpenters know how to manage this matter so as to make all strong and safe. The plate which goes along on the tops of the row of posts BBB must, of course, be put on in a somewhat sloping form, otherwise there would be a sort of hip formed by the rafters. However, the thatch is to be so deep that this may not be of much consequence. Before the thatching begins, there are laths to be put up on the rafters. Thatchers know all about this, and all that you have to do is to take care that the thatcher tie the straw on well. The best way, in the case of such deep thatch, is to have a strong man to tie for the thatcher. The roof is now raftered, and it is to receive a thatch of clean, sound, and well-prepared wheat or rye straw four feet thick as at H. H. in figure 2. The house, having now got walls and roof, the next thing is to make the bed to receive the ice. The bed is the area of the circle of which A is the centre. You begin by laying on the ground round logs, eight inches through or thereabouts, and placing them across the area, leaving spaces between them of about a foot. Then, crossways on them, poles about four inches through, placed at six inches apart. Then, crossways on them, other poles about two inches through, placed at three inches apart. Then, crossways on them, rods as thick as your finger, placed at an inch apart. Then upon these, small, clean, dry, last winter cut twigs, to the thickness of about two inches, or, instead of these twigs, good, clean, strong heath, free from grass and moss, and from rubbish of all sorts. This is the bed for the ice to lie on, and as you see the top of the bed will be seventeen inches from the ground. The pressure of the ice may perhaps bring it to fourteen or to thirteen. Upon this bed the ice is put, broken and pummeled, and beaten down together in the usual manner. Having got the bed filled with ice, we have next to shut it safely up. As we have seen, there is a passage, E. Two feet wide is enough for this passage, and being as long as the wall is thick, it is, of course, four feet long. The use of the passage is thus, that you may have two doors, so that you may, in hot or damp weather, shut the outer door while you have the inner door open. The inner door may be of hurdle-work and straw, and covered on one of the sides with sheepskins with the wool on, so as to keep out the external air. The outer door, which must lock, must be of wood made to shut very closely, and besides covered with skins like the other. At times of great danger from heat or from wet, the whole of the passage may be filled with straw. The door, P, figure 3, should face the north, or between north and east. As to the size of the ice-house, that must, of course, depend upon the quantity of ice that you may choose to have. A house on the above scale is, from W to X, figure 2, maximum diameter, 29 feet. From Y to Z, figure 2, maximum height, 19 feet. The area of the circle of which A is the centre is 10 feet in diameter, and as this area contains 75 superficial feet, you will, if you put ice on the bed to the height of only five feet, and you may put it on to the height of seven feet from the top of the bed, you will have three hundred and seventy-five cubic feet of ice. And observe, a cubic foot of ice will, when broken up, fill much more than a Winchester bushel. 
what it may do as to an imperial bushel engendered like greek loan commissioners by the unnatural heat of prosperity god only knows however i do suppose that without making any allowance for the cold fit as dr baring calls it into which the late panic has brought us i do suppose that even the scorching the burning dog-star of imperial prosperity nay even that dives himself would hardly call for more than two bushels of ice in a day for more than two bushels a day it would be unless it were used in cold as well as in hot weather as to the expense of such a house it could in the country not be much none of the posts except the main or centre post need be very straight the other posts might be easily culled from tree lops destined for firewood the straw would make all straight the plates must of necessity be short pieces of wood and as to the stakes the laths and the logs poles rods twigs and heath they would not all cost twenty shillings the straw is the principal article and in most places even that would not cost more than two or three pounds if it last many years the price could not be an object and if but a little while it would still be nearly as good for litter as it was before it was applied to this purpose how often the bottom of the straw walls might want renewing i cannot say but i know that the roof would with few and small repairs last well for ten years i have said that the interior row of posts is to be nine feet high and the exterior row five feet high i in each case mean with the plate inclusive i have only to add that by way of superabundant precaution against bottom wet it will be well to make a sort of gutter to receive the drip from the roof and to carry it away as soon as it falls now after expressing a hope that i shall have made myself clearly understood by every reader it is necessary that i remind him that i do not pretend to pledge myself for the complete success nor for any success at all of this mode of making ice-houses but at the same time i express my firm belief that complete success would attend it because it not only corresponds with what i have seen of such matters but i had the details from a gentleman who had ample experience to guide him and who was a man on whose word and judgment i placed a perfect reliance he advised me to erect an ice-house but not caring enough about fresh meat and fish in summer or at least not setting them enough above prime pork to induce me to take any trouble to secure the former i never built an ice-house thus then i only communicate that in which i believe there is however in all cases this comfort that if the thing fail as an ice-house it will serve all generations to come as a model for a pig bed end of number eight part two addition to cottage economy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by philippa addition kensington november the fourteenth eighteen thirty one Paragraphs 254 to 257, Mangle Wurzel. This last summer I have proved that, as keep for cows, Mangle Wurzel is preferable to Swedish turnips, whether as to quantity or quality. But there needs no other alteration in the book than merely to read Mangle Wurzel wherever you find Swedish turnip. The time of sowing, the mode and time of transplanting, the distances and the cultivation all being the same, and the only difference being in the application of the leaves and in the time of harvesting the roots. The leaves of the mangle wurzel are of great value, especially in dry summers. You begin about the third week in August to take off by a downward pull the leaves of the plants, and they are excellent food for pigs and cows only observe this that if given to cows there must be for each cow six pounds of hay a day which is not necessary in the case of the swedish turnips these leaves last till the crop is taken up which ought to be in the first week of november the taking off of the leaves does good to the plants new leaves succeed higher up and the plant becomes longer than it otherwise would be and of course heavier 
but in taking off the leaves you must not approach too near to the top. When you take the plants up in November, you must cut off the crowns and the remaining leaves, and they again are for cows and pigs. Then you put the roots into some place to keep them from the frost, and if you have no place under cover, put them in piles in the same manner as directed for the Swedish turnips. The roots will average in weight ten pounds each. They may be given to cows whole, or to pigs either, and they are better than the Swedish turnip for both animals, and they do not give any bad or strong taste to the milk and butter. But besides this use of the mangle wurzel, there is another, with regard to pigs at least, of very great importance. The juice of this plant has so much of sweetness in it, that in France they make sugar of it, and I have used the sugar and found it equal in goodness to West India sugar. Many persons in England make beer of this juice, and I have drunk of this beer and found it very good. In short, the juice is most excellent for the mixing of moist food for pigs. I am now, 20th of November, 1831, boiling it for this purpose. My copper holds seven strike bushels. I put in three bushels of mangle wurzel cut into pieces two inches thick, and then fill the copper with water. I draw off as much of the liquor as I want to wet pollard or meal for little pigs or fatting pigs, and the rest, roots and all, I feed the yard hogs with, and this I shall follow on till about the middle of May. If you give boiled or steamed potatoes to pigs, there wants some liquor to mix with the potatoes, for the water in which potatoes have been boiled is hurtful to any animal that drinks it. But mix the potatoes with juice of mangle wurzel, and they make very good food for hogs of all ages. The mangle wurzel produces a larger crop than the Swedish turnip. Paragraphs 258 to 265. Cobbett's Corn. If you prefer bread and pudding to milk, butter, and meat, this corn will produce, on your forty rods, forty bushels, each weighing sixty pounds at the least, and more flour in proportion than the best white wheat. To make bread with it you must use two-thirds wheaten or rye flour, but in puddings this is not necessary. The puddings at my house are all made with this flour, except meat and fruit pudding, for the corn flour is not adhesive or clinging enough to make paste or crust. This corn is the very best for hog fatting in the whole world. I last April sent parcels of the seed into several counties to be given away to working men, and I sent them instructions for the cultivation, which I shall repeat here. I will first describe this corn to you. It is that which is sometimes called Indian corn, and sometimes people call it Indian wheat. It is that sort of corn which the disciples ate as they were going up to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. They gathered it in the fields as they went along and ate it green, they being unhungered, for which you know they were reproved by the Pharisees. I have written a treatise on this corn in a book which I sell for four shillings, giving a minute account of the qualities, the culture, the harvesting, and the various uses of this corn, but I shall here confine myself to what is necessary for a labourer to know about it, so that he may be induced to raise, and may be enabled to raise enough of it in his garden, to fat a pig of ten score. There are a great many sorts of this corn. They come from all countries which are hotter than England. This sort, which my eldest son brought into England, is a dwarf kind, and is the only kind that I have known to ripen in this country, and I know that it will ripen in this country in any summer, for I had a large field of it in 1828 and 1829, and last year, my lease at my farm being out at Michaelmas, and this corn not ripening till late in October, I had about two acres in my garden at Kensington. Within the memory of man there have not been three summers so cold as the last one after another, and no one so cold as the last. Yet my corn ripened perfectly well, and this you will be satisfied of if you be amongst the men to whom this corn is given from me. You will see that it is in the shape of the cone of a spruce fir. You will see that the grains are fixed round a stalk which is called the cob. These stalks or ears come out of the side of the plant which has leaves like a flag, which plant grows to about three feet high and has two or three, and sometimes more, of these ears or bunches of grain. Out of the top of the plant comes the tassel, which resembles the plumes of feathers upon a hearse, 
and this is the flower of the plant. The grain is, as you will see, about the size of a large pea, and there are from two to three hundred of these grains upon the ear or cob. In my treaties I have shown that in America all the hogs and pigs, all the poultry of every sort, the greater part of the oxen, and a considerable part of the sheep, are fatted upon this corn, that it is the best food for horses, and that when ground and dressed in various ways it is used in bread, in puddings, in several other ways in families, and that in short it is the real staff of life in all the countries where it is in common culture and where the climate is hot. When used for poultry, the grain is rubbed off the cob. Horses, sheep, and pigs bite the grain off, and leave the cob, but horned cattle eat cob and all. I am to speak of it to you, however, only as a thing to make you some bacon, for which use it surpasses all other grain whatsoever. When the grain is in the whole ear, it is called corn in the ear. When it is rubbed off the cob, it is called shelled corn. Now observe, ten bushels of shelled corn are equal in the fatting of a pig to fifteen bushels of barley, and fifteen bushels of barley, if properly ground and managed, will make a pig of ten score, if he be not too poor when you begin to fat him. Observe that everybody who has been in America knows that the finest hogs in the world are fatted in that country, and no man ever saw a hog fatted in that country in any other way than tossing the ears of corn over to him in the sty, leaving him to bite it off the ear and deal with it according to his pleasure. The finest and solidest bacon in the world is produced in this way. Now then, I know that a bushel of shelled corn may be grown upon one single rod of ground, sixteen feet and a half each way. I have grown more than that this last summer, and any of you may do the same if you will strictly follow the instructions which I am now about to give you. 1. Late in March, I am doing it now, or in the first fortnight of April, dig your ground up very deep, and let it lie rough till between the 7th and 15th of May. 2. Then, in dry weather if possible, dig up the ground again, and make it smooth at top. Draw drills with a line two feet apart, just as you do drills for peas. Rub the grains off the cob, put a little very rotten and fine manure along the bottom of the drill, lay the grains along upon that six inches apart, cover the grain over with fine earth, so that there be about an inch and a half on the top of the grain, pat the earth down a little with the back of a hoe to make it lie solid on the grain. 3. If there be any danger of slugs, you must kill them before the corn comes up, if possible and the best way to do this is to put a little hot lime in a bag, and go very early in the morning, and shake the bag all round the edges of the ground and over the ground. Doing this three or four times very early in a dewy morning, or just after a shower, will destroy all the slugs, and this ought to be done for all other crops as well as for that of corn. 4. When the corn comes up, you must take care to keep all birds off till it is two or three inches high for the spear is so sweet that the birds of all sorts are very apt to peck it off, particularly the doves and the larks and pigeons. As soon as it is fairly above ground, give the whole of the ground, in dry weather, a flat hoeing, and be sure to move all the ground close round the plants. When the weeds begin to appear again, give the ground another hoeing, but always in dry weather. When the plants get to be about a foot high or a little more, Dig the ground between the rows, and work the earth up a little against the stems of the plants. 5. About the middle of August you will see the tassel springing up out of the middle of the plant, and the ears coming out of the sides. If weeds appear in the ground, hoe it again to kill the weeds, so that the ground may be always kept clean. About the middle of September you will find the grains of the ears to be full of milk, just in the state that the ears were at Jerusalem, when the disciples cropped them to eat. From this milky state they, like the grains of wheat, grow hard, and as soon as the grains begin to be hard, you should cut off the tops of the corn and the long flaggy leaves, and leave the ears to ripen upon the stalk or stem. If it be a warm summer, they will be fit to harvest by the last of October, but it does not signify if they remain out until the middle of November or even later. 
the longer they stay out, the harder the grain will be. 6. Each ear is covered in a very curious manner with a husk. The best way for you will be, when you gather in your crop, to strip off the husks, to tie the ears in bunches of six or eight or ten, and to hang them up to nails in the walls or against the beams of your house for there is so much moisture in the cob that the ears are apt to heat if put together in great parcels. The room in which I write in London is now hung all round with bunches of this corn. The bunches may be hung up in a shed or stable for a while, and when perfectly dry they may be put into bags. 7. Now, as to the mode of using the corn, if for poultry you must rub the grains off the cob, but if for pigs Give them the whole ears. You will find some of the ears in which the grain is still soft. Give these to your pigs first, and keep the hardest to the last. You will soon see how much the pig will require in a day, because pigs, more decent than many rich men, never eat any more than is necessary to them. You will thus have a pig. You will have two flitches of bacon, two pig's cheeks, one set of sows, two griskins, two spare ribs, from both which I trust in God you will keep the jaws of the Methodist parson, and if, while you are drinking a mug of your own ale, after having dined upon one of these, you drink my health, you may be sure that it will give you more merit in the sight of God, as well as of man, than you would acquire by groaning the soul out of your body in responses to the blasphemous cant of the sleek-headed Methodist thief that would persuade you to live upon potatoes. You must be quite sensible that I cannot have any motive but your good in giving you this advice, other than the delight which I take and the pleasure which I derive from doing that good. You are all personally unknown to me. In all human probability not one man in a thousand will ever see me. You have no more power to show your gratitude to me than you have to cause me to live for a hundred years. I do not desire that you should deem this a favour received from me. The thing is worth your trying, at any rate. The corn is off by the middle of November. The ground should then be well manured and deeply dug, and planted with early york or early dwarf cabbages, which will be loaved in the latter end of April, and may be either sold or given to pigs or cows before the time to plant the corn again. Thus you have two very large crops, on the same ground, in the same year. End of Addition End of Cottage Economy by William Cobbett